Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Corrupted Empire by Nicole Fox, narrated by Alex Kidd and Amelie Griffin. Gabriel I passed the blade from one hand to the other and back again, assessing the man in the chair. His white wife beater is soaked with sweat and his dark brown curls stick to his forehead and cheeks. It's not that warm down here. He's just a sweaty sort of guy. His gaze keeps shifting around the room, as though any moment one of my men is going to step forward and release him. <laughs> not a chance. Dom Rossi and Antonio Linetti are my most trusted men. Dom has been my capo since the beginning and has saved my life on more than one occasion. My lieutenant, Antonio, was once my father's lieutenant, but he is the kind of soldier that doesn't mess around with politics. In his world, it's simply a matter of serving who is in charge. I respect that kind of straightforward philosophy. Nobody is coming to save you, Philippe, I say, drawing his focus back to me. The only thing you should be focusing on is how painful you want your death to be. Do you want a little pain or a lot of pain? His brown eyes flare, but his lips stay firmly together. I glance back at Dom, who brought him in. Is he always this chatty? Dom is leaning against the wall, his thick arms crossed over his chest. With his square jaw, arrow straight mouth, and closely cropped brown hair, he looks like a young Jean Claude Van Damme. All muscle. No funny business. Not a peep in the car. I think he's shy. I turn back to my captive. When I look at him, all I see is death and destruction. He is a member of the cartel, a Colombian drug outfit that has been bleeding into my city like toxic waste for years. First, they secretly backed the Irish mob, led by Andrew Walsh. Once he was out of the picture... They sank their parasitic paws into his son Patrick and me, forcing us to work together to distribute purple heroin through the city. Purple heroin is a vile substance. Because the heroin is mixed with carfentanil, it's both cheaper and deadlier than the pure variety. I hated every second that I was made to pump that poison into the city's veins, but the cartel had dirt on me, and I needed time to figure out how to extricate myself from their stone grip without going down too in the process. A month ago, someone made that call for me. Patrick is dead, and I'm free. Though I don't know how long that will be the case. The cartel used their trump card and released evidence that linked me to my father's murder— now my fate is in the hands of a team of lawyers, and I am on the knife's edge. Unfortunately for the cartel, that has only made me more dangerous. I bring the knife to the man's throat. You're going to tell us where the cartel is storing their most recent shipment, and you're going to tell us now. It's not even ten in the morning, and I've already used up all my patience. The man's chest heaves, and a bead of sweat rolls down his nose. I curl my lip in disgust. I swipe the blade down the man's cheek, and he yelps in pain. A little pain or a lot of pain, I ask again, and make a matching gash on the other side. Okay, okay, he yells, his voice heavily accented. I know where it is. I take a deep breath. Finally, one small win in what is by all accounts a losing game. The past month has been nothing but a shitstorm, and it feels like I've been battered on all sides. The cartel have been closing in on my territory with their Irish allies, and the police are a hair's breadth away from making a discovery that could bring me down for good. To top it all off, I've got a baby on the way, and the woman carrying that child is the very person who betrayed me, and sent me hurtling into this shitstorm in the first place. I grit my teeth and force those thoughts away. Now is not the time to think of Alexis Wright, the curvy temptress who nearly lost me everything. I spend enough time thinking about her as it is. 
My captive gives a breathy description of the warehouse and its location, and Dom leaves to order reconnaissance while I continue the questioning. There is one piece of information that has eluded me so far. Tell me who is in charge of your organization, I demand. The man shakes his head. I don't know. I only know where I get my orders from. I don't believe you. I bring the point of the blade a fraction away from his eyeball. The man whimpers pathetically. When Dom caught him, Philippe was antagonizing a junkie he just sold purple heroin to. I guess he isn't so tough now. I don't know, he cries, keeping perfectly still. They give me product, I sell it. They tell me to be somewhere with a gun, I go. So, you're just a good little soldier, I ask. Yes, I promise. His word means nothing to me, but I believe him. Every member of the cartel we have captured so far has said essentially the same thing. They operate under a cloaked chain of command, a tactical move that makes it difficult for me to determine the scope of the organization. I don't know the size of the snake, and I don't know where its head is. I hand the knife to Antonio, and he presses a gun into my palm instead. The man starts to beg and plead, and I silence him with a bullet to the head. Frustration leaks into my bones as I storm out of the cellar. I got information today, but not enough. I need to know more about my enemies if I'm going to fight them. In this, and everything else in my life, I feel like I have lost control, and I'm desperate to regain some semblance of it. I've given all the bribes I can to the police, and Alexis is a lost cause. That means the only other way to regain control is for me to smash the cartel and Kevin Lynch into the ground, and I need to do it quickly. I am familiar with the warehouse that the captured cartel member named, and I initiate a plan to storm it that evening after dark. The air from the open window is chilly on my face as I drive through the sleepy dockyard, Moonlight cast in a spotlight on the quiet convoy sneaking past the rusted structures and parked trucks. The sky is cloudless, though we are too close to the city to see many stars. Antonio, Dom, and Mirko Bernardino, one of my other capos, follow behind me with a handful of their men. I keep an eye out for sentries, but the two men I sent ahead on foot have taken care of that— Dom's reconnaissance earlier turned up only Irish on sight, though no sign of Kevin Lynch. Our attack will be swift, and it will be fatal. When we are just around the corner, we stop and pile out of our vehicles. Antonio lumbers up beside me, checking the chamber of his Glock 19, the misty plume of his breath twisting toward the black sky. Antonio is in his fifties, and with all of the action recently, I wonder why he doesn't just retire somewhere warm with his wife and their many cats. He had some quiet years under my father, but since my father's ill-fated plan for expansion two years ago, it has been a bumpy ride. Antonio cocks his gun and runs a hand over his bald head, muscles flexing. He stands around six-three to my six-five and is as wide as the warehouses that surround us. Maybe that's why he is stuck around. This is the only thing he's built for. I want you to burn it to the ground, I tell him. Don't forget to clear the men out first. Burning to death is no way to go. Being shot, that's noble. You get a chance to shoot back in that case. A chance to fight. Antonio bounces on his heels and looks back to the assembled men. Yes, boss. I pull my gun out and nod at him. We edge around the corner of the warehouse, and the group splits into two. Half of us go to the back door, while the others jog to the front, where they will shoot those we flush out. I wait enough time for everyone to get into position, and then give the order. We charge. The back door crashes in on its hinges as we burst through, and gunfire rips through the quiet air. The Irish inside the building yell in surprise and try to grab their guns and take cover, but we don't give them time. All they can do is run as we push through like a powerful wave, washing them out into the open, where my men are waiting to cut them down. 
This is the only way to defeat the Irish and the cartel. Now is not the time to be merciful. I must be decisive. I will not lose this city. Not to Kevin Lynch, not to the cartel's mysterious leader, not to anybody. My team reaches the front of the warehouse, and I hear the whoosh of flames behind us as those at the back set alight the many crates of drugs. We spill out onto the pavement, picking our way around dead Irishmen. I look back and watch as thousands of dollars worth of product burns, belching thick black smoke into the night. The heat feels pleasant on my face. The flames dance golden in Antonio's eyes as he stares at the carnage with grim determination. This will be a substantial blow to the Irish and the cartel. That means there will also be substantial retaliation. I need to be sure I'm ready for it. Come on, I say, waving my men over to the waiting vehicles. Let's get out of here. If my enemies thought I would go down easy, now they know I won't. Antonio drives me back to the mansion so we can discuss the raid. I tell him to make a stop on the way, and he nods. Has there been any change? Antonio asks. None that her guards have reported or that I have seen on the surveillance footage, I say. If Lynch knows where Alexis and Harry are, he hasn't acted on that information yet. It's dangerous keeping them so removed from your other operations. I know. I have thought the same thing many times. I only care about Harry's safety, so it would be easier to keep him close and leave Alexis to fend for herself, but he will grow up hating me if I do that. Unfortunately, it's both of them or nothing, and I cannot have Alexis that close to me again. So here they will stay, in an apartment on the edge of the city where I can watch Harry grow from a distance. Things were okay a month ago. I had bought a house for the three of us, one where we could be a family. Perhaps that was naive. Even though I destroyed the Irish, the cartel were keeping me on a leash, forcing me to distribute purple heroin in the city, and I was desperate to be free of it. I knew it was going to come to a head eventually, but when it did, I wanted it to be on my terms. Alexis screwed it all up. She used information she'd gathered while living with me, while pretending to want to build a life with me, to expose the whole dirty operation. She may have offered the small mercy of not naming my criminal empire to the public, but her efforts were enough for the cartel to make good on their threats and release their blackmail material. She did this to me. I try to make myself hate her every day, and some days I even think I do. Today is not one of those days. Antonio pulls up across the street from their apartment. I look up to see the window to Alexis's bedroom is lit up, golden light framing her head and shoulders in side profile. She is brushing her shoulder-length brown waves, probably getting ready to go to bed. She looks beautiful. She always does. She looked beautiful early in the morning, her eyelids heavy with sleep. She looked beautiful when she snapped at me, even as her words burned my skin. She looked beautiful with her hair splayed over my pillow, her naked body laid out below me like the most indulgent buffet. Alexis never struggled with beauty. Loyalty, on the other hand, she sold me out the first chance she got, probably making a shiny mint for herself in the process. Not that I should have been surprised, only a couple months prior to that, she made a run for it with our child. So, though I watch Alexis for a long time, I keep my distance, and I will continue keeping my distance. She is beautiful, but deadly, like foxglove, with its pink, bell-shaped flowers and the hot stop in poison hidden within them. When we finally drive back to the mansion, I tell myself that this has to be the last time. The only reason I have allowed Alexis to stay in this city is for Harry's sake. I must remember that. I won't let myself care for her again. Alexis Clara Fitzgerald is my best friend, and I might just murder her. Alexis, come on. 
Clara urges from the doorway, tapping her toe against the tile. We have a lot of ground to cover. I heave a sigh and ignore her impatient tone. This box is heavy, and I may only be one month pregnant, but I am pregnant nonetheless. And that means she can just wait. I try not to be too annoyed. We're working for a good cause, after all. And honestly, it's nice just to see Clara back to her old self. One month ago, the blonde with the bright emerald eyes glaring at me from the door of the rehabilitation center was a different person. Her curls were limp, her pale skin waxy. She has always been petite and thin, but her bones jutted through papery skin, and she looked like she might collapse into a pile of dust at any moment. She's still a little too skinny, but I've been monitoring her recovery, and she has exceeded all expectations so far. No purple heroin, no alcohol, nothing. She's teetotal and all the better for it. Most people would rest for a little while, after the kind of traumatic experiences Clara has overcome in the past six months. But not Clara. She's back on her feet and anxious to help those still struggling. I reach the doors, and Clara takes the box from me. There are two more in the car, she says, and disappears into the hall. The second I turn, I notice shadow melting into the scenery out of the corner of my eye. There's a black car with tinted windows hanging out across the street as well. These days, I am never alone. They try not to be too obvious, but my guards certainly don't hide. I know they're hanging around to ensure my safety, but I'd wager that part of it is to make sure I feel Gabriel's presence all day, every day. The guards are a reminder that although I am living my life outside of his sphere of influence, my freedom is merely on loan. I grab the next box from the car and heave it up the stairs. This one is heavier. It's the one with all the canned goods in it. I have to adjust my grip a couple times, but I get it up the stairs just as Clara reappears to take it. I'll meet you inside, she says. I nod catching my breath, and head back to the car for the last box. I'm warm now, despite the chilly fall air. The leaves down this street have already all jumped ship from their respective trees, and the branches look bare and skeletal. I am already looking forward to Christmas, and it feels strange to have something normal to look forward to. I miss Gabriel every single day but I've also missed my life having even a semblance of normalcy. I feel more like myself than I have in months. Even with the around-the-clock security detail. In fact, with everything I've been through, I feel a lot safer having them around. I grab the last box and go to find Clara in the kitchen. She is unloading groceries onto the stainless steel counter, arranging the boxes and cans by food type, brows knit in concentration. I think I'm going to make chili tonight, she says. I'll need to go back to the store and grab a load of ground beef. Joey will lose his mind, I reply, unpacking my box onto the counter. We have spent most of the morning running around collecting donations from various stores, there's enough food here to feed the rehab's residents for at least a week. Joey is one of the residents, not even old enough to drink yet, but in position of a pernicious heroin habit. He has a bit of a crush on Clara and always raves about her cooking, especially when she makes chili. All the more reason to make it, Clara says with a bright smile. Will you come with me to the store when we're done here? Of course. We should have time before Georgia's meeting with the district attorney, right? She wrinkles her nose. I promised I would come with her. I'm teaching a class after that, so I won't have time. Georgia is one of the residents here, who Clara has taken under her wing even more than the others. 
she is facing drug charges at the moment, and Clara is providing emotional support. I check the time on my phone. As long as we get these put away quickly. Both of us speed up, and within a few minutes, all of the food has been neatly stored away. Clara gives the counters a quick wipe, and then we head back out to the car. How are things going with Debbie? Clara asks. I sigh, hopping into the driver's seat. Three men slide into the car behind us. She's still pissed at me, I say as I pull out onto the road. She says until she can trust me again, she's only giving me freelance work. Writing that article on the purple heroin crisis was supposed to be my big break with the New York Union, where I have been writing bland puff pieces for years. Debbie Harris, my long-suffering editor, was with me through the whole process. She didn't understand why it took me so long to produce the finished product, and suspected I was holding something back. I was. I kept Gabriel's name and the Italian mafia out of it as much as I could. Since Debbie is aware of Gabriel's mob connections, having been threatened and blackmailed by his former Irish rival, Andrew Walsh, she knows exactly what I did and why. That's bullshit, Clara gripes. Your article shone a light on this whole crisis. The police only know half of the stuff they do because of your hard work. Besides, you and Gabriel are done, right? So there's nothing for her to worry about. My gut twists with her words. Clara doesn't mean to be callous, but she never liked Gabriel, and that was before she knew that he was a mafia don. Because of my relationship with Gabriel, Clara was targeted by the Irish mob and used as a pawn in their game. For months, her Irish boyfriend led her down a path of alcohol, drugs, and abuse. And this culminated in her alluring me to her apartment, where he tried to kill me. Clara pushed my would-be murderer out of a window to his death. Once I could see that Clara was properly on the path to recovery, I filled her in on the truth about my son's father. I didn't see it as a choice after what I'd put her through. But sometimes I wished I'd kept her in the dark. Now she only despises him more. It's fine for now, I say. I've been pretty busy anyway. True. How's the blog? I shrug, keeping an eye on a cyclist veering into the street. I don't get a ton of traffic, but it's only a baby. I got a fair amount of attention from the public and other news agencies for my article, and since then have been providing follow-up posts on my personal blog. The entries focus more on the individual experiences of addicts, rather than the distribution channels. The purple heroin trade is still very much alive and well in the city, despite my best efforts. And I like to keep reminding lawmakers and the public that the people suffering from this epidemic are human. Clara and I grab a few things at the store for her chili tonight. Then I drop her off at the DA's office and head back to the rehab center to put the food away. When I get there, I see Joey hanging out on the stoop, smoking a cigarette. Lexi, he greets jovially, face cracking into a wide smile. He has thick, curly blonde hair and freckles splattered over his nose and cheeks. He's only 17 and looks even younger, but the track marks on his arm paint a dark picture of his youth. He's healing, though, and hopefully, with my help and Clara's, he will have a long, happy life ahead of him. Help an old lady with some groceries? I ask. He laughs and stubs out his cigarette, then runs over to grab the bag from me. I hoist the remaining one from the car, and we head up the steps together. Where's Clara? He asks. With Georgia at the DA's office. She's making you guys chilly later, though. Sick! Joey exclaims as we head through the front door. I swear, her chili is even better than heroin. Yeah, it's her chili you're obsessed with, I remark. We drop the groceries onto the counter, and Joey helps me put them away, 
grinning to himself and chatting amiably about some new TV show he's hooked on. A man I don't recognize staggers into the room, and Joey stops mid-sentence, watching the man with trepidation. The stranger is tall and lanky, with thick bags under his brown eyes and a patchy head of dark hair. He wears an oversized T-shirt, stained in several places, and a pair of loose jeans. His feet are bare. The man gives me a once-over as he grabs a glass of water, then leaves the room as quickly as he came. You okay? I ask Joey. He wrinkles his nose. Fine. Just the new guy creeps me out. I look down the hall just in time to glimpse the man turning into the small sitting room. Why? Joey gets along with everybody. That's his whole thing. I don't know, he admits. There's something about him. Sanjay says that he's seen some shit, that he got real involved with the guys who are selling purple heroin. I don't know why he's here, but I don't get the impression he's committed to getting clean. Interesting. Do you know his name? I ask. Joey snags an apple from where I've just finished stacking them in the fruit bowl. Jeff, I think. He takes a bite and shrugs. I check the time. I'm due home in half an hour, but my babysitter, Anna, is usually pretty flexible. I give her a quick call, and she agrees to stay an extra hour. I leave Joey in the kitchen, already working on his second apple, and walk to the sitting room. Jeff is alone in there. I wonder if he gives the rest of the residents the creeps, too. He is sitting on the threadbare sofa watching TV, and his eyes swing to me as I enter, lips drawing back into a sleazy grin. Thought I might see you in here, he says in a croaky voice. I suppress an eye roll and perch on the ottoman across from him. I was wondering if I could ask you a few questions, I say. I write a blog on the purple heroin epidemic, I was told you were involved in some of the distribution channels. When he doesn't say anything, I add quickly, it would be completely anonymous. Jeff's smile snags into a sneer. You can ask me any question you like. Doesn't mean I'll answer it. What do you have to lose? What do I have to gain? He reaches out and places a hand on my knee. How about a little tit for tat? Ugh, emphasis on the tit, I presume. I brush his hand away. Your interview could help people. Is that not enough? Jeff sighs and leans back against the sofa cushions. He flicks the TV off and waves his hand at me. Go on then, ask your questions. I pull a notepad and pen out of my purse. Was your main contact a member of the Irish Mafia or the Colombian drug cartel? They're basically one and the same these days, he replies. But my friend runs with the Irish. Were you selling for them? I ask. He shakes his head. Nah, just consuming. And what made you want to seek help? Jeff grins. I thought to myself that once I got into a rehab center... Some pretty little thing with big tits might drop into my lap. He pats his crotch. So come on then, don't be shy. I scowl, disgusted. I'd appreciate it if you would take this seriously. And I'd appreciate it if you would suck my dick. I've had enough. I get to my feet, but Jeff hops up behind me and reaches around to squeeze my breasts. He laughs, and I can smell his breath, hot and acrid. My stomach roils with disgust. In one swift move, I wrench his arms down as I drop my body weight. Jeff lets out a shout of surprise as he rolls over my back, slamming into the wood floor with a loud bang. He lies there, disoriented, and I press my foot against his windpipe. Don't you ever fucking touch me again, I growl. His hands claw at my ankle, trying to pull me off, but I press harder. He makes a weak, gurgling sound, eyes whirling around the room. 
And for that matter, if I hear you've laid a hand on anyone in this facility, I will make sure that you regret it. Do you understand? He doesn't answer, and I grind my foot down harder. Do you understand? I demand. Yes, he rasps. I let him go, and Jeff sucks in a giant gust of breath and rolls onto his side, muttering something about me being a bitch and a tease. He can say what he wants, as long as he keeps his mitts to himself. As I storm out of the sitting room, I find one of the guards standing in the hallway, his hand on the gun at his hip. It is the closest any of them have gotten to me since Gabriel all but banished me, and his sudden appearance is startling. Do you know that clown? I ask, jamming my thumb in the direction of the asshole still rolling on the ground. The guard, whom I don't recognize, doesn't respond, and shifts his gaze to the opposite wall, as though I don't exist. Gabriel has clearly ordered them not to engage me. <sighs> I let out a frustrated sigh. Whatever. I head toward the front door, calling over my shoulder. Teach him a lesson about how to treat a lady. Anna is surprised to see me home early. I pay her for the extra hour anyway, and go to check on Harry, who is happily enjoying his afternoon nap in his crib. He just turned two years old, and he has grown so much in those two years that I'm worried I will blink and he'll be a teenager. He has dark, feathery hair, and eyes a deep shade of mahogany like his father. His cheeks are round now, but I expect as he gets older, they will become sharp and chiseled like Gabriel's. He's going to be a handsome kid. I hope the girls are ready. Gabriel hasn't been over to visit Harry since we were expelled from the mansion. I'm beginning to wonder if he ever will. I miss him like crazy, and it hurts knowing that he will never forgive me. It can't have been a coincidence that he was arrested the very same day my article went to print, even if I can't make sense of where the police found the connection. The guilt lies so heavily on me some nights that I lie in bed, unable to breathe, struggling under the weight of my loss. But I did what I had to do. I won't regret that. I glance out the window and see a familiar black town car pulled up against the opposite curb. I've noticed its presence a couple of times. At first, I just assumed it was my security detail, but they drive everywhere in an SUV. Plus, I've seen Gabriel in that very town car before. He has been watching me, and I don't understand why. He hates me, doesn't he? Why would he bother checking in on Harry and me if he has stepped out of our lives? Before he has a chance to drive away... I snatch up the baby monitor and bound down the stairs. My heart thumps at the bottom of my throat, blood singing at the thought of getting to see Gabriel face to face after one long, aching month. I'm angry at him for pushing me away, and sad that my actions drove him to do it. I'm worried about him, too. All in all, I think Gabriel and I are due for a long chat, and I'm going to seize the opportunity to initiate that now. I fling open the front door and sprint across the street, but the town car purrs to life and slides away from the curb before I can reach it. I try to peer through the tinted back window, desperate for a glimpse of the beautiful man responsible for so much of my pain. But I get nothing. I stand in the middle of the street and watch the car disappear into the distance, shoulders slumped. He won't even speak to me. He's that livid. I swear and head back inside, already itemizing a list of household tasks that I can dive into to distract myself. Gabriel doesn't want to speak to me, so maybe I should just leave it at that. We will live our separate lives, and he can continue watching from a distance. And me? I guess I'll continue loving him from a distance. Gabriel. I slam the car into reverse, swearing under my breath, and jam my foot on the accelerator.
The car zooms backward through the alley, and next to me, Silvano Gambaro grips the edge of the passenger seat. If you're gonna be any good to me as a consigliere, you'll need to have a little more nerve, I remark as we squeal onto the main street, cutting off a truck in the process. The truck beeps angrily, but I barely notice, jamming the car into first and then speeding forward. You need me for my skills and objective advice, he replies, eyes glued to the road ahead as I weave through traffic. Not for my ability to keep my lunch down while you drive like a maniac. I laugh. <laughs> you sound just like Vito. A couple months ago, my right-hand man, Vito Gambaro, was killed in a shootout with the Irish mob. He chose his younger brother to succeed him, and I've been putting the younger Gambaro through his paces ever since. Silvano's phone rings, and he answers, exchanging a few terse words with the person on the other end while I race through a busy intersection and narrowly avoid crashing into no less than three cars. They are near the park, Silvano informs me, shoving the phone back into his pocket and pulling out his gun. If we head down fourth, we should be able to cut them off, but... He trails off, lips clamping together, as though unsure of himself. I shoot him a look. But what? Spit it out. But Gio and Dom should make it there around the same time, he replies. I think we should leave it to them. I gear down quickly as we approach a red light, taking a screeching turn down a back alley instead. I frown. What do you mean, leave it to them? Gabriel, you are under investigation for murder he says in a tone a little too sharp for my liking. Do you really want to be caught speeding through the streets of New York to intercept a truck filled with guns and ammunition? We reach the end of the alley, and I take a sharp turn onto the street. Silvano slams into the door and swears under his breath. Serves him right. This is my empire we're talking about, Silvano. I bite out. Instead of telling me to take a back seat, you should be figuring out a way to keep me out of jail. I want you to look into the cops who are investigating me. Find out their strengths, their weaknesses, whether you think it's possible for us to grease their palms a little. We're near the park now, and I keep an eye out for the stolen truck. Two Irish idiots carjacked it as it left the docks, apparently not realizing that we GPS track all of our shipments. They have been sloppy since Kevin Lynch took over, sloppier than they were under his predecessor, Patrick Walsh. The streets have been flooded with guns, drugs, and violence. I seem to spend all my time putting out one fire or another. I spot the truck approaching in the distance and watch as Dom's car flies out of a connecting street and fishtails in front of it. Focus on the lead detective, Ruby Flint. I continue, pulling the emergency brake and sending us flying into the next lane of traffic so that we stop just behind Dom. Silvano's eyes widen as the truck continues to barrel toward us. I grab my gun and check that it's loaded. If we get her on our side, the rest should fall like dominoes, I continue, resting my hand on the door handle and looking over at Silvano. Yes? He nods hurriedly. Yes, of course. Good. I hop out of the car and meet Dom and Gio, who are both shooting at the approaching vehicle. The truck's brakes squeal and it lurches toward us, stopping a scant few feet ahead. We storm the cab and Dom and Gio pull the two men to the pavement and rip the weapons from their hands while I point my gun between them. Dom, take the truck to the warehouse, I order. Geo zip ties the wrists of one of the Irish thugs, then moves to the other. He already knows to take them back to the mansion for questioning. I address the two would be thieves who are spitting and cursing at Geo as he secures them. You're both going to be questioned, but only one of you will get to live, I say. If I were you, I'd be thinking of the most useful testimony I could provide. I doubt we'll get much out of either of them, but it's worth trying. Silvano doesn't say anything as I get back in the car. 
I start back for the mansion, considering his advice as I drive. I have always operated as much of the business as I can personally, and the thought of taking a step back doesn't sit right with me. Then again, he is right. I'm on the knife's edge at the moment. People have always tried to keep tabs on Gabriel Bellucci, the enigmatic billionaire. Now, I'm a suspected murderer as well. More people than ever before will be watching me. The longer the murder investigation and my war with the cartel drag out, the more my businesses and the people who rely on me will suffer. All I know for certain is I need to get this city back under my thumb, soon. And to achieve that, I'll do whatever it takes. The mansion feels quiet without Alexis and Harry in it. I thought I would get used to the sensation, but it has lingered. Even here in my office, where I would normally never be able to overhear them, I can somehow still sense their absence. The house feels hollow, vacant. I minimize the document on my screen and open up the security footage from inside Alexis's apartment. I know I shouldn't. I tell myself that I am simply looking in on my son, but if that's the case, then why do my eyes leave the crib, where Harry is wiggling around in his pajamas, to follow Alexis around the nursery. I cannot see the features of her face clearly, but they are forever imprinted in my mind. Her cupid's bow lips, the graceful line of her nose, the round cheeks full of laughter, the sparkling blue eyes. The camera picks up the sensual flare of her hips and her high, round tits. I've never seen a creature more perfect. She is built for seduction and I've fallen victim to that honeypot time and time again. I watch as she grabs a book from the shelf in the corner and brings it over to the crib. What about this one? she asks. Yeah, Harry replies happily. Alexis reads the book slowly, flipping the pages and showing Harry the pictures. When she's finished, she tucks him under the blanket and flicks the light off, but doesn't leave. Instead, she stands over his crib, watching as he drifts off to sleep. We used to do that together sometimes. I would rest my hand on her waist. She would lean against my chest. My hand reaches for my phone, and before I even realize what I'm doing, I dial the number for the apartment's landline. It rings, and Alexis straightens and looks over her shoulder. She tiptoes out of Harry's room and closes the door behind her. The phone keeps ringing, and I start to wonder if I'm actually going to talk to her. Alexis enters the frame on the kitchen camera and reaches for the phone on the counter. My heart gives a dull thud. I hang up. Alexis answers, and I can see her confusion as she realizes there is nobody there. She hangs up and sets the phone on the counter, staring at it like it's going to start ringing again any second now. I feel guilty somehow. Like I disturbed the perfect moment between mother and son for nothing. Like I got Alexis's hopes up that something exciting was about to happen. Like I nearly started to mend the bridge between us. Another impulse strikes me, and I reach for my phone again. This time, I don't call the apartment, but Angelo, one of the guards waiting outside of it. I deliver his orders and then sit back and wait watching as Alexis fills the dishwasher and wipes down the countertops. Afterwards, she walks around the apartment, picking up toys, rearranging pillows, and tidying up stacks of books and papers. She is putting a new garbage bag in the bin when her buzzer sounds. I sit forward in the chair and select the camera in the front hallway. Alexis walks to the door and opens it, her eyes widening with shock as Angelo hands her a large bunch of roses. I don't know where he found them at this hour, but I make a mental note to reward him for his quick work. Angelo leaves as quickly as he came. None of the guards are supposed to speak with her. Alexis carries the flowers into the apartment, and as she enters the view on the camera in the kitchen, I can see that she is grinning from ear to ear. She looks utterly delighted. My lips turn up into a smile as I watch her sniff the roses. One second lurches into the next, and I realize what a fucking idiot I am. I slam the lid of my laptop closed, disgusted at myself. 
How could I let myself be drawn in by her so easily? I haven't spoken to Alexis in over a month, yet in a moment of weakness, I'm suddenly buying her flowers. I need to get a grip. Alexis is my kryptonite, and right now, I need to stay as strong as possible. I check my watch, realizing that I have wasted an hour watching Alexis, and I now only have one hour to prepare for my meeting. Time flies when you're busy being a lovesick fool. I vow that this will be the last time. I make this vow a lot. I think it's starting to lose its power. I stare at the faces assembled around the long wooden table, wondering which of them will object most fervently to the strategy I am about to propose. There are my five capos, Mirko Bernardino, Dom Razi, Elia Conti, Piero Bianchi, and Thomas Ricci. Of those, I think Mirko and Dom will disapprove the most. Mirko won't think it's a good idea. Dom just won't want to see me get hurt. My lieutenant Antonio will have misgivings at first, but he is very tired. Any strategy that might give us an edge, which might draw this conflict to a quick resolution, will be welcomed by him. Silvano, I'm not sure. I know if Vito were here, he would nod through the meeting but pull me aside afterward to try to talk me out of it. He would begrudgingly agree in the end that it was worth trying, and we would have a glass of whiskey together while he talked about how in love he was with his wife. But Silvano is not Vito, and I am still getting my bearings with him. He seems to possess Vito's shrewd analytical mind without the familiarity we shared, which might make him the best advisor a leader could ask for. Our bond sometimes clouded Vito's judgment. After Vito was killed by the Irish, I nearly raised the whole city to the ground. I clear my throat, and the men sit forward, listening intently. I gathered you here to propose a strategy that could help us get rid of a number of cartel members at once, I begin. As you know, they have been getting the Irish to do most of their dirty work, keeping relatively clear of the smaller operations. That's because they're holding back, preserving their strength while Lynch bleeds dry. They nod along. I take a breath. I say, it's time we draw them out. How would we do that? Silvano asks, eyes narrowed. Well, Silvano, it was you who gave me the idea. You said it was too dangerous for me to keep leading the charge, that it might draw attention from the police. But it may have already drawn attention from the cartel. Given the chance, I think they will try to capture me. And when they do, it will be with their own men, not their Irish lackeys. They wouldn't risk me falling into anyone's hands but their own. Unease ripples across the gathered faces at the idea of me being captured. Most of the faces, anyway. What are you proposing? Antonio asks, a spark of interest in his coffee-colored eyes. I propose we set a trap, I reply. One where I am the bait. The table erupts with concerned murmurs. It's too dangerous, Dom objects. Traps backfire too easily, Mirko adds, just as expected. Antonio only nods sagely. Silvano's lips pull into a thin line and he scrubs a hand over his face, considering the idea. His eyes light up and I know that I have him on board. I stand up pressing my hands against the cool wood of the table. Silence! The murmur dies, and I have everyone's rapt attention once more. I look between their faces, expressions reading a scale from concern to excitement. I hear your misgivings, I say. But this is not up for discussion. We will not survive years of war. We need to lock this city down. I sit back in my chair, jaw set tight. And we need to do it now. Alexis, my heart is breaking. 
since I first started looking into the purple heroin crisis, I have heard a lot of sad stories. I have seen horrible things. And so far, I've been able to numb myself to it. But for some reason, the sad, crumpled woman in front of me is bringing stinging tears to my eyes, and I feel as though I will break down any second. This was him at his high school graduation, Shelley Wallace says, a wistful smile curving her lips as she passes me a framed photo of a young, pale-faced boy. Her smile does not reach her eyes. He wanted to be an engineer, she continues. He loved bridges. He had a poster of the Brooklyn Bridge in his room, and every time we would pass over one, he would say, Mom, look at those cantilevers, or check out the thickness of those cable stays. She sniffs, dropping her gaze to the hands in her lap. I don't even know how a boy like that gets involved in hard drugs. I look at the photo of the boy in my hands. His dark hair, his bright blue eyes, his crooked smile. He's the spitting image of his mother, though her eyes are tired, and her smile is a ghost of what I imagine it used to be. I sniff as well, trying to maintain a level of professionalism, but struggling. Maybe it's because this kid, Henry Wallace, could be hairy one day. What would I do if Harry started down a dark path? What could I do? I take a breath and hand Shelley back the photo. When did it start? I ask. She dabs her eyes with a handkerchief. I think just before his graduation, she says. He always struggled to make friends. So when he started hanging out with a new group, I thought it would be good for him. I didn't know at the time that they were into drugs, not until Henry started staying out late and coming home looking ragged and tired. Money started disappearing from my purse. She bites her lip, hugging the photo to her chest. We drove over an amazing suspension bridge on the way to visit my mother, and he didn't say a word, nothing. My heart hurts for this woman. I wonder if Gabriel has had these thoughts if he's worried about raising a child among all the violent delights of this world. I wonder what Gabriel would do if Harry started to sink down into the muck of it. Eventually, Henry stopped coming home, Shelley continues. He told me that he was staying with friends and that I shouldn't worry, but I did. I wish, she chokes, features twisting with agony. I wish I'd gone and dragged him home. I rest my hand on her knee, blinking back tears of my own. You couldn't have known, Shelley. I know, I know. She pats my hand, collecting herself. At least, that's what everyone keeps telling me. What happened next? I ask gently. I got a call from a man, she says, voice shaking. He had a thick accent. Latino, I think. He told me that my son's friends were in deep with the cartel, that they'd lost the drugs they were supposed to be selling, and that I needed to get $20,000 to them by the end of the next day. Otherwise, they were going to kill my son. My stomach twists. I already know how the story ends, but that doesn't make it any less horrific. I dug into my savings and Henry's college fund and wherever I could scrape the money from, I brought it over to this house, this horrible looking place, where the man said Henry and his friends had been staying. She takes a break, sobbing quietly. I squeeze Shelley's hand, and a tear rolls down my cheek. I wipe it away, taking a deep breath. They had killed them all, she says quietly. One man was waiting there for me. He put a gun to my head and took the money. He told me that one of my son's friends had tried to escape and that it was his fault my son was dead, like that was supposed to shift the blame. Her voice cracks at the end, and she curls in on herself, shoulders shaking with the force of her sobs. I lean forward and hold her. 
What kind of monsters is Gabriel dealing with right now? This cartel is ruthless, brutal. Killing those people, some of them kids, was senseless. And then to take money from a grieving mother while she is confronted with her son's corpse. <sighs> Unconscionable. I cannot believe Gabriel used to work with these monsters. I'm glad he doesn't anymore. I was wary of his fight against the cartel initially. I'd had my fill of death and violence, and it seemed to me like it would be better if he left well enough alone. But would it really be so bad if Gabriel wiped them all out? My phone buzzes in my pocket, but I don't reach for it. I grab a glass of water for Shelley, and we finish the interview. Once I have everything I need, she walks me to her front door, but before I leave, she grasps my hand in hers. Please, do something, she pleads, eyes swimming. They're selling to teenagers. Somebody needs to do something. I squeeze her hand. I will. I don't know what else I can do other than what I already have. I can tell their stories, but I can't force any real change. But Gabriel can. I leave and check my phone, noting one new text from Clara. I've missed you so much, my angel. Huh? It's such a strange text that I decide just to call Clara and see what she means. I presume it's some sort of bad joke that I just don't get. But at the same time, I'm a little worried that she's hit the sauce or something. Her line rings, but Clara doesn't answer. I try her again, still nothing. I'm due to meet Anna and Harry at the park, and since Clara's place is on the way, I decide to swing by and make sure she's okay. Clara has given me a set of keys. I try buzzing Clara's apartment when I arrive, but she doesn't answer. I let myself in and head up the stairs, quiet unease settling into my stomach like a dense fog. I don't like this. What if I find her passed out drunk inside? Worse, what if she has been shooting up purple heroin again? Clara was a recovering alcoholic for years before trying purple heroin. She always seemed so strong, so together. We would go to bars together, and she wouldn't bat an eyelid at the drinks flowing from the shiny copper taps. I never thought she would slip again, and certainly didn't think that when she did, she'd swan dive into purple heroin. I can thank her dead boyfriend, Killian, for that. I reach Clara's door and knock. Again, no answer. I go to unlock the door, but find it's already unlocked, which is strange. Clara is obsessive about locking her doors, especially considering the scary years she's had. I step inside, and my heart drops into my stomach like a boulder. The place is totally trashed. Furniture overturned, plates smashed across the kitchen tile, plants torn from their pots. Clara? I call, panicked, as I start to search for her. I calm the whole apartment, even checking under the bed and in the closet, but all I find is destruction. I sink to the floor in her bedroom, sending feathers wafting across the floorboards, and shakily dial 911. Hello, 911, what's your emergency? Comes a male operator's voice. I think my friend has been kidnapped, I say. The operator takes some details, Clara's name, my name, her address, the state of the scene, and, after a quick break to confer with the supervisor, tells me that they will look into it. Look into it, I ask. Somebody needs to come down here now. Ma'am, we will send an officer when we have one available. But this is an emergency line, not a when we have one available line, he sighs. The man actually sighs, as if I am draining him with my need to look into my friend's disappearance. Someone will look into it, he repeats. Have a nice day now. The line clicks, and I realize he has hung up on me. I growl in frustration and leap to my feet. 
I don't believe for a second that someone will come around to look into this. Could somebody have told him to get me off the phone during that pause? That this was one call they were better off not taking? This must have something to do with the cartel or Gabriel or the Irish. The fact that there are so many possible culprits makes me uneasy. What if the Irish took revenge against Clara for killing Killian? What if the cartel have taken her hostage in response to what I've written about them? Or what if Clara did something to piss off Gabriel, thinking that she was helping Harry and me, and he is punishing her for it? No, Gabriel wouldn't hurt her. But right now, I think he's the only person who can help her. I call Gabriel's number, and it rings twice and then goes straight to voicemail. I hang up and call again. This time, it doesn't even ring. I swear and swipe my hand through the pile of feathers next to me. But they merely drift softly back to the ground again. Not very satisfying. His refusal to acknowledge my existence is infuriating. He dragged me into this world, introduced me to demons and devils, and now is pretending that I no longer exist. What if I need him like I do now? Am I supposed to just tell my silent guards to pass along a message to their boss? Has my relationship with Harry's father, the man who used to hold me and promise me he would always keep me safe, actually been reduced to nothing more than a game of telephone? I call Gabriel again, and when he still won't answer, decide to leave a voicemail. Call me back, asshole. Clara is missing, and I sincerely doubt she has just gone out for milk. This has something to do with you and whatever war you're fighting right now. And that means that you need to fix this, so help me God. I hang up. That felt good. While I'm at it, I decide to unload a couple other things that have been playing on my mind since he shut me out. I call again. Predictably, it goes to voicemail. For the record, I do not regret writing that article. Good things came out of it. And in case you didn't notice, I didn't include you in it on purpose. To this day, nobody suspects you of being the leader of the Italian mob. Nor do they suspect Italian involvement in the purple heroin trade at all. Do you know how famous I could be right now if I'd broken the news that one of the country's most fawned over billionaires was the leader of a powerful crime syndicate? Do you think I'd still be writing whatever Debbie Harris deigns to chuck my way each week? Hell, I could have written a book, sold movie rights. So just, I don't know, think about that. I hang up again heart racing as though I'd ranted to Gabriel in person instead of just at his voicemail. Not the strongest ending to the voicemail, I admit, but it feels good to get it all out there. I peel myself off the floor and try calling Clara again before I leave. I'm going to be late to meet Anna if I don't go now. It's a beautiful, sunny fall day, it's the kind of cheery day that seems to deny all that's grim in the world, whether it's the oncoming winter or your best friend's mysterious disappearance. I sit on the bench beside the sandbox, one eye on Harry, one eye on my phone as I type out another text to Clara. I've missed you so much, my angel. What the hell does that mean? I haven't been able to think about anything else since I left Clara's apartment. And I even considered asking Anna if she could watch Harry for the rest of the day, just so I could devote my whole brain to puzzling it out. That wouldn't help anything, though. Clara is gone. And wherever she is, she either doesn't have her phone or is refusing to answer it on purpose. The playground is strangely desolate. There is only one other family here, which is odd, even for a weekday. Just beyond the sandbox, there is a small group of ratty-looking teenagers sitting in a circle under a tree. I notice another group leaning against the chain-link fence at the edge of the park, though they seem a little older. Then, of course, there's my security detail, 
Two men sitting on a bench across the sand pit from me, pretending like they are there to do anything other than watch me. I let my phone fall in my lap and take a breath, devoting my attention to Harry. He's clumping sand into a lopsided mound in front of him, but it's not going well. His mouth is screwed up in frustration. I'll take him to see the ducks after this. That always cheers both of us up. He goes to grab another handful of sand, but comes up with something long and thin, like a plastic tube. I bolt to my feet and dive toward Harry, ripping the needle out of his grasp, knocking over his sand creation in the process. Harry, already on the edge because of his failed engineering, starts to cry. What kind of monster leaves a used needle in a sandbox? I look around, noting with satisfaction that my guards have moved to the edge of the sandbox, ready to leap into action if needed. My eyes skim over the group of teenagers by the tree, and I notice one of them is tying a tourniquet around his arm. There's my answer. I look to the two sagging figures at the fence and realize both of them are drugged out. They look half dead. <sighs> no wonder this park is empty. It has been taken over by purple heroin users. I meet the eye of the taller of the two guards. I recognize him as one of the guards who used to be posted outside of my bedroom when I lived in the mansion, though I don't remember his name. Do you see this? I say, holding up the needle. He doesn't reply, but his jaw tightens. You need to get Gabriel to deal with it. I toss the needle onto the pavement in disgust, and pull Harry into my arms. Gabriel. On the same afternoon that I received a message about the hypodermic needle in the sandbox, I get the news that an Italian business, a quiet bookstore at the fringe of our territory, has been attacked. The cartel left me a message at the scene. I drive out to inspect the damage personally. The whole drive, I am disturbed by the mental image of my son holding a dirty needle, perhaps more disturbed by that than by the thought of the carnage that awaits me at the bookstore. Harry should be shielded from all this. He is too young, too innocent, and the thought that the ugliness of this drug epidemic has found a way to reach him, even though I have kept my distance, makes my blood boil. I tell David to wait around the block when we arrive at the bookstore. Everything seems normal from the outside, except for the drawn blinds and the sign indicating that the shop is closed, even though it's the middle of the day. Are you sure about this? David asks. Yes. I get out of the car and he drives off. I dust off the wrinkles in my suit and enter the store, the bell above the door clanging to announce my arrival. The stench of blood hits me like a wall as I enter. I wrinkle my nose and step over piles of books that have been stripped violently from the shelves, some of which have been knocked over completely. The posters have been ripped down. The walls are decorated in slashes of blood instead. I step in further, avoiding the bloody splotches on the floor. I find the shop's owner by the till with two other bodies. They have been sat up against the counter, arranged in a neat line that contrasts with the horrific and systematic mutilation of their bodies. These people were not shot. Their deaths were not quick. This was an act of senseless violence, and the level of brutality suffered by the victims is far beyond anything I would ever dole out to an enemy. A wave of nausea rolls over me, but I suppress it, stepping over to the counter which has been cleared of everything except one small square of paper. Not paper, I realize as I approach. It's a photograph. It is smeared with dried brown blood, but I would recognize the face anywhere. Alexis. This is their message, and I read it loud and clear. I will make them pay. I will make them all pay. The back door slams open, and three cartel members appear, shouting to each other in Spanish as they surround me, guns drawn. Hands up! One screams. Hands up! I do as they say, 
lifting my hands into the air, still clutching the photo. More of them march out from the back, and I count at least eight in total. As the men train their guns on me, I can't help but smile. I am going to enjoy this so very much. The lights go out, and I duck down, swinging my leg out to knock the man in front of me onto his back. The men shout in confusion. I wrestle the gun out of the grip of the man on the ground, just as gunfire starts to crack around me. The lights flick back on, and the cartel thugs are surrounded. They yell to each other in alarm. One makes to flee, and Angelo tackles him to the ground. A couple of them are dead already, but I hop to my feet and help my men make short work of the rest. When we are done, the bookstore is somehow bloodier than it was before. I feel better knowing I can now tell the victims' families that we avenged their deaths. Nobody should have to die like that. But until I put the cartel down for good, this carnage will continue. On my way back to the mansion, I stare at the bloody photo of Alexis, ignoring David's concerned glances in the rearview mirror. My face is covered in blood splatter, but that hardly seems to matter. Not when she's in danger. But why should that matter? This is a threat against Alexis, not Harry. I shouldn't care if she lives or dies. I should hate her. But of course, I don't. I call Silvano and tell him to order Alexis's guards to sequester her and Harry in the apartment. If they are out, the guards are to bring her back by force if necessary. I will not take any chances. It's always convenient when the coward of a hostile group makes himself known. It takes the guesswork out of deciding which men to execute and which to take for questioning. In the case of the men who attacked me in the bookstore, I already know that the one who tried to escape is the one most likely to fold. That was why Angelo tackled them, kept them alive. And it's why I expected to have an easy time questioning him. Only I'm not. His name is Carlos, and he has disgusting teeth. Parts of them are black, but mostly they're an awful orange-yellow. He stinks, too, like sweat and moldy cheese. In my head, I compare him to Miguel Garcia, who was my contact with the cartel before everything went to shit. Miguel was always impeccably clean, his suits pressed, his teeth pearly white. What I wouldn't give to be dealing with him right now, instead of this human shit stain. This human shit stain, I should add, who refuses to talk. Tell me who you get your orders from, I demand, not for the first time. Carlos is tied to the metal chair in the center of my basement, his curly black hair matted with sweat and blood. He spits on the floor by my feet. I grimace and punch him in the gut. Carlos keels over, wheezing. Tell me who you get your orders from, I repeat. He continues to wheeze, head hanging over his chest, and I soon realize that Carlos isn't struggling to breathe. That awful, breathy sound, like someone wrestling with bagpipes, is his laugh. I dig my fingers into his hair and yank him up to face me. He grins. What are you laughing about? I ask. I have been at this for an hour. He has said so little that for the first twenty minutes I wondered if he was mute. The fact that he is laughing now unsettles me. <laughs> your whole world is about to come crashing down at your feet. He hisses through rotted teeth. He laughs again, like he knows something that I don't like I have lost already. I tire of this, I say, pulling my gun from my shoulder holster. I cock it and aim it at his head. This is your last chance. Carlos's expression flickers, and for the first time, I see a pinprick of fear in his soulless eyes. But he merely shrugs, as though urging me to go ahead with it so he can get on with the rest of his day. I oblige him and pull the trigger. Carlos's body slumps forward, and I hand the gun back to Antonio. The cartel thug's last words prickle at my skin like pins and needles, 
and I can't tell why. Telling me that my world is about to come crashing at my feet could mean anything, but more likely than not, it means nothing. It is the kind of vague threat any theatrical villain would toss at his opponent's feet when faced with death. Yet somehow it felt like he knew something. Something big. I call Silvano on my way out of the cellar, hoping to hear the good news that Alexis and Harry are safely tucked away in their apartment with a bevy of guards around them. Alexis will hate being locked up. Perhaps she will leave me another angry voicemail. I'd like that. I found the last one she left amusing. It reminded me of all the times Alexis would run a mouth at me like she thought she was the one in charge, and that, in turn, reminded me of all the times I put her in her place. Silvano picks up as I reach the top of the stairs. Hi, boss. Are Alexis and Harry safe? I turn toward the foyer, then start to mount the grand curving staircase. A maid scuttles out of view like a startled crab. I haven't been able to reach their guard detail, Silvano replies. I grind my teeth, stopping at the top of the stairs. What do you mean you can't reach them? None of them are answering their phones, and Alexis and Harry aren't at the apartment. Carlos's threat rings through my ears. Your whole world is about to come crashing down at your feet. I shake my head. Find them. Now. I turn and storm toward my office, resisting the urge to dash out the front door and find them myself. I have already dispatched another team to look for them. They're following the tracker in Alexis's phone. Good. I enter my office, but I will struggle to get any work done while Alexis and Harry are unaccounted for. I try to tell myself it's only Harry I'm worried about. Alexis can hang for all I care. But I think about when she was kidnapped by Andrew Walsh and the terrified look in her eyes and my stomach flips. I've prepared a file on each of the detectives working on your case, Silvano continues. I emailed them over to you. I've suggested which weaknesses I think we could exploit and compiled a detailed list of the family members and loved ones. From his place on the wall, my father's portrait glares down at me as I cross the room. Fabrizio Bellucci wouldn't hesitate to threaten a cop's family in order to undermine an investigation. He would use whatever manipulations he thought were necessary, plus a few more for good measure, and he would sleep as soundly as a monk. I glare back at my father and take a seat behind my desk. The thought of what I might need to do in the coming months leaves a sour taste in my mouth. But the other choice is going to prison, watching my empire crumble, leaving my son and heir vulnerable in my absence. I can't do that. I won't. I'll look over it, I say. Call me the second you have an update on Alexis and Harry's location. I expect to hear from you within the next thirty minutes. I end the call and rest my elbows on the desk, cradling my face in my hands. Flashes of red paint the backs of my eyelids. I can't stop thinking about the gory scene in the bookshop, the utter brutality of this new enemy. What will they do if they get their hands on my son? Or on Alexis? I can't let my mind go there. I will get them back into custody, and once I do, I will tighten their security. Perhaps I should bring Harry back to the mansion, where I can monitor his safety more closely. No, I can't. It's that same conundrum again. Both of them, or neither of them. I can't separate them. I can't do that to Alexis. She would worry too much, and probably call a dozen times a day. She'd be insufferable. Alexis I call again, but Clara's phone doesn't even ring anymore. It just goes straight to voicemail. Where is she? I know deep down that something has happened to her, but I am trying not to acknowledge that thought. If I do, my heart will crack in two. For now, I'm telling myself she just got drunk again, 
had a little slip down the rabbit hole. Maybe she trashed her apartment and has turned off her phone to cool down for a while. But where would she go? After the park, I take Harry to the rehab center to check if Clara is there. Joey is smoking out front and says he hasn't seen her since she made chili for them a few days ago. He offers to help me look for her, but the kid is already caught up in hard drugs. The last thing he needs is for me to introduce him to the world of organized crime. Clara's mom's house is a short walk away from the center, so I decide to try there next. If nothing else, Patricia always likes it when I visit with Harry. And maybe she'll be able to calm me down a little as I'm approaching something like hysterics. My mind whirs. My only slight consolation is that if the cartel or the Irish took her, she will still be alive. They wouldn't kill her just yet. No, they will use her suffering to torture me first, or to lure me to them. My stomach turns, and I cling to the desperate hope that I will find Clara at her mother's house, drying out after a particularly nasty bender. Or maybe Gabriel took her. Maybe he knew that his enemies were planning some sort of attack on her, and he took her for her own safety. That would be fine, too, because I know at least that he will take good care of her. But then why won't he answer his goddamn phone? He must know how worried I am. I hug Harry against my hip as I walk down the street. He's getting heavy. It makes me sad to think that there's going to come a day when I will pick him up for the last time. But we're still a long way from that. Besides, soon enough, I will have another baby that will need carrying and holding. And I will literally have my arms full. I'm sure by that point, I'll be more than happy to let Harry toddle around on his own two feet. Another baby. I'm keenly aware every second of the day that I'm pregnant, but sometimes I forget what that means. It slips my mind that in less than nine months, Harry will have a little brother or sister, and I'll have one more thing connecting me to Gabriel. I wish that I could share this pregnancy with him. I want to listen to him talk to the baby, tell it all the things they're going to do together once it's born. I want him to rub cocoa butter on my belly and bear with me through whatever moods I'm in, or whatever foods I'm craving. I was alone for my last pregnancy. Sure, I had Clara, but I spent the nights alone, suffered through the morning sickness alone, and braced myself for a lifetime of being alone. I got pregnant with Harry after a one-night stand with Gabriel, and I never thought I'd see him again. I definitely never thought I'd be pregnant with another of his children. And if I had somehow been able to weave that fantasy in my mind, I wouldn't have imagined having to go through a second pregnancy as a single mother. I am so wrapped in my thoughts that I don't notice the huge man ambling toward me down the sidewalk until he's only a dozen or so feet away. He's probably close to seven feet tall, with an olive complexion and a long, hooked nose. His eyes are locked on me, and there is a menacing glint to them. Adrenaline flushes into my system, and I am on high alert. I turn around, hoping to outpace him, but I can hear his long, loping strides getting closer. I look around frantically for my guards, but I can't see a single one. Where the hell are they? They usually detain anyone who even looks at me. The man darts into my path, and I stop suddenly. Where are you going, mommy? He asks in a syrupy voice. I don't want any trouble. He tilts his head to the side, leering down at me. From what I hear about you, you're all kinds of trouble. He knows who I am. Never a good sign. Please, just leave me alone. I have a baby. The man snorts. You act so innocent, it's disgusting. Don't you know that it's your fault your little boyfriend was arrested for murder? 
I would love to see how Gabriel would react to someone calling him my little boyfriend. In fact, I wish he was here right now to do just that. I don't know what you're talking about. I hug Harry tighter to my chest. He looks around, clearly noting my discomfort. I bet you thought you were doing the right thing, didn't you? The man steps closer, and I step back. You wanted to save the world. But you had no idea that by publishing that article, you would be violating the terms of our agreement with Gabriel. The terms where he did our dirty work, and we agreed to not provide the evidence that would send him to jail. Guilt laces with my terror. But right now is not the time to analyze this man's claims. I push through the questions floating above my head and focus on an exit strategy. I am nowhere close to my apartment, but I'm only a couple blocks from Clara's mom's place. If I turn and run, I might be able to make it there and call for help. If Gabriel bothers to pick up this time. The man lurches forward, and I spin on my heel and sprint in the other direction. Mommy, what doing? Harry asks, squirming in my arms. Shh, we're just playing a game, baby. I soothe. I chance a look behind me, and the man is closing in. He's big, but his long legs mean he's fast, too. I would be a lot faster if I wasn't carrying a chubby toddler. Our game of tag elicits a few confused looks from the other pedestrians on the sidewalk, but nobody stops to help the woman carrying the child being chased by the ogre. Sometimes I love New York. Now is not one of those times. Ahead of me, a similarly tall and menacing man cuts a path down the sidewalk toward me, and I realize that I'm screwed. Short of darting out into the street, my only option is to slip down the oncoming alleyway and try to lose them on the other side. I make an abrupt left down the alley and pound my feet as quickly as I can toward the other side. I can hear two sets of thumping footsteps behind me. They're close. Way too close for comfort. I push harder, struggling to suck in breaths. I'm not going to make it. A hand closes on my arm and yanks me to a stop, nearly pulling my shoulder from its socket. I yelp in pain. Dumb bitch, the first man hisses, locking my arm behind my back. Get the baby so I can zip tie her. I hate it when they make us run. The other man commiserates, walking around my front. I do the only thing I can think to do. I start screaming Gabriel's name. It's a desperate, stupid move. I should be screaming, help, or fire, or whatever one is supposed to yell to attract the attention of the otherwise disinterested public. Gabriel can't hear me, but I call out for him anyway, as if I might be able to draw him down this alley by sheer force of will. Shut up, the second man says, reaching for Harry, who starts to scream bloody murder. My heart races. No, they're going to take him. I can't let them. But with my arm twisted behind my back, there isn't much I can do except try to shuffle away. Let go of her, comes a dark voice from behind me. The three of us freeze, which would be an amusing tableau if we weren't midway through a kidnapping with a crying baby in my arms. I look over my shoulder and let out a joyful laugh. Angelo, Angelo Romano has come to save the day, and he's brought back up. He is standing with his gun pointed at the man holding my arm, and two other serious-faced guards flank him with their guns drawn. John and Matteo, I think their names are. My attacker releases my arm, and I scurry behind Angelo. He is my favorite of Gabriel's men, and was assigned as one of my personal guards when I lived in the mansion. I suspect it was because of this personal attachment that Angelo wasn't assigned to guard me in the apartment. I bounce Harry, trying to calm him down, as we back out of the alleyway. John shoots a concerned look in our direction. What's wrong with him? He asks. I frown. What's wrong? 
He's scared. Somebody just tried to kidnap him. We make it to the street, and John guides me by the arm to a car waiting next to the sidewalk. But he's not harmed? Henry sniffles and hiccups. No, he's not harmed. I roll my eyes. He is clearly only worried about what Gabriel will do if anything happened to Harry. I'm no less grateful for it, but suddenly my rescue feels a little cheap. They aren't here for me. They're here for the goods. Gabriel's progeny and the one growing in my belly. I get in the car, and Angelo gets in beside me, ruffling his thick brown hair as we pull out into the street. You do get yourself in some scrapes, he comments. It's nice to see you too, I remark dryly. His gray eyes sparkle with mirth. He leans over and tickles Harry's chin, which nearly earns him a smile. Angelo's cute, a bit too round in the face for my liking, but I could see Clara finding him attractive. Clara, shit. I pull my phone out and dial her number again. Her phone is still off. What's wrong? Angelo asks. I need to speak to Gabriel. I bite my lip, thinking about what King Kong said to me back there about Gabriel's arrest. Gabriel and I have a lot of things to talk about. A pained expression flickers over Angelo's features. I'm not sure that will be possible. We're just supposed to take you back to the apartment and await orders. Angelo, please. He glances at the front seat, where the other guards are talking in low voices to each other. He chews his bottom lip. You know me, I say, jumping on his indecision. I'll make a big scene. I'll get Harry to start crying again. And that's going to really freak John out. Angelo chuckles. Let's get you back into the apartment safely. And then I'll see what I can do. Gabriel. As requested, Silvano calls me in less than half an hour to update me on Alexis's whereabouts. She's safe, he says. Angelo and the others have her, and they're bringing her back to the apartment now. Angelo says there were two members of the cartel trying to subdue her when they found her. He had to let them go so they could prioritize getting Harry and Alexis away safely. I don't care, as long as they're okay. Should be at the apartment within minutes. My shoulders sag, and I lean back in my chair. I have spent the past twenty minutes trying and failing to get work done. Every time I try to concentrate, an image of Alexis and Harry, bound to a chair somewhere in the dark, popped into my brain, and thoughts would scatter like dandelion seeds in the wind. Any word on her guards? I ask. No, none of them are answering their phones, and they're not at the apartment or in their car. That's worrying. To have Alexis's security details suddenly and silently go missing is not a good sign and I'm just glad that Angelo found her. Once she's in the apartment, that's where she's going to stay. Alexis won't like it, but she will have to learn to deal with it. She escaped by the skin of her teeth, and we might not be so lucky next time. Call me when they're back at the apartment and it's secure, I instruct. I check the time on my watch. I have only an hour until I need to be at my office in the city for a meeting. I'm being interviewed for a lifestyle column in some executive magazine. I don't much feel like having the threads of my life examined by some self-important journalist, and I consider canceling. Common book, my publicist, will spit actual fire if I do. I have canceled every interview she has set up since I was arrested just over a month ago, and as she has reminded me many times... If I don't start rehabilitating my public image, my business will suffer. It just hardly seems to matter what the city's gossips think about the CEO of Bellucci Incorporated when the dawn of the Italian mafia is fighting a gruesome war. But this life, this charade, is a delicate balancing act, and I need to start tipping the scales back toward a neutral center before they tumble over entirely. Silvano calls back ten minutes or so later to inform me that Alexis and Harry are secure. Good, 
I see. I want her guard tripled for the foreseeable future. Two in the apartment at all times, plus guards posted outside and regular patrols of the area. Silvano clears his throat. She <clears throat> has asked to see you. My chest tightens. For a second, I am tempted. But what good would come of that? She would only try to manipulate me further, and that is the last thing I need amidst all this madness. No, I reply. Angelo says she's being quite insistent. Angelo would say that, I growl. My son is safe. As far as I'm concerned, Alexis and I have nothing to talk about. I hang up, irritation buzzing through my veins. Alexis only wants to talk to me because Angelo and his men have told her she cannot leave the apartment. She wants to bargain. Or worse, she thinks she can twist me around a finger, and I will let her do whatever it is her crooked little heart desires. I call my driver and tell him to meet me at the front door with the car. The woman sitting in front of me sips her green tea daintily, watching me over the top of the mug with cat-like interest. I can almost see her swishing her tail behind her. Her blonde hair is pulled back into a long, shiny ponytail, and her gray eyes are smudged artfully so that they seem bigger. She wears an expensive-looking pantsuit, the pointed toes of a Jimmy Choo's poking out underneath. Taylor Green is not merely a lifestyle columnist. Whatever she writes about me will have substance and will be braided with her opinions and observations. I need to be careful. Thank you for meeting with me, Mr. Bellucci, Taylor says in a level, honeyed voice. She places the tea down on the desk and crosses her legs. Shall we begin? I sit straight in my executive chair, not a thread out of place. Outside this office, I have enemies converging on me from all sides. Not in here. In this office, I have all the time in the world. Yes. Let's begin. Taylor opens the notebook in a lap, pen poised over the page. It has been a busy year for you, Mr. Bellucci, she comments. Various run-ins with the press, a mother and child who seemingly appeared out of nowhere, and now a murder trial. Her eyes flick up, and I suppress an irritated scowl. I hate when reporters pose statements as if they are questions. I don a tight-lipped smile. Yes, it has been a busier year than most, I admit. On the subject of your delightful little family, many of your critics have noticed their absence from the public eye recently. Can you comment? I want to tell her that it's none of her business, and perhaps a few months ago would have done just that. But I have practiced maintaining a cool head in front of the press even when it comes to answering uncomfortable questions. Recently, Carmen made the rather astute observation that now that I am being investigated for murder, I cannot be seen to publicly lose my temper. It paints too clear a picture. Harry and Alexis are well, I answer. Alexis and I decided we wanted to keep Harry out of the public eye and away from the madness of the trial as much as possible. So, for the time being... We are living separately. Taylor cocks a sculpted brow. That must be very difficult. It is, I nod. But it's for the best. Alexis and I love each other very much, and we love our son even more. We just want what's best for him, even if, at the moment, that means I must keep him at arm's length. I wonder what Taylor would say if I told her the truth that Alexis and Harry are living separately from me because I cannot stand to be in the same room as the woman who twisted a knife in my heart, but I have to keep her close to prevent her from being brutally murdered by my enemies. It would certainly make for a more interesting interview. By the end of my interview with Taylor Green, we are laughing like old friends. I doubt she would be so cheerful if she knew that I'm guilty of the charges against me that I murdered my father 
that he was not the first or last to face his fate down the barrel of my gun. But this is the whole point of this exercise. The world can never know what kind of monster is lurking just below the surface of my CEO persona, though the temptation to reveal my pointed teeth and do away with the pretense will always linger. Once Taylor is gone, I soon realize I have little else to do with my evening. Many of my responsibilities for Bellucci Incorporated have been siphoned away in preparation for the trial, and the quick check-in with Silvano reveals that he has learned nothing further about Alexis's attackers or Clara's whereabouts. I guess I should just go home then. I grab my coat and head for the door, but with each step, the prospect of rattling around my empty mansion seems less and less tempting. Alexis's ghost is everywhere, sprawled over the sofa with a laptop, head poking in the refrigerator looking for a late night snack, bent over my desk, her ripe ass high in the air. I shake my head and decide to avoid going home for a little while. I have a rare night off. I may as well try to enjoy it. Take me to Fiamma, I say as I get in the car. David cocks his brow. I have not been to the nightclub in years. I ignore his questioning stare and sit back against the leather, thinking back to when I first saw Alexis under Fiamma's flashing lights nearly three years ago. She wore a glittery silver dress that caught my attention in the crowd. Her hair was longer then, nearly down to her waist, and I watched as she flung it back and forth while she and Clara danced wildly to the music. She wasn't trying to be sexy but she invariably was. It was difficult for me to look away, but I had business on my mind that night. The next time I saw Alexis, she was arguing with the bartender. It was then I knew I had to have her, and when I did, she certainly didn't disappoint. Those were simpler times. They seemed chaotic and desperate, but that was nothing compared to now. David pulls up in front of the club, which looks desolate from the outside. On the weekends, Fiamma is the place to be, and club goers line up for hours to get in. On weekdays, however, it's a more casual affair. I'll be waiting in the parking lot out back, David says. I get out and walk past the bouncer, who stands a little straighter when he sees me. What serves as a dance floor on the weekend is scattered with small round tables, each lit intimately with a single flickering candle. A few couples and small groups sit on stools around the tables, and I turn some heads as I enter. I head straight for the bar. The bartender, a tall brunette with wide green eyes, comes over to me straight away. She smiles nervously, obviously recognizing me. What can I get for you? She asks. Whiskey. She doesn't ask what kind, just goes straight for the good stuff and slides a glass over to me. I drain the glass and tap the rim. She pours me another. There was a group of three girls propped up at a nearby table, each of them dressed to the nines. Their attention snapped to me the second I sat at the bar, and now they giggle conspiratorially with each other presumably trying to work up the nerve to approach me. It takes until I've finished my third whiskey and I'm nursing a fourth for one of them to pluck up the courage. The lithe redhead disengages from the group and saunters over to me. She is wearing a skin-tight emerald green dress that emphasizes her substantial assets, and every inch of her is primped and polished to an almost inhuman standard, from the perfect line of her ruby-red lips to the even fan of her black eyelashes. She leans on the bar next to me and smiles. What's a man like you doing drinking alone? Her voice comes out like a purr. It strikes me that this used to be the kind of woman who would catch my eye, expensive looking, with a playful glint in her eye. The kind of woman who knows the score and isn't looking for a man to take her out for brunch or to the farmer's market. I don't know when this kind of woman lost all appeal to me. I suspect around the time Alexis first sashayed into my life. You have no idea what kind of man I am, I reply, disinterestedly, 
downing the rest of my glass and tapping it on the bar. The bartender hands me a fresh whiskey. The woman to my right is undeterred. Maybe I'd like to, she says. Why don't you tell me? Her voice lowers. Better yet, you could show me. I shake my head. You're wasting your time. She stands by for a moment longer, likely wondering if this is all part of some game I like to play, or if she is actually being dismissed. I send her a narrow stare, which seems to elucidate it for her, and she goes trotting off toward her friends with a haughty sniff. The bartender comes over and leans her hip against the bar. Francesca isn't used to being turned down like that. You may have done permanent damage. I chuckle humorlessly and take another swig of whiskey. It burns deliciously down my throat and sends tendrils of warmth through my veins. I am feeling a lot looser than I was when I first sat down, more relaxed. Perhaps I should drink my problems away more often. She takes a breath and eyes me up and down, as though gathering her courage. Oh, Christ. I'm not about to get hit on by her, too, am I? Do you want to talk about it? The bartender asks, licking her lip. I cock a brow. What makes you think I want to talk? She shrugs. You sat at the bar, rather than in a corner booth by yourself, and you keep staring at your phone like you're waiting for it to ring. She's not wrong. My lip pulls back in an amused smile. <laughs> What's your name? Tracy. In a clearer state of mind, I would likely tell Tracy to mind her own business. But with the whiskey meandering through my veins, I'm feeling uncharacteristically chatty. There's not much to talk about, Tracy. I shrug. I love a woman who did something unforgivable. And now... There's no going back. Unforgivable, huh? Tracy folds her arms. Did she sleep with your brother? I don't have a brother. So your friend then? No. I frown. She didn't sleep with anyone. Okay, got it. So she killed someone you care about. My brow knits together and I blink. What the fuck are you talking about? Of course not. I'm just running through a list of unforgivable slights, Tracy says with a grin. Am I close at least? <laughs> not even close. So then what did she do? Tracy doesn't seem to care that she is one false step away from offending the man who owns the place she's making her living. Now that she has gathered her courage, she is on a roll. She reminds me a little of Alexis in that respect and this makes my tongue a little looser than it should be. She betrayed my trust, I reply. Tracy cocks a brow. But not by cheating on you. No. And you're sure whatever she did is an absolutely unforgivable offense? It has to be, I say. I don't have the privilege of showing any weakness. Tracy nods thoughtfully. And you would consider forgiveness to be a weakness? Yes. I tip back my glass and send the rest of its contents splashing down my throat. Tracy begins to pour me another. I would say the opposite, she says, sliding the glass over to me. Personally, I've never been good at relationships. I'm a selfish person, and it has always been much easier for me to give up on a person rather than to accept their faults. So to me, the idea of working through problems, seeing the other person's side and learning to forgive them, well, I would say that all takes a lot of strength. Cutting ties and trying to banish them from your mind is the much easier, weaker thing to do. I'm not sure what to make of Tracy's candor. She doesn't know the nuances of mine and Alexis's fraught relationship. She doesn't know what Alexis did. Still, somehow what she says makes sense in a way. 
I always thought pushing Alexis away was a show of strength. I never thought that anyone might view the action any other way. I think I've had enough, I say, pushing up from the bar. I don't know whether I mean I've had enough to drink or enough of this uncomfortable advice, but either way, I leave the full glass on the bar top. Tracy's smile wavers. She thinks she has offended me. I leave her a generous tip to communicate that she has nothing to worry about. I leave the club via one of the back doors that leads into the parking lot. The cement is bathed in the orange glow of a single street lamp, leaving a ring of impenetrable darkness beyond. I spot the town car a dozen or so yards away and set one foot carefully in front of the other. I am a little unsteady on my feet, so I throw all my concentration into making it to the car without tripping over myself. A man materializes from the shadows to my right. He is heavily tattooed with a four-leafed clover stamped proudly on his neck to designate him as Irish Mafia. I don't know whether he is here to pass a message or to kill me, but I don't give him the chance to do either. I whip my gun out from my shoulder holster and put a bullet in his skull. At least, I mean to. My aim is sloppy from the drink, and the bullet slices through his neck instead. He falls to the ground, choking on the blood gushing from his carotid artery. David has hopped out of the car at this point and is standing with his gun drawn. You okay? I walk past the dying man, shrug, and get into the back of the car. Take me home. Alexis. It is raining outside. Thick, fat drops that pelt the pavement like bullets. It patters against the window hypnotizing me as I stare out into the gray, my cup of coffee going cold in my hands. Harry is sitting on the rug in front of me, moving the rolling pin from his kitchen playset back and forth through the thick shag. There are two guards lurking somewhere in the apartment, but it feels quiet and empty. Just me, Harry, and the endless rain. I set my coffee down stretch out on the sofa, and look up at the camera in the corner. The red light blinks, and I wonder if Gabriel is in his office watching us right now. Is it raining there, too? I wonder aloud. There is no answer, of course. Just the steady blinking of the red light. It feels good to talk to Gabriel through the camera, even though it's unlikely he's actually listening. He is probably way too busy with whatever mafia drama is going on this week. Between the cartel and the Irish, it seems like he has his hands full. I hope you're not too busy to have men out looking for Clara, I say, voicing my thoughts to the camera. Whatever has gone on between us, Clara doesn't deserve to be dragged into this. The light blinks. Harry reaches over and grabs my little finger. Mama, he says, pancake. He hands me an imaginary pancake, and I take it from him, pretending to chew enthusiastically. Thank you, Harry. It's delicious. When we lived in the mansion, Harry used to love watching the chef, Victoria, cook. He clearly doesn't understand that one doesn't make pancakes with a rolling pin, but it's cute. Harry giggles and rolls out some more pancakes. I look back up at the camera, and I swear I can feel our eyes connect through the lenses and wires and screens. Gabriel is out there somewhere. Maybe that's silly, but so is the fact that I'm still chewing on an imaginary pancake. I didn't know what the cartel was holding over you, I say. If I knew that writing that article would cost you your freedom, I would have never done it. How can you hate me for something I had no knowledge of? I swing my legs to the floor, keeping my eyes on the camera the whole time. If you'd... Mama... Harry cuts me off, pulling my pant leg. I look down, and he stabs the wooden spoon in my direction. 
try, he demands. You're just like your father, I mutter under my breath, taking the spoon from him. I pretend to sip whatever it is he's pretending to cook, and I smile wide. Tastes delicious, baby. Maybe a little more salt? I hand the spoon back, and Harry goes right back to stirring, his tongue stuck to the side of his mouth in concentration. My eyes meet Gabriel's through the camera again. At least, I think they do. I get up, walking toward it. If you'd confided in me like I asked you to, none of this would have happened. You could have told me about the cartel and what they were holding over you, and we could have done something about it together. Tears prick at my eyes, and I grit my teeth to keep my lips from pulling into a pathetic frown. It's the baby hormones, I reason. Just the baby hormones. But don't I have more than enough to cry about right now without the baby hormones? I'm locked in a tower for my own safety, because there are people out there who want to kill my son and me. The man I love hates my guts. My best friend is missing, possibly dead. The first tear spills down my cheek, and now it's raining inside as well. I sniff and glare at the camera, my hand coming to rest over my belly, and the barely perceptible bump instinctively. I need your help, Gabriel. Clara is in danger, and you are the only one who can help her right now. So please, help me. You owe me that much, at least. I set my jaw. Do you want to be the one to explain to Harry and our unborn baby what happened to mommy's best friend? You do remember that we're having a baby, right? Because I've heard nothing from you about it. Not a peep. It's like you don't want to acknowledge it for some reason. Like you're... A hiccup, biting back sobs. Like you're planning to deny the poor thing's existence. I break down at that, at the thought of our baby growing up without its father's love. Is he planning on leaving Harry behind, too? Are we all to be discarded like yesterday's trash because of that article? I feel a shift in the air and glance behind me. My sobs have drawn the attention of the guards, who now stand in the doorway, watching me. Heat climbs up my cheeks, and I turn away from the camera in embarrassment. I scoop Harry up into my arms and storm away to my bedroom, which is the only place besides the bathroom that I get to be alone in this joint. Dinner, Harry says sadly. I have just ruined his meal, which no doubt would have been a culinary experience fit for a king. But I need a cuddle with my baby. Harry seems to sense this and doesn't fuss too much as I settle down onto the bed, wrapping the comforter around my shoulders and bundling him against my chest with my laptop open in front of me. I know I should do some work, but I feel like rubbing a little salt in my wounds. So I open YouTube and find one of our family interviews instead. It's the first one we ever did together. Gabriel made it seem like we were going to enjoy a nice family lunch together. And then a camera crew showed up. I remember being so angry with him for ruining what had been, up until that point, such a pleasant afternoon. You can't tell in the interview, though. All the camera picks up is two people in love with each other and the baby they both adore. The perfect little family. Gabriel's handsome face grins at me from the screen. I miss the way his wavy black hair, which curled around the bottom of his chin, seemed to absorb the light from the room. I miss the dimple in his left cheek that only came out when he smiled. I miss the dark swirl of his irises and the barely noticeable crook in his otherwise long, straight nose. I miss the way it felt when he held me against his hard body, his arms like steel bands, protecting me from the world and all of its horrors. Dada, 
Harry coos, reaching his chubby fingers for the screen. Sometimes I forget how much Harry must miss his father, too. Seeing him reach for an image, one that's no more real than his pancakes, breaks my heart. I close the video and quickly put on some cartoons before Harry has a chance to complain. I grab my phone and start scrolling through my notifications while Harry watches the little cartoon fox dancing on the screen. I have more or less gone off the grid since Clara went missing a few days ago, ignoring every call unless there is a chance that Clara will be on the other end of it. So far, the only unknown numbers that have called have been telemarketers, disappointingly. Debbie called a couple times at the beginning of the week, and I see that she called again today. She also sent me a couple of texts demanding that I call her back. I consider waiting until tomorrow, but the feisty Scott will only grow exponentially more annoyed the longer it takes for me to return her call. I move Harry a little further onto the bed as Debbie's phone rings. Where the hell have you been? Comes her thick Glaswegian drawl. I worry about you when I don't hear from you. And you know how much it pisses me off having to worry about you. What a charming sentiment, Debbie. Don't get fresh with me, she chides. You're in trouble. You may only be freelance now, but I still expect you to pick up the phone when I call. I lean my head back against the cushioned headboard and sigh. I'm sorry, it's been a tough few days. Her voice lowers with concern. Are you okay, Hen? Debbie knows better than most what kind of dangers I face on a daily basis. Months ago, when I was just a hungry reporter looking to make my mark in the world, Debbie was the one who set me on Gabriel's trail. I didn't know it at the time, but the Irish mob, led by Andrew Walsh, was controlling her, threatening her daughter's life if she didn't do exactly as they said. I had no idea I was a pawn in Andrew Walsh's game until it was too late, but Debbie was painfully aware of how close we both were to ruin the entire time. I'm okay, I assure her. Someone tried to attack me the other day, though, so I'm housebound at the minute. I can tell even months later, she still feels guilty for her role in all this, even though I've told her a million times she doesn't have to. I don't regret any of it. Then again, she has a much lower opinion of Gabriel than I do. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, Debbie says under her breath. I swear, Alexis, that man will jump on any excuse to lock you up. He's got a serious dragon complex. I roll my eyes. That's not a thing. Aye, it is. And your man's got it, she insists. He likes to guard his riches keep them locked away from prying eyes and wandering hands. That's not what this is, I snap. You don't know a goddamn thing about Gabriel. Silence from the other end of the line. Even Harry stops giggling and looks over his shoulder at me, curious about the sudden outburst. My face heats with embarrassment, but rather than apologize to my boss, I hurriedly end the call and fall back against my pillows, releasing a low groan. Knowing Debbie, there's about a 50-50 chance she'll call back to yell at me. When a few minutes crawl by and she doesn't, I decide it's safe to get out of bed and go find myself a snack. I take Harry and return a few minutes later with a big bag of nacho cheese Doritos, a pack of gummy worms, some Funyuns, and a pack of fruit snacks for Harry. With that, we're set for a rainy afternoon in bed. Later that night, I listen to the pitter-patter of raindrops against the window and Harry's gentle breaths coming through the baby monitor. It feels like the whole world is asleep, except me. Even the traffic noises that would normally run continuously throughout the night are practically non-existent. I think about the slowly blinking red light of the living room camera and wonder if Gabriel is awake too. Probably. 
He seemed to barely sleep at the best of times. And now he has a murder charge hanging over his head on top of everything else. I think about Clara. I wonder if she is sleeping, wherever she is. I hope so. I don't know where she is, if someone took her, or if she just ran away. But my heart tells me she wouldn't just disappear without a word. Something has happened to her, and she could be staring into the dark right now, listening to the rain, wondering if she will ever make it home alive. I blink away tears and sit up in bed, reaching for my laptop. Despite snapping at Debbie today and ignoring her calls in the days prior, my work is still very important to me. I let myself sink into it now, going through my notes and research from the various stories I have been following to find threads that I can tug on. I work late into the night until my eyes are heavy and the words blur together on the screen. When I finally give in to the pull of sleep, I imagine that I can feel Gabriel's weight on the bed next to me. I imagine I can feel his heat radiating between us. Maybe if I reach out, I could touch him. Outside, it is still raining. Gabriel. Watching Alexis on the camera has become a guilty pleasure of mine, verging on addiction. With less work to do on a daily basis, I have more time to fill, and Alexis is just begging to be watched. She has started speaking to the cameras on a regular basis, like her life confined to the apartment is a reality show with an audience of one. But she's not really speaking to the cameras. She's speaking to me. She tells me about her days or shows me new things that Harry has learned. Sometimes she chastises me for refusing to speak to her, for leaving her alone despite having, in her mind, committed no crime. Other times, she seems almost apologetic. Today she is laying on her back on the couch, running a hand over her belly while ruminating on baby names. If you don't provide any input, I'm going to name it something weird, she says, glancing down the lens of the camera. You know, like when celebrities name their kids after objects? I'm going to name our baby Lanyard. It's great because it works for a boy or a girl. I wrinkle my nose. I presume you'd want to choose an Italian name, she says. I don't mind. I figure after I named our first child after my dead father, who turned out to be a psychopathic sadist, you get to name this one. Her brown hair lies like a silken curtain over the arm of the couch, and she is wearing a simple tank top and cotton lounge shorts. Even dressed simply, she looks like a wet dream, one long leg folded over the other. What's going to happen after I give birth? She asks, reaching down to stroke Harry's head. He is sitting on the floor, rolling the truck back and forth over the brown rug, completely unaware that his mother is talking to his absent father. Will I come back to live in the mansion with you, or could we finally go live in that house you bought for us? She smiles, looking down at Harry. I have so many ideas for how I would decorate. I've been thinking that we could do the nursery in a cheery yellow so that it always feels like the sun is shining through the window. I can't help but wonder if this is all an act, if Alexis is doing everything she can to reel me back in. Or maybe she's sorry. Maybe she is trying to make amends for everything she did by painting a beautiful picture of the life we could have together as a family if only I could forgive her. But I can't. Not when I'm still so angry. Not when I can't trust that this isn't yet another one of her deceptions. I force myself to close the feed. I could spend hours watching her. But what would that accomplish? I go to the gym instead, pushing myself harder and harder until the only thoughts that circle my mind are those of thirst and pain. Silvano calls just as I sit down to do some work. What, I answer. Even after a punishing workout, a shower, and some lunch, I am still on edge. Alexis made it all sound so easy. I could just forgive her, and then 
We could raise our children together in domestic bliss. We could paint the nursery sunshine yellow and get a dog and make pancakes with banana smiles and blueberry eyes on lazy Sunday mornings. But I can't have that. Not with Alexis. Not with anyone. Silvano clears his throat. <clears throat> our contacts in the police have found Clara's phone. It's in a house in Tremont. Send me the address. There's no guarantee she will be there, Silvano says carefully. This could be a trap. It's definitely a trap, I snap. But if there is a chance that we can rescue Clara, we need to take it. Only the most foolish kidnapper would keep their captive's phone so it could be tracked. It annoys me that Silvano thinks I don't know this. I would suggest that we leave this one to the police, Silvano urges. I understand his hesitance. Why would we put ourselves on the line to go save a girl who doesn't belong to our organization? But this is Alexis's best friend. She begged me to find Clara, and considering all that Clara has been through because of Alexis's connection to me, it feels like my responsibility. If the police were going to do anything about it, they would have done it already, I reply. Do you think we are the only ones who can afford to buy help on the inside? I still... I slam my fist on the desk. Damn it, Silvano. We're going after her. Get a team together and meet me in front of the mansion in 30 minutes. Yes, sir. I end the call. If nothing else, maybe this rescue mission will help me blow off a little steam. I obviously need it. The house is a nondescript rancher, with one boarded-up window and a rusty bicycle sitting in the middle of the front yard. The front porch light is on, as if welcoming us inside. It's quiet. I don't like it. My men split up, with Gio and Mirko going around the back, and the rest going through the front with me. We approach the door, guns drawn, and Dom kicks it in. We rush through the entrance into the darkness. It smells putrid inside, like cats and feces and something dead. I reach for the light switch, but it doesn't turn on. Dom aims a flashlight at the ceiling. The bulb has been removed. Here, Mirko calls from further in the house. I leave Dom and the others to clear the rest of the front while I follow Mirko's voice. I find him in a small, boxy room off what looks to be the kitchen. That's where I find Clara, too. The small blonde is tied to a chair, her head hanging forward, her arms pulled tightly behind her so that it looks like her shoulders are seconds from popping out of their sockets. Mirko is bent behind her, working on the restraints. It's only when I enter the room that Clara seems to notice she is no longer alone. She lifts her head looking up at me with bleary eyes, rimmed with red and purple. Gabriel, she says, a scratchy voice, thick with surprise. I'm a little surprised, too, if I'm being honest. Comes a husky female voice from behind me. I would recognize that voice anywhere. I spin on my heel and aim my gun but Felicity Huffman and her two men already have guns trained on Mirko and me. Fuck. My father's former concubine looks just like I remember her. An elegant woman in her forties with blonde hair cropped into a prim pixie cut and blue eyes sparkling under the golden bangs at the front. She has high, elegant cheekbones and a pert mouth that always lends her to the appearance of someone who knows a secret that she cannot wait to share. I always wondered what happened to her after my father's death. She disappeared in the middle of the night, presumably never to be seen again. If only it were that simple. Felicity, I growl. What the fuck are you doing here? I thought it was time for a chat, she coos, leaning one hip against the door frame. I hear you've been demanding to have an audience with me all over town. I frown. I didn't even know you were alive. Oh, come now, Gabriel. She rolls her eyes, chuckling. <laughs> Don't be so dense. 
the pieces click together in my mind. But no, it can't be. I grit my teeth. You're leading the cartel? Felicity laughs, an airy sound that seems so out of place in this den of horrors. <laughs> Don't look so surprised, darling. You knew I was ambitious. She cocks the gun. I did have my sights on the Italian mafia, but some little shit got in my way and took it for himself. My lip curls in disgust. So who did you have to kill to get this job? I barely had to kill anyone, she says with a weak shrug. Felipe Montoya was already an old man when I met him. His sons were the only ones who I knew would contest me when I took over after his death, so I set them against each other, and they took care of that problem themselves. She sighs. Anyway, I do apologize, my darling, but it absolutely stinks in here, and I have tickets to the theater tonight, so if you wouldn't mind getting on your knees, I'd like to get this over with. I look over her shoulder. Where are the rest of my men? Felicity tracks my gaze. Oh, I wouldn't expect your men to burst through and save you, she says. Kevin Lynch and his men have them shored up on the other side of the house. They're just awaiting my word. She grins. Kevin is such a little darling, isn't he? I found mob bosses to be terribly malleable. It's the ego, I think, she sighs. Anyway, it has been lovely to catch up, but I'm afraid I must insist. She steps closer, expression souring. Get on your fucking knees. My jaw tightens, and I begin to slowly lower, mind whirring as I try to think my way out of this. Before my knees touch the ground, Clara screams and bursts out of a chair with more speed than I would have given her credit for. She rugby tackles Felicity to the ground, giving Mirko and me the opening we need to take out her backup. The small house fills with the sound of gunshots as Dom and his men start attacking the forces at the other side of the house. Only a moment after we have dispatched Felicity's two thugs, more appear. I barely have time to wrench Clara away from where she is wrestling with Felicity on the ground and dot out the back door. Fall back! I hear Mirko call from inside. We got her. I load Clara into the back of my SUV and wait outside, gun drawn, in case I need to cover the retreat. Men start to flood out of the house. Dom is propping up one of his men, who has received a bullet wound to the thigh, but otherwise they all seem more or less unhurt. We pile into our vehicles and hit the road, tires squealing against the pavement. I look to the back seat as Mirko navigates the narrow streets. Clara is wedged between Gio and Peter, and she looks impossibly small. Are you hurt? I ask. Clara glares at me through narrowed green eyes. I'm fine, she mutters. You could at least pretend to be a little more grateful for the rescue, I reply irritably. You could be a little more grateful for me saving your ass back there, she snips. For the record, I wouldn't have needed rescuing if you hadn't pulled Alexis into this whole nightmare. She and the people she cares about are in danger every day because of you, and yet you've spent the last month moping around and refusing to talk to her because your feelings are hurt. My lips flatten. Next to me, Mirko's mouth pricks up in a smile. I would watch how you speak to me, I warn in a cold voice, though, to be honest, I'm a little impressed at her feistiness. It makes sense that Alexis would choose someone like her as a best friend. Clara huffs a sigh and leans back into the seat. Whatever. Where are we going? Alexis's apartment building, I tell her. It's the safest place for you to be right now, and she will want to see that you're safe with her own eyes. A doctor will meet you there to check you out. You're not coming? She asks, cocking a brow. No. I untwist and face the front, 
indicating that the conversation is over. Not that Clara takes the hint. You should take me up yourself, Clara says. You'll get loads of brownie points, and it could be a good way for you guys to start repairing the damage in your relationship. I won't be joining you. Why do you have to be so stubborn? Clara complains. Just come in and see Alexis. See your son. I badly want to. I can picture Alexis's face shining with relief, the gratitude that would send her crashing into my arms. She is going to be so happy to see that her best friend is safe. Clara is right. That moment could be the catalyst for us to reconcile. But I can't. Especially now that Clara has all but ordered me into the apartment. I can't be seen being ordered around by anyone, never mind to recover an addict from outside the family. Clara, if you know what's good for you, you will shut the fuck up. I growl in a way that makes it clear the matter is not up for discussion. Blessedly, Clara doesn't say another word. Alexis I have just finished putting Harry down for a nap, and am about to grab a snack and head off for a nap myself, when the two guards standing in my living room stiffen, listening intently to their earpieces. I pause in front of Angelo, pleased that I demanded he be reassigned to my personal guard. I stare him down as he finishes listening to whatever orders are being piped into his ear. He waves me off like an annoying fly, mouth bent into a smile. But I simply wave back at him. What is it? I ask. Shh, he hisses. Don't shh me. Angelo narrows his eyes and keeps listening, then nods to the other guard, who goes to stand by the front door. What is it? I repeat anxiously. Calm down, he says. You have a visitor. My heart suddenly slams into the back of my ribs. A visitor? It must be Gabriel. Debbie wouldn't drop by unannounced, and there's certainly nobody else who would visit me out of the blue. I tried calling Clara a couple of times this morning and still haven't been able to reach her, so I know she's still MIA. I race over to the hall mirror and check myself over. I'm so glad I decided to shower this morning. Being locked inside with nothing to do and only my guards for company has made the idea of marinating in my own filth more tempting with every day. I give my hair a quick flip, and when I turn around, Angelo's lips are pressed together in a barely suppressed smile. Stop it, I snap. I've only had your ugly mug to look at for over a week now. Excuse me for getting excited. Angelo's mug is far from ugly, and he knows it. He gasps and flings a hand over his heart in mock distress. I stick my tongue out at him. The front door flings open, and my best friend staggers through, supported by one of the guards in the hall. I take in her haggard appearance, the split lip caked with dried blood, the stringy mats of curls on her head, and the sight of it all is enough to make me want to cry. But then Clara grins. Are you going to come give me a hug or not? I race over and wrap my arms around her frail form, shaking with relief. She smells awful, and she feels skinnier than ever. But she's here. She's alive. The guard holding her backs away, and I guide her to the sofa. Where the hell have you been? I ask. My yoga retreat. Clara deadpans. I'm serious. Angelo appears in front of us with a big glass of water and hands it to Clara. She looks up, smiling appreciatively. Only I think there's a little something more than appreciation in her smile. Hey, I snap in front of her face, drawing her attention back to me. We need to get you to a doctor. You look awful. Clara shrugs and takes a sip of water. Gabriel said he's sending one over. Gabriel? I frown. Yeah, he rescued me. 
she replies. Some crazy bitch named Felicity had me locked up in a crack den. She said she was the leader of the cartel, but she didn't look Colombian. Felicity, after so much mystery, I finally know the name of the person running the cartel. I wish I hadn't found out this way, though. I wish Clara wasn't involved in this at all. Angelo comes back into view and passes a sandwich to Clara on a small plate. She groans and stuffs it into her face, closing her eyes with bliss as she chews. When they remembered to feed me, it was almost always canned beans, she complains. I don't think I'll ever be able to look at the stuff again. Clara takes another big bite of the sandwich, and I pull the plate out of her hands. Just take it slow, okay? I urge as her eyes widen with panic. You'll throw it all back up if you don't. She nods, and I hand the plate back. She only takes nibbles from that point on. Did you send me this text? I pull out my phone and show Clara the last message I got from her phone. She shakes her head. No, but I remember Felicity showing it to me. Felicity, I swear I recognize that name from somewhere. But where? She taunted me with it, Clara continues. She said that once you knew the truth, it was going to destroy you. She shrugs and takes another sip of water. I'm almost certain the woman was cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, so I doubt it actually means anything. I'm sure Felicity is many things, but I don't think crazy is one of them. She's smart, calculating. She had Gabriel Bellucci, the most powerful man I know, under her thumb for months. And now the city is flooded with purple heroin because of her. Whoever this Felicity is, she is a force to be reckoned with. I'm just glad you're safe, I say, folding Clara into another hug. She takes a bite of the sandwich over my shoulder. I wonder what truth Felicity thinks she can use to destroy me. And why me? Why not Gabriel? I'm so sorry I got you involved in all this. My voice hitches, and hot tears gather in my eyes. This is all my fault. No, it's not. Clara pushes me back, skewering me with her emerald gaze. This is Gabriel's fault. He is the one at war with the cartel. He is the reason you're in danger. The reason I'm in danger. She glances over her shoulder at Angelo and lowers her voice so he won't overhear. This is all too dangerous, Alexis. Do you really want to bring the little bean in your belly into this world? Do you want Harry to grow up with a security detail around him at all times, in case someone tries to shoot him? I wipe away a tear, and Clara's mouth crumples as she starts to cry too. Babe, I'm always going to be here for you. Clara reaches forward, brushing away a tear as it rolls down my cheek. It feels odd to be comforted by someone who has clearly just undergone days of torture. But you need to think about ending things with Gabriel before it's too late. I swallow and sniff. How are you so calm right now? I ask, trying to change the subject. Clara finishes off the sandwich, chewing thoughtfully. I've been to hell and back a few times, she replies. There's not much that woman could do to me that I haven't already done to myself. I can tell she's not as unscathed as she would have me believe, but I suspect it's going to be some time before she lets all that pain in. I only hope she doesn't turn to drugs again when she does. Angelo steps forward. The doctor is here, he says. We are going to take Clara next door to get checked out. Then she will need to get some rest. I have long suspected that the apartments on both sides and across the hall are owned by Gabriel and occupied by his staff. Now I have confirmation. I'll come, I say, hoisting myself up from the couch. Angelo shakes his head. 
No, you have to stay here. Then she stays too. I frown and fold my arms, glaring at him. He shakes his head and smiles apologetically. Sorry, boss's orders. If he wants to separate us, he needs to explain why himself, I demand. I'm so goddamn tired of him passing down bullshit orders without having the balls to actually speak to me. Clara nods approvingly, mirroring my stance and glare. I don't think he will go for that, Angela replies. Can you at least try? He sighs, running a hand through his thick brown hair. <sighs> yeah, okay. But only if this one comes with me willingly. I've heard she can put up quite a fight. Clara grins wickedly. Angelo guides Clara out of the apartment, and ten minutes later, he returns, holding a cell phone, a pinched expression on his face. Obviously, Gabriel isn't happy about me demanding to speak to him, which carves a toothed edge into my gratitude. Angelo passes me the phone. Thank you, I say, and bring the phone to my ear. My heart is racing. I haven't talked to Gabriel in nearly two months. Sure, I've spoken to him through the cameras, but I can never be sure that he's actually listening. My stomach does a flip and my mouth dries. I open my mouth, but no words come out. I have no idea what to say. It's not like you to be quiet, comes his smooth, low voice. The sound of it sends a pleasurable shiver down my spine. It's honey and gravel, sugar and smoke. I recover quickly and clear my throat. Believe me, I'm just gearing up. Let's hear it then. I don't have all day. I glance at Angelo. He gives me an encouraging thumbs up, and I stand a little straighter. I think about all the things Gabriel has done to piss me off since kicking me out of the mansion, including what is either his inability or refusal to acknowledge the baby growing in my belly. I channel that fire now, even though my legs feel shaky. Your goons have just taken Clara off to another apartment, I say. Apparently, I'm not allowed to go with her, and she's not allowed to stay here. She needs to rest, Gabriel says. She can rest here. We have no idea what happened to Clara while she was held captive. Gabriel presses. For all we know, the cartel have turned her and ordered her to kill you in the middle of the night. My jaw drops. Are you kidding? You think that my own best friend would ever hurt me? She's an addict, he replies. She's unpredictable. The last thing I needed is an unknown variable thrown into the mix while I'm struggling to keep the war off your doorstep. I can't believe you. I hope he is looking through the cameras so he can see how furious I am right now. Your enemy kidnapped Clara and held her prisoner for days on end just to get a rise out of you. Now you're separating her from the one person in this whole building who actually gives a shit about her. Why don't you throw in a little waterboarding while you're at it? Alexis, don't, I grit my teeth, nostrils flaring. Please. Just let her stay with Harry and me. It will mean a lot to our son to have another familiar face around. I swipe my tongue over my lip. He misses you, you know. Gabriel goes quiet, though I can hear the rattle of his breath against the receiver. I have hit a nerve. Good. Fine, he says finally. She can stay with you. Thank you. The line clicks, and just like that, the conversation is over. I don't know when or if I'll get to speak to Gabriel again, but at least I've learned one thing from the conversation. He doesn't hate me. If he truly hated me, he wouldn't have given in. He wouldn't have talked to me in the first place.
I hand the phone back to Angelo, feeling a little lighter than I did before. Gabriel doesn't hate me. And if Gabriel doesn't hate me, we might actually be able to mend the fissure keeping us apart. I would like to think that it is the excitement of the day preventing me from falling asleep. Clara's back and sleeping soundly in the next room over. The doctor says she's malnourished and dehydrated, but otherwise in okay health. A few days of rest and recovery, and she should be good as new. Between getting her back, the call with Gabriel, and reuniting Harry and Clara, today has been a whirlwind. But that's not why I'm lying awake, staring up at the dark ceiling. Gabriel's voice keeps playing in my mind. I hadn't heard it for so long. I think I forgot what it sounded like, how when he speaks, each word feels like a gentle caress over my skin. Gabriel's voice came back into my life for a moment, and now it is gone again, and I feel a hollow loneliness instead. I think of all the things he has said to me in that voice, the sweet things, the angry things, and best of all, the filthy things. Gabriel is always in control, and sex is no different. He gives commands, then rewards you for following them, or punishes you for not following them. Sometimes that's even better. I feel a pang of heat deep in my belly, and my fingers glide over the front of my panties, idly stroking my folds through the cotton. I build the scenario in my head. There is no camera in my bedroom, but for the sake of my fantasy, I pretend there is, and that I'm putting on a show. I picture Gabriel sitting in his office, bent over his computer screen as he watches my fingers dip below the fabric of my underwear, gliding over my wet slit. Of course, he wouldn't be able to resist touching himself, too, once he saw my arched back, lips parted, hands strumming at my clit. I like to think he would have come over right away, that he couldn't stand the sight of me pleasuring myself without his permission. He would break through the door just as I was about to crest that most glorious wave and deny me the satisfaction. I let myself drift into the fantasy. I writhe in the sheets, my face flushed with heat. I am so close, so close. The door slams inward, and before I know what is happening, a shape covers me in the dark, ripping my hands away from my body and pressing them up and over my head. The figure is shadowed in darkness, but I smell sandalwood and male musk. Gabriel. He leans over, his body pressing me hard into the mattress. His lips caress the shell of my ear as he hisses. Did you think I was just going to let you get away with it? With what? I buck up against him and find him hard at the apex of my legs. Teasing me. He sucks my earlobe into his mouth and nibbles it, tempting me, making me want you when I know that I can't have you. Can't you? Gabriel sucks in a breath and grinds against me. You're right, he murmurs. I can have you anytime I want. You're still mine. My fingers rub over my sensitive nub, sending pulses of delicious heat through me. I start to move faster. My scalp tingles. Gabriel keeps a hold of my wrists in one large hand while he unzips with the other. I feel his weight against my thigh, and his lips come to my neck. Tell me that you want it, he says. I keep my lips pressed tight, even as a moan threatens to rip through me. His hands tighten on my wrists, and he rubs his hard length against the front of my panties. I suppress another moan, teeth gritted tightly. Tell me, he orders. His deep voice cuts through me like a knife. 
There is a measure of desperation in it. And I know he needs me right now every bit as much as I need him. I can't hold back any longer. I want it, please. Gabriel emits a deep growl and rips my panties right off me, tossing the torn fabric to the ground. He wedges himself between my thighs, and I feel his thick head at my entrance, pressing into me. Heat washes over me. I rub furiously, tension pooling deep in my belly. Gabriel drives in. His hips crash into mine, and I let out a moan of pure bliss as he fills me, stretches me, owns me completely. That's right, he groans, pulling out and then slamming home again. I'm the one who gets to make you come. You're mine, tiger, all mine. My hand grips the sheets as I climb to the peak of pleasure, eyes screwed shut. It's good, so good. I imagine him above me, his dark hair falling over the deep pools of his eyes as he fucks me senseless. I break right down the middle, pleasure ripping through me. White flashes behind my eyes. I go perfectly still, not even breathing, as everything in my world blurs at the edges and then comes slowly into focus. The room is deadly silent until the sounds of my hoarse breaths fill it again. The loneliness continues to lap at my ankles like soft, hissing waves. I wonder how long until the tide comes in. Gabriel. Never in my life have I wished more that Vito was still alive. I am sitting in my office with his brother, discussing adjustments to our strategy now that we know the face of our enemy. But Silvano only ever met Felicity Huffman briefly. He doesn't know her like Vito did. Vito and I used to spend hours discussing the various manipulations she used on my father and all the ways she might become dangerous for us. I vowed that I would always stay one step ahead of her. If something happened to my father and she came for me next, I would make sure that I didn't fall into her web. Only, now I have. She has been pulling my strings for months, and I feel like an absolute idiot. I had no idea. Silvano studies the photo on the desk. Felicity and my father are grinning at the camera. He looks handsome in an ink-black tux. She looks stunning in a floor-length purple gown. The photo is around five or six years old, but Felicity has barely aged. This is a good thing, Gabriel, Silvano says, sliding the photo back to me. We know who we're dealing with now. I know. I toss the photo into a drawer, skin prickling. Silvano's mouth tugs down at the corners. Your lips are saying one thing. I don't know why Felicity's reveal has rattled me so much. There is something incredibly disturbing about having my father's former lover come back into my life years after she nearly brought my father's empire to ruin. Because of Felicity, I have spent my life fearing manipulation by any woman. Now Jezebel herself has waltzed back onto the scene, and I suspect that any move I make to counter her will only send me further into her clutches. She has always been three steps ahead. I know, Silvano. I take a breath. I want you to set up street surveillance. If anyone so much as whispers her name, I want to know about it. Felicity Huffman has had years to prepare for this, and we're only in the know now because she wants us to be. So I need all the information I can. Silvano nods. I'll make it happen. Good. You can go. He pauses. Do you have everything you need for tonight? What do I need for a boring fundraiser other than a tux and a modicum of patience? I inquire. Silvano nods and leaves, and I lean back in my chair and try to relax my jaw. I should have known better. I should have known that a woman like Felicity Huffman wouldn't give up so easily.
and that just because she disappeared after my father's death didn't mean she didn't plan on resurfacing again. My chest feels tight, my head aches, I want to scream at the top of my lungs, but it wouldn't do any good. I need to keep myself together, now more than ever, even though it feels like everything in my life is slipping through my fingers. I open the screen on my laptop and pull up the security footage from Alexis's apartment. Just laying eyes on her starts to calm me down. Alexis is emptying the dishwasher in the kitchen. She was offered a full staff to take care of domestic work, but she refused. She wanted to cook and clean and make the apartment a home for her and Harry. I always wonder if she is showing me the way life could be for us together, the kind of domestic bliss we could achieve away from my mansion. You always seem like you're up to something, I mutter, watching as she sets a stack of plates in the cupboard. Even when you're unloading the dishwasher, I assume you're doing it with some sort of agenda. I have never spoken to her like this before. She has, of course, made a habit recently of addressing me through the lens of the camera, but I've never spoken back. At first, I feel too exposed, like my words will somehow carry backwards through the wires and, and the broadcasting in the kitchen. Alexis carries on, finishing the dishwasher and then filling the small side sink with hot water and disinfectant. She starts wiping all the counters, carefully moving the appliances to get behind them. The feeling of discomfort eases into one of relief. It feels good to say the words aloud, especially since nobody can hear me. Not Alexis, not my men, not Felicity Huffman. I watch her pick her way through the kitchen, and the words I've been longing to say form on my tongue. I'm so angry with you, Alexis. I'm angry with you for betraying me, but I'm even angrier with you for showing me a version of life that I could have had and then ripping that away from me. I take a breath. On screen, Alexis starts to wipe down the cabinet doors. You made yourself utterly indispensable to me and then put me in a situation where I was forced to do just that. I don't need you any less than I did a month ago or a month before that. I need you now more than ever. But because of what you did... I can't go to you like I want to. I miss you. I miss you every fucking day, no matter how hard I try to hate you or how much distance I put between us. I wanted us to be a family so badly. It seemed like you wanted it too, but was that ever real? Did you really care for me like you seemed to, or were you just playing the game? It hurt so much to know that I was played a fool, but if I could go back in time... I can't see myself doing anything differently. That's the effect you have on me, Alexis. I would walk headfirst into my betrayal, time and time again, if it meant I got back those fleeting, perfect days. I take a breath, feeling not too dissimilar to a deflated balloon. Heat glides up my face, and I slam the lid of my laptop closed. I can't believe the things I just said, the weakness I just admitted. Part of me feels relieved, but for the most part, I just feel sickened by my own pathetic admission. I check my watch. It's time for me to start getting ready. For once, I am not entirely dreading attending one of these soul-sucking society events. In fact, I find myself looking forward to having a drink. I hurry up the steps ignoring the cries of the paparazzi sequestered on the other side of the velvet ropes as they try to draw a reaction out of me. Alone again, Gabriel? You're absolutely murdering the red carpet, Gabe. Mr. Bellucci, give us a smile. I breeze right past them and wish Alexis was with me. The last time I took her to a charity function, she nearly got in a fist fight, and it was the highlight of my social year. She also made it a lot easier for me to interact with the various vultures and hyenas one encounters at these types of engagements. She acted as a buffer, calming me down when my temper rose, making me laugh when I needed to relax. Most importantly, however, she warded off the banshees. Gabriel! Grace Van Kemp squawks as I enter the banquet hall. It's been far too long! Grace is what I can only describe as an extravagant widow. 
She married one of the richest men in Manhattan 30 years ago, at the ripe age of 18. He was 60. He died around 10 years back and has been dead as long as I've known her, and she clearly prefers it that way. She leans over and pecks me on each cheek. I force a smile. Lovely to see you, Grace. The older woman whips a fan out and starts to wave it weakly at her face. She's beautiful, with long, raven hair and big, innocent brown eyes. I imagine she would have been stunning in her youth. It is a shame that she spent most of that locked away in her elderly husband's penthouse. I've heard all about you in the news, she says, grabbing my elbow and leading me toward the bar. Absolutely shocking, darling, to think that they would accuse you of something so vile. The nerve of it, patricide. She squeaks in distress, as though the very thought might send her tumbling into a faint. They won't be able to make it stick. What would be the point of being fabulously wealthy and well-connected if they could? She orders two champagnes, though she sniffs at the vintage. You would think they would trot out the good stuff for their generous benefactors. I tip my head back and down the drink. The bubbles sizzle all the way down my throat, climbing up my nose and making me want to sneeze. Grace smiles approvingly. That's a good boy. She signals for the bartender to pour another. It has been a long few weeks, I say by way of explanation, as Grace slides the second glass over to me. I wouldn't dream of judging you, darling. I think you should get fabulously drunk and enjoy yourself tonight. I doubt any amount of alcohol will lend enjoyment to the evening, but the idea of getting fabulously drunk does appeal. The vast ballroom is decorated in shades of dusty pink and gold, which makes it look more like a children's birthday party than a charity gala. Pink silk billows from the ceiling and a few dozen circular tables shine with gold accents. At the far end of the room, a stage is set up with a projector screen behind, where, after dinner, the guests will pretend to pay attention to the boring presentation while secretly eyeing each other up for scandal. Grace guides me over to a quiet corner of the room, sending furtive glances in either direction. I heard that you and your lovely girlfriend are living separately at the moment. Grace says. I tense at the mention of Alexis. Perhaps you might be looking to indulge your appetite a little in the meantime. She continues. Which of these new bile society delights has caught your eye? I shake my head and take a sip of champagne. <laughs> None of them. Is that so? Grace cocks an eyebrow, then glances down at her glass almost shyly. If it's not the spring chickens you desire, perhaps you would be inclined to sample the fine old hen. I suppress the urge to snap at Grace. She doesn't realize how much of a nerve she is hit with her comments, and I doubt she meant any offense. Grace, I say, placing a hand on her arm. I won't be taking home any of these lovely ladies this evening, but you know, of course, that if I were going to... You would be my first choice. She giggles and fans at her cheeks as they flush. <laughs> A shame, really. Indeed, I smile. Please, would you excuse me? I need to make the rounds. More like I need to make my way back around to the bar. Of course. I take my leave and wander back to the bar grabbing a glass of whiskey this time and then taking a slow lap of the room. I chat with the people I know and recognize from other events, making small talk about the weather and stocks and the dreaded current state of things. We only speak of the latter point in veiled terms. Nobody uses the word gangs or mentions purple heroin. They are all too polite for that. But even for people used to ignoring the city's common afflictions. There is definitely a level of uneasiness. Grace is not the last woman I end up rejecting, but she is the most polite. The gossip has circulated, and everyone here knows that Alexis and I are living separately, 
And what's more, they don't seem to believe that we are still in love like I told the interviewer. In their eyes, I am a newly single man, ripe for the picking. Extricating myself from the amorous intentions of several of the night's denizens is tedious and exhausting, and I find myself missing Alexis more and more as the night goes on. If Alexis was here, I wouldn't be bored. I might even be having fun. She would have something amusing to say about every character we met. Silvano enters the party after the speeches, his gray eyes slicing through the crowd to land on me at a table in the back corner of the room. At first, my drink-addled eyes mistake him for his dead brother, and my heart picks up, but he comes more into focus as he cuts across the room. He arrives at my table and shoves his hands into the pockets of his gray slacks, eyeing the empty glass in front of me. What are you doing here? I ask. Silvano tips forward on his heels. I thought you might need a rescue. I swipe my tongue over my lips, tasting the last remnants of my drink, honeyed and bitter. Silvano smiles pleasantly and glances around taking in the drunken frivolity around him. Laughter echoes through the room. Why did you think that? I ask. Vito said you hate these things, he replies. From the dark cloud hanging over this table, I can see he was right. I glance up as though I might actually see the cloud. I would thank it if I could. That must be why people have been leaving me more or less alone for the past hour or so. What's on your mind? Silvano asks. I trace a finger around the rim of the empty glass, staring at it as though I might be able to fill it with my mind. Nothing that should be. Silvano slides into the seat next to me and unbuttons his suit jacket. And what does that mean? I can't stop thinking about Alexis, I say, with a defeated sigh. I have so many other things to worry about, and yet I can't get the damn woman out of my head. Of course you can't, Silvano says simply. You love her. My eyes snap to his. I never said I loved her. You didn't have to. Mind what you say to me, Silvano, I growl. His eyes light humorlessly. Methinks he doth protest too much. Before I can snarl anything else at him, Silvano leans forward and claps a hand on my back. Come on, let's get you home. I narrow my eyes at him. We will go when I say we can go. I slide my glass toward him. Go get me another whiskey. Silvano heads off in the direction of the bar and I let out a sigh. What he said troubles me. Did Vito tell him that as well? About me loving Alexis? Or is it that obvious? Does everyone know? Does Alexis know? I scrub a hand over my face and try to push it from my mind. Silvano returns with my whiskey and I grab it from him and start to walk toward the door. Come on, I say. Time to go. I think of the empty mansion waiting for me and the prospect of going home seems only slightly better than staying here with all these snakes. If Alexis were waiting for me, that would be a different story. Fuck, I miss her. I just want to hear her voice. I want to yell at her. I want to kiss her. David is waiting out front with the town car when we arrive. Silvano opens the door for me, and as I slide in, I meet his gaze. Take a cab. His expression flickers, but he gives a short nod. I want to be alone, or as alone as I can be. David has been my driver for a long time and can sense when I don't want to speak, so he greets me and then locks his eyes on the road and starts to drive. I pull my phone from my pocket and turn it over in my hand. I know what I want to do. I also know it is not what I should do. But the whiskey is running like fire through my veins and it urges me on. I unlock my phone, and with gritted teeth, I call Alexis. Alexis. I am lying in bed, 
waiting to feel even the slightest bit sleepy when my phone starts to ring on the bedside table. It's not terribly late, though I would still consider it an unusual time for a social call. I bolt up, immediately fearing the worst. Something has happened. Clara is hurt, Debbie is dead. I snatch the phone off the table and check the screen. My heart leaps into my throat as I read Gabriel's name. Why would Gabriel call me now? After all the times I have begged to speak with him and he has refused. What could he want from me at this hour? It can't be good, I decide. I answer the call, hand shaking. Hello? I ask uncertainly. Hi. It's Gabriel, all right. That one syllable is more powerful than any syllable ought to be. My belly flutters, and I jump out of bed, still a little jumpy from the bolt of adrenaline soaking through my system. Can I help you? I ask, gluing the phone to my shoulder while tugging on a pair of jeans from the floor. Some loose change spills out of the back pocket and onto the carpet. I don't know, Gabriel replies. Can you? Gabriel is not a man who uses the word dunno. His voice is thick, his tone a little petulant. He's drunk, I realize. Jean's on, I head for the nursery. You're the one who called me, I point out. I want to believe him calling me is a good sign, but more likely than not, he's called because he's drunk and angry and wants to spit abuse at someone. Who better to release some frustrations on than the ultimate persona non grata? Why did you do it, Alexis? He says with a light groan. I wanted to trust you, and then you went and fucked me over. I tiptoe into the nursery, but find Harry awake and upright, hanging on to the edge of his crib. If I didn't know any better, I would say it looks like he's trying to escape. Mama, he greets happily. I didn't know what the cartel had on you. How was I supposed to? To Harry, I whisper, hey, baby, do you want to come out for a bit? Mommy can't sleep either. Mommy might never sleep again, considering how electric my blood feels right now. That doesn't matter. Gabriel snaps. Cartel or not, you shouldn't have done it. You betrayed me. I lift Harry into my arms and take him back to my bedroom with me. I want this conversation to be private, and the security waiting in the living room won't allow for that. I didn't betray you, I reply haughtily. I did the right thing. People were dying. They're still dying but at least I was able to get the story out so the public knows what's going on. I didn't know that the cartel were forcing you to help them. You never told me that. All I knew was that you were at the center of a drug epidemic that was ruining people's lives. I was so disappointed with you. I grab one of Harry's stuffed animals from my bed and sink to the floor. I pass Harry the toy, and he starts to play with it while I settle down, cross-legged. We have a child together, Gabriel, I sigh. And we've got another one on the way. This can't go on forever. The line goes silent, and I find I am holding my breath. Is it crazy to think that Gabriel might give in? that he might confess how difficult this has been and agree that we are better together than we are apart? This will go on as long as I desire, Gabriel replies in a quiet voice. I frown and release my breath. Of course he's going to continue being stubborn. That's his shtick. Harry staggers to his feet and waddles across the room. He has become a keen explorer over the past few weeks, having grown more confident on his feet. Careful, I call out after him. Not that he will listen. Are you with Harry? 
Gabriel asks. Yeah, he was awake when I went to check on him. I thought he might like to come out and stretch his legs. Has he been walking much? There is genuine interest in Gabriel's voice. It's good to hear he still cares about his son. If only he'd show it. When he's not running, I say, chuckling. I swear the kid's training for a marathon. Either that, or Harry's practicing his Bellucci birthright, running away from his problems. I don't say that. I somehow don't think Gabriel would find it funny. Gabriel's voice is softer when he speaks next. Is he happy? Harry reaches the wall and starts meandering back in my direction. He is grinning. He always is. But is he happy? That's a good question. I don't think he understands what he's missing, I reply. He's happy, but I think he could be happier. I squeeze Harry's hand as he wanders past me. He barely seems to notice, too focused on his explorations. Can we see you? I ask. I want to see you. I squeeze my eyes shut, wishing that he will give in. I am tired of this. I hate the waiting, the wondering. I just want to be a family again. No, Gabriel replies. That's not possible. Of course it's possible, I reply irritably. You're the one with the power to make it possible. You don't know how much damage you caused, Alexis. No, you don't know. I glance behind me, checking on Harry, just in time to watch him pick up a penny from the loose change on the carpet and pop it into his mouth. He looks at me and swallows. Harry, no! I yell, dropping the phone and catapulting across the room. Oh God, oh God, what if he chokes? What if it gets stuck in his digestive tract? Are pennies toxic? Guards, I yell. Harry's face scrunches up and he sniffs. I'm stressing him out. Crap. I pull him into my arms and rub his back. Shh, it's okay. The door bursts open and Angelo rushes in. Go back to bed, he calls behind him. I see why as Clara jogs into the room after him, eyes wild. He swallowed a penny, I hiss, heart pounding. We need to go to the hospital. Angelo helps me onto my feet, brow wrinkled. I'm not sure swallowing a penny necessitates a hospital visit. Neither am I, but I'm not taking any fucking chances. Angelo is busy murmuring something into his radio. Clara steps around Angelo and walks over. Babe, you need to calm down. Is he choking? I lift Harry up and inspect him. He frowns down at me, very skeptical of the situation, but otherwise seems fine. He's breathing normally and isn't coughing. John, another guard, races into the room. He nods at Angelo and walks over to Harry and me. I was trained as a paramedic, John explains calmly. Why don't you put Harry on the bed and I'll have a look at him? My hands are shaking as I place Harry on the bed. I am reluctant to move out of the way, and John has to gently guide me aside so he can examine Harry. Clara comes over and wraps her arms around me. It'll be okay. Clara assures me, kids are resilient. Deep down, I know that's true. But as a first time mom, it's hard to believe it. Nothing has ever seemed more fragile than my beautiful baby boy. I squeeze her hand and watch as John carefully pokes and prods at Harry. He opens his mouth and looks down his throat, then looks back at me. He's fine, John says. You could take him to the hospital, but it'll just scare him. He's not choking, it's not lodged in his throat, and he will probably pass the penny in a few days' time. I exhale, and my shoulders sag with relief. Are you sure? I ask. John chuckles. I think more than anything, he's just confused about why you're so distressed. 
I scoop Harry into my arms and stroke the back of his head. <sighs> Thank God. Angelo clears his throat. I notice he has a phone pressed to his ear. Gabriel would like me to remind you that you're still on the phone. Oh, right. I lean down and grab my discarded phone from the carpet. Clara's eyes widen. You're talking to Gabriel? I know, right? I mouth, bringing the phone back up to my ear. Angelo ushers John and Clara out of my room and closes the door behind him. Everything's fine, I say. What the hell happened? Gabriel snaps. Angelo says Harry swallowed some loose change. A penny, I correct. Just one. Is he okay? He's fine. John looked him over. How did he get a hold of a penny? Gabriel asks, as though he has never seen loose change before. I suppose he probably doesn't bother with it. I had some change in my jeans, I start to explain. When I- Gabriel cuts me off in a harsh voice. I want to see him tomorrow. I will send a car in the morning. My heart thuds to a halt. Silence hangs between us, and Clara bobs into my line of sight. I shoo her away and turn around. I think Harry would really like that, I say. But you do know that where he goes, I go. Yes, Gabriel replies curtly. I'm aware. And then he hangs up. I bring the phone away from my face and stare at it disbelievingly. Clara comes over and eyes me, unsure whether my open-mouthed expression is due to a good kind of shock or a bad kind of shock. Truth be told, I'm not sure either. What is it? She asks. I'm going to see Gabriel tomorrow, I reply. He wants to see Harry. Clara rolls her eyes and sighs. Oh, brother. Alexis. My heart races the entire drive to the mansion. I try circular breathing, calming mantras and distractions, but it still pounds against the back of my ribs like a jackhammer. I feel like I'm going to throw up. I check the envelope in my purse again, as though it might have gone somewhere since I left the apartment. It's still there. I don't know why I've bothered. He's not going to talk to me. Or if he does, I doubt it will be friendly. I don't know what to expect, and I think that's what's killing me most of all. Gabriel might be cold and dismissive. He might pretend I don't exist entirely. I'm not sure which would be the worst case scenario. When we pull through the front gates and start meandering up the long drive, my heart kicks into overdrive. I take in the familiar scenery as we crawl toward the house, noting that the trees lining the drive, which were leafy and green in the summer months, are now dull and barren. A low morning mist floats above the rolling lawn, and the dark gray clouds hanging overhead complete the unwelcoming scene. The house rises ahead, breathtaking as always. A suited figure stands under the columned portico, and my breath catches. I soon realize the man is much too small to be Gabriel, however, and when we come to a stop, I see it is Silvano Gambaro. The driver, David, gets out and opens the door for me, and I unclip Harry from his car seat and step out into the chilly air. Silvano walks over to greet me. Welcome back, he says. Gabriel wanted a doctor to examine Harry. He's waiting just inside. It is unclear whether Silvano means that Gabriel is waiting inside or the doctor. But when I enter the marbled foyer, I am disappointed to see it is the latter. The doctor is a tall, thin man with thick, square glasses. When he lifts his arm to shake my hand, his sleeve pulls back a little to expose black ink running up his arms. I'm Dr. Green, he says. 
I adjust my grip on Harry to shake his hand, wondering if that is his real name. Alexis, I reply. And this is the patient, Harry. I peer around the room, but there's no trace of Gabriel anywhere. The anticipation is killing me. Dr. Green grins warmly at Harry. Ah, yes, the little troublemaker. Let's go get him checked out. Silvano leads us out of the foyer and toward the dining room, which has been transformed into a makeshift examination area, with various instruments laid out on the sideboard, and the grand table moved aside for an examination table instead. I hover close by, as Dr. Green performs many of the same checks that John did yesterday, as well as a few he didn't. He is surprisingly warm throughout the whole process and manages to keep Harry calm. I keep an eye on the doorway, wondering when Gabriel will show up. He's going to be completely fine, Dr. Green announces finally. I would keep him away from your change bowl just in case lest he starts to jingle when he walks. He tickles Harry in the belly, and Harry shrieks with laughter. I notice Silvano has pulled out his phone and is speaking quietly into the receiver, and my heart constricts. He's calling Gabriel, I'm sure of it. Dr. Green takes his leave, and Silvano smiles at me. Gabriel would like to see Harry in the living room. Is it okay if I go too? I ask irritably. Silvano nods, and I lift Harry into my arms and follow Gabriel's second through to the living room. When I step inside, the nostalgia of it all almost makes me falter. There are two tall cherrywood bookshelves lining opposite walls, and long arched windows gaze out at the garden beyond. Two elegant red leather sofas sit across from one another, with an antique coffee table floating between. I have spent hours in this room, playing with Harry, researching and writing articles, reading one of the hundreds of books stacked on the shelves. This was the room where I tried to interview Gabriel after he first learned he was a father. My eye lingers on the cushioned back of the closest sofa, where the heated exchange ended with Gabriel ruthlessly fucking me. Gabriel is sitting on the furthest sofa, one long leg crossed over the other, the paper open in his lap. He starts to fold it as we enter, but doesn't look up. I'll leave you to it, Silvano says, ducking from the room. Daddy, Harry exclaims. When Gabriel's face lifts, his eyes do not meet mine. He gets to his feet, grinning, and strides over to pull Harry into his arms. My breath catches at his closeness as the scent of sandalwood and musk envelop me. But Gabriel doesn't even acknowledge me. He may as well be lifting Harry out of a high chair. There's my boy, Gabriel says, walking back to the sofa. He sinks down and starts to tickle Harry. I heard you ate something you shouldn't have. Should I shake you and see if you jingle? Harry squirms, giggling. No! My heart splinters. All that warmth, and yet he leaves me in the cold. It hurts being this close to him. It hurts that he seems to be pretending I don't exist. And it's not Fucking fair. Are you even going to look at me? I snap. Both Gabriel and Harry pause. Gabriel's eyes lift to the doorway, where I am standing with my fists clenched at my sides. His smile melts away, and his eyes glaze with contempt. He looks beautiful, fierce. I trace the stern lines of his cheeks, the sensual curve of his lips, the bottomless depths of his black eyes. Heat fills my belly, a potent mixture of anger and lust. I can't help it. Our relationship has always volleyed between fucking and fighting, and the tenderness that grew between us took time to fully blossom. But always the fucking. 
always the fighting. Seeing him angry instinctively stirs something dark inside of me. I push past it and walk toward Gabriel, digging in my purse to pull out the thick manila folder. I hold it out for him, and he takes it reluctantly. What is this? Gabriel asks. I sit on the sofa next to him and pull Harry onto my lap. It's everything I know about the cartel and their drug operations, I tell him. Who they're dealing to, which houses they're dealing from, where they've been arranging meetings with their Irish contacts. Gabriel cocks a brow and pulls out the thick stack of documents. He flips through them while I play with an increasingly grumpy Harry. <sighs> I don't blame the kid. If I hadn't seen my father in over a month, I'd be upset too if I got two seconds of FaceTime and then my mom distracted him. But it's now or never. I study Gabriel's expression, watching as one of his lips crooks into what could be considered a smile. He looks up. The force of his full attention spears through me like a jagged blade. And I love the pain. This is good, he admits. But then again, you've always been quite the talented little sneak. I frown. I probably deserved that. We should get this out, you know. I can take it. Gabriel works his jaw back and forth eyes pinning me to the spot. He gives a small shake of his head. Tiger, I doubt you could take even half of what I think you deserve. There is a dark promise in those words that blurs the line between threat and seduction. My mouth goes dry, and I find myself staring at him in stunned silence. My heart shakes my ribcage, my thighs clench. Harry starts to wail. I jump in my seat, having forgotten I was even holding him. Gabriel leans forward and starts to stroke his cheek, whispering comforting words. I lean down and press my lips to the top of Harry's head, his cries rattling in my brain. Chill out, little guy, Gabriel urges. I'm here. But for how long? Gabriel lifts Harry from my lap and bounces him up and down, still whispering in his ear. I scoot closer and rub my hand over Harry's back in circles. Harry's cries turn to choked sobs, then to whimpers, and finally, he slumps into Gabriel's chest, eyes closed, lips parted. It has been so long since I've seen Harry asleep in Gabriel's arms, the sight of it nearly draws tears to my eyes, and I blink them away while Gabriel's head is lowered against Harry's. I don't want him to see me react like this. Gabriel responds to strength, and if I'm going to convince him that we can make this work, I need to present the strongest version of myself. Gabriel, I say. He looks up. Do you have Jessica on standby? Jessica was Harry's nanny when we lived in the mansion. It's a long shot that he would have brought her back in for this visit, just in case. But the question is worth asking. Gabriel blinks. Yes, she's here. Good. My lips curve in a wicked smile. I bat my eyelashes seductively. Call her. His eyes darken as the lust blooms within them. He pulls out his phone. The door to Gabriel's bedroom slams back on its hinges as he pushes me through. His mouth works feverishly against mine, deepening the kiss. He kisses me like he owns me, like his tongue and lips and teeth are staking claim to my mouth, while his hands claim my body. I missed this. I missed the way his fingers sink into my skin. Missed the way he rumbles an approving growl as I skim my fingers down his chest. Missed the tug of his fist in my hair. The room is just as bare as I remember it. Utilitarian, almost. Gabriel flings me onto the immaculately made bed without ceremony, and I push up on my elbows and watch as he undresses. Take your clothes off. 
he orders, tossing his shirt to the floor. My eyes carve a hungry path over his muscled chest, rippling abs, and the delicious V that leads into the top of his pants. I lick my lips. In one fluid movement, Gabriel is above me, kneeling on the bed with one knee wedged between my legs and a hand pinning me to the mattress by my throat. His eyes bore into mine. I told you to take your clothes off, he growls. He grinds his knee into me, and my eyes roll back in pleasure. Then his weight is gone, and he stands at the foot of the bed and unzips his pants. Don't make me tell you again, he warns. I begin to hurriedly undress, tugging off my jeans in a way that I'm sure is anything but sexy. Yet the way Gabriel looks at me, with fire in his eyes, makes me feel like the sexiest woman on the planet. I have made it down to my underwear by the time Gabriel pulls down his tight boxer shorts, and I sit up and pause to watch his thick cock bob free. It's long, with a bulbous purple head that I have wrapped my lips around many times. A moan drifts through my open lips as I stare at it. I realize Gabriel is watching me, and when I look up, he is smirking. I should make you beg for it, he tells me, walking closer. I should tie you up and tease you until you can't take it anymore, until you plead with me to fill you with my cock. I swallow. His words stroke over me like feathers, causing my hairs to stand on end. Do you want to know why I'm not going to do that, tiger? Gabriel asks, squatting down so that we are at the same level. His dark eyes search mine. Why? I ask breathlessly. Gabriel's hand comes to my cheek, almost tenderly. Because the only thing I want more than to hear you beg for my cock is to give it to you so hard that you can't even speak. He sweeps one of his arms under my legs and uses it to roll me onto my stomach. I let out a squeak of surprise. My core throbs with need, and I'm so glad that Gabriel isn't going to make me wait. Gabriel roughly pushes me up the bed, hiking my hips into the air and pressing me into the sheets with a hand on my back. He bends over me, and I feel his bulge against my ass. I wiggle into him and feel a low rumble where his chest meets my back. Gabriel's lips come to my ear. But first, I need to teach you a little lesson, he murmurs. Because I'm pretty sure I told you to take your fucking clothes off. He sits up and jerks my panties down, and the air is cold on my wetness. God, I want him so bad. I hold my breath, looking forward to however he wants to teach me this lesson. Gabriel's hand comes down hard on my ass. The pain skitters over my skin, and I moan loudly. Count, he orders. And this time, don't make me tell you twice. One, I shout out quickly. Good girl. He whacks me again, and it stings a little more this time. That just makes the pulsing in my sex more intense. Two, smack. Three, smack. My ass is burning now. I grit my teeth and call out, four, smack. Five, I quiver with anticipation, waiting for the next hit. I am breathing hard, my face pressed into the comforter, my body shaking. I feel so raw and exposed. This is the most honest Gabriel and I have been with each other since we first met. And there is something divine in this mixture of pleasure and pain, of lust and hurt. Gabriel's hand comes to my ass again, but gently this time. He rubs his palm against my skin and dips down until his fingers enter me, 
gliding between my wet folds. He leans over, pressing kisses over my back, gently unhooking my bra as his fingers work inside of me. I sigh and push back against him. Gabriel kisses my neck. Good girl, he says. You're nice and wet for me. Always. He chuckles darkly and removes his fingers. I whimper and look back, just in time to see him guiding his cock toward me. I think that he will slam down to the hilt, but he holds my gaze as he enters me inch by inch, my body stretching to its limits to accommodate him. Gabriel squeezes my hip and grits his teeth as he bottoms out. I have never felt so full. Fuck, he hisses. I smile coquettishly. I thought I wasn't supposed to be able to talk at this point. Gabriel fists my hair and shoves my face into the mattress as he starts to pound into me. I gasp and let out a guttural moan. I want to taunt him more, see how much further I can push him. But the sensation is so intense, so wicked, that I can't find the words. Gabriel leans over and his hand snakes under me to squeeze my breast. He kisses and nips at my neck, his hot breaths fanning against my ear. I can feel the urgency in his hips, his kiss, the way his fingers find my clit almost clumsily. He needs this. I need this too. I need the passion, the unbridled lust. I need him. Gabriel pulls out and flips me onto my back, hoisting my legs over his shoulders before entering me again. He kisses me hard and deep as his hips continue, slamming into mine. I wrap my arms around his neck and pull him closer. I missed this closeness. I missed the feel of his skin, hot against mine. I've missed too much. Pleasure swirls deep in my core. His pubic bone grinds against my clit with every thrust, and the resulting spike of bliss makes me cry out against his lips. Gabriel pauses and lifts his head. I blink my eyes open and stare up at him. Why has he stopped? Have I done something wrong? How have I fucked this up? I haven't said a word. But the look he bestows on me isn't angry or stern. It's tender, almost. His eyes are soft, and the way they flit over my face makes my cheeks heat. Gabriel is doing more than looking at me. He's seeing me, completely, wholly, without guise or pretense. Gabriel kisses me again, slower this time, and lets my legs down so our chests can press flush together. His hips grind into mine at a teasing pace. I moan and try to pull him closer, digging my fingers into his back. Tension coils in my belly, and I'm ready to burst. I just need a little more, and I know how to get it. Please, Gabriel, I beg. Please fuck me hard. So hard that I can't breathe. I'm so close. This drives him into a frenzy, and with an approving growl, he starts jackhammering into me. I come apart with such intensity that my vision goes black. My nails bite into his back. My mouth falls open in a wordless scream. Pleasure blasts through me like a rocket soaring through the atmosphere. Unlike anything I've been able to achieve on my own since we were kicked out of the mansion. Gabriel grunts and shudders, and I feel him release inside of me. I wrap my arms around him and tighten, afraid that he'll disappear the second this is over. I wish this moment could last forever. We lie like that for a bit, breathing, feeling, our hearts beating in time. When Gabriel rolls to the side, I am surprised when he drags me atop his chest, just like he used to do when we were lovers. He traces patterns on my back, 
and I close my eyes. After a long silence, Gabriel says, There is something you need to know about the cartel. Something I've been meaning to tell you. I blink open and look at him. What is it? Gabriel keeps staring at the ceiling, his mouth in a grim line. Do you remember when I told you about the woman who manipulated my father, Felicity Huffman? Suddenly it all clicks into place. The oddly personal text, the thread of truth from Clara's kidnapper, the nagging feeling that I was missing something. She's the leader of the cartel, I whisper. He nods. Not everything makes sense. I'm not sure why Felicity thought it would upset me to have her appear so suddenly back in Gabriel's life. That shouldn't affect me at all. Unless, is there something I'm missing about their relationship? Gabriel, I begin. We could do this without the lies. We could be a family. He looks down and his lips part, but he doesn't say a word. Gabriel rolls me off him, though not too roughly. He rises from the bed and walks to the sideboard, where he unstoppers a crystal decanter and pours himself a glass of whiskey. He downs it in one mouthful. I sit up on my elbows. Please don't ignore me, Gabriel, I urge. Don't you want to be a family again? Gabriel faces away from me, the muscles in his shoulders stiffening. He doesn't answer. Gabriel. I wake in the early hours of the morning, noting the pleasant warmth of Alexis's body next to mine. I forgot how good it feels to wake beside her, to smell her fresh, flowery scent on my pillowcase. I open my eyes. The room is dark except for a band of moonlight stretching across the bed, illuminating one of Alexis's creamy thighs where it straddles the covers. She is lying on her belly, her face turned toward me. A lock of a chestnut hair covers her face, and I brush it back. She snores softly. I didn't mean to fuck her. She was supposed to bring Harry over for Dr. Green to check out, and then she was supposed to go. I thought I had purged her from my system and the fact that I couldn't resist her troubles me. As long as it was just physical, I suppose I have nothing to worry about. I have needs, after all. It's fine to fulfill them. What wouldn't be fine would be if I fell for her again, or if I let her in again, which I won't. It's just physical. Speaking of, my cock starts to stir at the thought of just how physical we got last night. I'll fuck her again and go start my day. That should make it clear to both of us where my head is on this. I bundle Alexis into my arms and pull her on top of me and start to kiss her neck. She wakes up with a moan and props up on her arms, blinking down at me. She looks as though she might be about to say something, so I pull her back down and kiss her hard. Alexis sighs against my lips, opening for me. Her cheek is soft against my palm. Her thighs feel like silk against mine. My cock throbs with the need to be inside her, and I hike her up a little further and guide her on to it. Alexis lets out a delicious moan as I sink into a wet heat. Her pussy grips me perfectly. I let out a low moan and start to grind my hips into hers, admiring the view of her bouncing tits in the dim light. I tighten my fingers on her hips and hold her in place, thrusting up into her over and over again. Fuck, she feels so good, so wet, so hot, so tight. I wrench her down and kiss her hard on the lips. Her nails dig into my chest. I suck her lower lip between my teeth and bite down, holding her there as I slam into her. There is no love here, I tell myself. It's physical, purely aggressively physical. I punctuate each thought with a rough thrust. Alexis hangs on to me for dear life. Her moans are the finest music to my ears. The dig of her fingers in my chest is the most divine sensation. 
even as I fuck her into oblivion in the most primal way, I can't deny that there is something unique about having sex with Alexis that I never had with other women. Something that will always keep me coming back for more. Even now, as she rides in my arms, as I give her everything, I want more. When it comes to this woman, I will never be satisfied. My balls churn with hot pleasure, and I can feel my climax coming. I kiss Alexis long and hard. She whimpers against my mouth. Are you close, tiger? I whisper in the dark. Are you going to come for me? Yes. Her voice comes out urgent. She starts to bounce on my dick, and the visual of her pink-tipped tits bouncing in front of me is nearly enough to send me over. I grit my teeth and hang on to her hips. She throws her head back, letting out a low cry as her body squeezes me from the inside. A blinding flash splits through me, and I come apart. Fuck, it feels so good to come inside her. I own her. She is mine. Alexis leans over and kisses my neck as we catch our breath. The more the cool air settles on my sweat-slicked forehead, the more I realize how intimate this moment is. The more I realize I need to leave. I guide Alexis over onto the bed and shift to the side. Her fingers land gently on my back. You don't have to leave, she says. I do. Without another word, I throw on my clothes and head out into the hall. As I close the door behind me, I swear I hear her sigh. Silvano's thin lips press together to look even thinner. He opens his mouth to say something and then clearly thinks better of it. What is it? I ask, cocking a brow. He fiddles with the cufflinks of his jacket absently, muttering, you tend not to like it when I speak my mind. In all fairness, I did warn him at the fundraiser to be careful what he said to me. I would snap at Vito like that sometimes too, but he had the benefit of being my closest friend for decades and knew all about my various moods. I suppose one thing Vito had yet to teach his brother was that much as it may anger me to hear his opinion, his job is to provide it. Just tell me, I demand. Silvano looks at me from his seat across the desk, his feature sharp, elfish almost. He has the sort of cunning cut to his cheeks and jaw that Vito did, and the twinkle in his eyes makes it seem he always knows something you don't. I just think it all seems a bit much, Gabriel, he says. What are you going to do if she fails? Then I will know that I was right to push her out of my life. I reply, and that is where she will stay. And if she passes, you're just going to trust her again? He asks quizzically. Gabriel, the way I see it, you either trust this girl and love her or you don't. If you give her opportunities to disappoint you on a silver platter, you're going to end up disappointed. Or I won't. He lets out a small sigh. Or you won't. I check my watch. It's late enough in the morning now that Alexis should be awake. Okay, I say. Bring her in. Silvano leaves my office and returns a few minutes later with a sleepy, rumpled-looking Alexis. She is wearing a pair of my sweatpants and a tank top, and her hair is in a bird's nest on top of her head. I suppose that's my doing. Good morning, Alexis greets, though her expression is distrustful. Is everything okay? Silvano leaves us, and I gesture for Alexis to take a seat across from me. As she does, I sweep the documents on my desk into a folder and tuck them into the top drawer. Alexis watches me, waiting for my answer. Everything is fine, I say. I have procured the services of a top-of-the-line OBGYN, and we have an appointment there this afternoon. I can arrange for you to be taken back to your apartment and then picked up directly from there, or I will permit you to stay in the mansion for the day if you'd like. She brightens a little. I'd love to hang around. 
It looks like it's going to be a gorgeous day, and there is a sharp rap on my door. Sir, it's urgent, Silvano calls through the wood. Excuse me, I say to Alexis. I will be right back. I leave the room before she has the chance to breathe another word, and Silvano and I walk down the hall to Alexis's old bedroom, where my laptop is sitting open on the desk. On the screen, I can see Alexis sitting in the chair in my office. Her head is tipped back, as though bored, and she's otherwise still. How long are we going to wait? Silvano asks. As long as it takes. I keep my eyes glued to the screen, waiting for the smallest indication that Alexis is thinking about the documents in my unlocked desk drawer. If she peeks at them, she will find falsified bank reports showing several large transfers to an offshore account. Some of the transfer dates should stand out to her since they correlate with meetings between my organization and the cartel. There are also a couple of transactions from recent weeks. The first test is whether she opens the drawer. The second is what she does with that information. Only, Alexis doesn't open the drawer. The most she does is pick up the round glass paperweight from my desk and start tossing it into the air. At one point she drops it and has to chase it across the room, but then she hurriedly sets it back on the desk and sits down again. Silvano chuckles. Unless being a bit of a klutz is a fireable offense, I think she's proven herself trustworthy. Not yet, I murmur, still staring at the screen, waiting for the tiniest sign of betrayal lingering under the surface. Silvano looks at me, face flat. This is what I mean. I knew this wouldn't be enough for you. No, I admit. But it's a start. The doctor's office is painted a sterile white color with minimalist decor and a receptionist who smiles like her life depends on it. Alexis looks nervous when we arrive and holds Harry close, even though I can tell she's straining under his weight. Let me take him, I offer, as a cheery nurse leads us to a private consulting room. Alexis shakes her head. No, he smells like sunshine. I'm not sure what that means, but it's apparently comforting. It's just a routine check, Alexis, I say. Everything is going to be fine. I know, I know. She sighs, kissing the top of Harry's head. I just get nervous any time I get a checkup. This could be when I find out there's something wrong with the baby. I stop her, lifting her chin so our eyes meet. Or more likely, this will be when the doctor confirms that everything is perfectly fine. Okay? She nods. Okay. The consulting room is just as bare and elegant as the rest of the practice. All of the machines and instruments verge on futuristic looking, with white lacquer and chrome finishes. The nurse settles Alexis on the examination table, and she hands Harry over to me. There's a play area in the waiting room, the nurse says. Perhaps you and your son would be more comfortable there? I look to Alexis, and she nods. We will call you back in before the ultrasound, the nurse says, and we head out to the play area, if you could call it that. The toys are all made of polished wood, with an emphasis being more on form than function. I sit cross-legged on the rug with Harry and hand him a wooden pyramid, which he has no idea what to do with. <laughs> Me either, buddy, I say. And then I begin to fly it over his head like an airplane, which has always been our favorite game. I think about Alexis in the examination room, and a little of her nervousness seeps into my brain. I find myself glancing at the clock between maneuvers, wondering if everything is going okay. Harry chases enthusiastically after the plane, completely at ease. His mouth is pulled back into a goofy smile, his eyes alight with joy. I watch him and can't help but smile. This kid means everything to me. I can't believe I've gone so long without seeing him. Mr. Bellucci. I look over my shoulder to find the nurse from earlier smiling warmly at me.
We're ready for the ultrasound. I get to my feet and lift Harry into my arms. Ready to meet your little brother or sister? I ask. Harry grins. Yeah. We head into the examination room, where Alexis is laid on the table with a shirt pushed above a belly. An older man in a lab coat introduces himself as Dr. Steinman and offers me the seat next to the table. Let's get this show on the road, he says cheerfully, smearing Alexis's belly with ultrasound gel. My eyes are glued to the screen as he starts to move the wand over Alexis's belly. The fingers find mine, and I squeeze reassuringly. There we are, Dr. Steinman says, stopping with the screen centered on the black and white of an impossibly small figure. That's one perfectly healthy seven-week-old baby. Alexis squeezes again, but this time out of joy. A baby. My heart swells, and my head fills with visions of a little girl with ribbons in her dark hair, or a little boy in a waistcoat to match mine and his brother's. I already know that I am going to spoil him or her rotten. As far as pregnancies go, I would say this one is running smoother than most, Dr. Steinman says. You two have nothing to worry about. He goes on to reel off some facts and figures, but I'm barely listening. My eyes are glued to the screen, to the image of our perfect baby, to the sound of its heartbeat reverberating through my eardrums. Once we finish, I keep hold of Harry on the way back down to the car. Alexis is uncharacteristically silent, which usually means she's thinking hard about the words she is going to say next. She waits until we are in the car, and I have clipped Harry into his car seat. Does this change your answer? Alexis asks softly. My answer about what? I meet her sapphire gaze, and she smiles hopefully. About us, being a family. I look out the window as the car pulls away from the curb and clear my throat. I'm... <clears throat> going to make sure you're well taken care of. You'll have the best prenatal care money can buy. That doesn't even slightly answer my question, she replies, irritation lace in her voice. That's because I don't know what to tell her. Can we be a family? No, I still can't trust her. I can't let myself feel for her. The concept of a family entails unconditional love and I cannot offer that to Alexis when she could just as easily use it against me. That being said, I can think of a few good reasons to keep her close. You and Harry will move back into the mansion, I say. I think it would be beneficial for Harry. I agree, she replies. But Clara comes with me. I glance over, and she sticks a chin out with resolve. Considering Clara already knows about my organization, I suppose it's not that much of a risk. I can already tell that Alexis's return will be conditional on Clara's recovery. She is fiercely protective where Clara is concerned. Fine, I say, and look back out the window. Good. Good. We spend the rest of the car ride in silence. Gabriel. I leave Alexis's room early in the morning, and it feels strange to me how quickly we have fallen back into our familiar rhythm. She has been in the mansion only a week, and already I have spent most nights in her bed, sneaking out of it most mornings. I can't help myself. I can practically hear her body calling to me throughout the day, teasing me, tempting me. And then when I go to her in the darkness, she is always so enthusiastic that I couldn't control myself if I tried. I nod to the guards stationed outside Alexis's room and the ones further down the hall outside of Clara's. I've had few interactions with the little blonde since she moved in, but she has been quiet and respectful, and that's all I can ask for. I go to my office to complete a couple hours of work while I wait for Silvano to arrive and present his report. 
At least I try to. I'm distracted by the thought of what he will have to say when he gets here. I don't know what I will do if he doesn't have good news. I give up with an hour left to go and grab a coffee from the kitchen. My personal chef, Victoria, is rolling out, though. She looks up and smiles when she sees me. Good morning, she greets, sprinkling a little more flour on her rolling pin. There's fresh coffee in the pot. Good morning. I go to pour myself a cup and feel Victoria's eyes on me. It's nice to have Alexis and Harry back, she says airily. Mm, I grunt and leave. I can almost feel Victoria's nervous energy flood into the hallway as she wonders if she's offended me. The truth is, she's right. I just don't want to admit out loud that it has been nice to have them back. The energy in the house feels different. Laughter fills the halls, and the air feels warmer somehow. I go back to my office, and it feels like a millennium has gone by by the time Silvano arrives, a steaming mug of coffee in hand. What did you do to Victoria? He asks. She's stress bacon. I didn't do anything to her. I gesture impatiently for him to sit down. She bakes. It's part of a job. Silvano perches on the chair, one eyebrow cocked. When I popped into the kitchen, she had about eight dozen cookies on sheets waiting to go in the oven. Plus, she was rolling out pastry dough for volivants. I shrug. Alexis eats a lot, I reply. Now get on with your report. He smiles knowingly and takes a sip of his coffee. There's nothing to report. Over the past week, I've left a veritable buffet of incriminating material, either out for her to find or tucked away in places where you thought she might look. She hasn't gone to the shed where you used to store the purple heroin, and the cellar has been unlocked but she hasn't so much as poked a head inside. Anytime she has come across documents, she has barely spared them a glance, and she gave the guards a good tongue lashing after stumbling upon a gun. On one occasion, she even told Clara not to touch a dossier I left on the living room table and had one of the guards return it to you. She's being very clever, I remark. Silvano's gray eyes go wide. Clever? No, Gabriel, she's being trustworthy. I frown. I'm still wary. It has only been a week, and who is to say Alexis doesn't know she's being tested? She's whip smart when she wants to be. You don't want to believe her, Silvano presses. It goes against your black and white world view. If you start to trust her now, it slides her out of the black and into the gray and that's going to mess up beliefs that you've had ingrained in you your whole life. I glare at Silvano, and he looks away and takes a sip of his coffee. I am being cautious with good reason, I growl. He smiles. I have other good news. I raise my eyebrows expectantly. He sets the mug down on my desk and pulls a piece of paper from inside of his suit jacket, passing it over to me. This is a report from our insider source in the investigation against you, he explains. They've shelved the case for the time being. I take the notice and read through. I'm confused. Yes, he nods. I was too. I had some men look into it and found that a couple of the investigators, including Ruby Flint, have received some troubling threats. I frown and look up. Now I'm more confused. I haven't ordered any intimidation. Not yet. None of my men should have done anything without my express order. I know. And none of your men did. He takes another sip of coffee. According to my sources, the threats came from a woman. I don't know why Silvano considers this to be good news. The only woman I know who is capable of such a thing is Felicity Huffman, and if she is behind this, it means she is planning something worse than jail time. Do you want to hear what our mystery woman told Ruby Flint? 
Silvano asks, lips quirked at the corner. It's quite entertaining. I sigh. Go on, then. After I send Silvano away, I leave my office, intent on hitting the gym for a while to clear my head. He has given me a lot to think about. It's suspicious to me that Alexis passed all of his tests with flying colors. It's suspicious to me that suddenly I am a free man. None of it is sitting well. I head for my bedroom to get changed first, but stop when I hear voices around the hall corner. Alexis is speaking to someone in a stern voice. Is she on the phone? I press to the wall and listen, just as a female voice replies to her. Ms. Wright, I promise I wasn't. Don't bullshit me, Lupe. Alexis replies in a flat voice. I saw you looking in my jewelry box. There's nothing to clean in there, so why would you be doing it unless you were checking out the goods? She sighs. Listen, you have a family. I understand that. But I also know you're paid well here, so there shouldn't be any reason for you to be skimming off the top. If there is, if you're in trouble somehow, please come to me so I can help you. So are you in trouble? No, Lupe says in a quiet voice. Okay. Because you have a family, and because you're going to promise me that you won't do it again, I won't tell Gabriel what happened. I am going to tell the head housekeeper, though, and you will be searched at the start and end of your shifts from now on until I feel that you're no longer a threat. Do you know what happens if you get caught even thinking about stealing again? No. You don't just lose your job, Lupe. You lose everything. You'll probably have to leave the city. You do understand how privileged a position this is, right? You've seen things. You've heard things. That's why you're so well paid. And that's why you're only valuable to us as long as you can be trusted. I won't do it again, Lupe says with a quaver in her voice. I promise. I'm so sorry. I don't know what I was thinking. Okay. I believe you. Alexis lets out a sigh. Get back to work. I hear footsteps heading in my direction, and Lupe rounds the corner. She lets out a strangled cough when she sees me, eyes wide with fear. I nod amiably, as though I didn't just overhear their conversation and continue on to my bedroom. I'm proud of how Alexis handled the situation. She was stern but fair, and I believed the promise of retribution in her voice. I have seen this side of Alexis a few times, and it never fails to impress me. I get changed into my gym clothes, wondering if maybe this is not the first time this week that Alexis has spun threats around a potential enemy. I ask Alexis to join me for dinner in the evening. It is the first time we have dined together since she came back to the mansion, and, as such, I employ Victoria to craft a specialty menu of Alexis's favorite foods. Alexis comes down for dinner wearing a gorgeous red satin dress that clings to her curves and a skeptical expression. This feels a lot like a date, she comments as I pull a chair out for her. So? I pour a glass of wine for us both and take my seat at the other end of the table. So you're up to something. She evaluates me over the top of her wine glass, ruby red lips pulled into a tight frown. You've made it very clear that we aren't together the same way we used to be. The fact that you're whining and dining me now is suspicious. Victoria brings through the appetizer. Baked camembert with cranberry sauce. Alexis stares down the table at me while Victoria places the plates in front of us, eyes narrowed in challenge. I can tell she is expending considerable effort not to nosedive face first into a food. My lip tugs up at the corner. I have a question to ask you, I say simply, picking up my fork. 
Alexis stabs into the cheese with more force than necessary. Oh yeah? What's that? Did you intimidate the detectives working on my case? Alexis pauses mid-chew, eyes snapping up to meet mine. She finishes chewing and swallows carefully. I might have had a few words with them, she says, and picks up her napkin to dab the corner of her mouth. Why would you do that, I ask. Alexis sets her fork down and licks her lips. Because I fucked up, she says. I thought that getting them to stop investigating might make amends for the damage I caused. The air thickens between us. Something stirs in my chest and I lean back in my chair, resisting the urge to pull her into my arms. I take a long sip of wine and when I set my glass back down, speak in a deliberately measured voice. You told Ruby Flint that if she kept investigating, you were going to expose her affair on the front page of the Union with full-color photos. Alexis shrugs. It's not my fault that she's indiscreet, she says, smirking. And into some weird stuff, too. I hold her gaze. You also told her that once you'd done that, You'd slice an inch of a skin off every day I spent in prison. Suppressing a smile, I add. That's cold. I learned from the best, she retorts and lifts her glass in salute. I mirror the gesture and we hold eye contact for a good time before finally drinking. The wine has never tasted sweeter. What do you think happens now, I ask. Alexis scoops up some camembert and forks it into her mouth. She chews, taking her damn time, and finally swallows and speaks. I don't know. I know what I want to happen, but whether you'll allow it is another thing entirely. What do you want to happen? Alexis takes a breath. I want in, Gabriel. Like it or not, I'm a part of this now, and so is Harry. I want us to be a family, and I want you to be completely honest with me. I want to help. Her eyes sparkle with sincerity and something like sadness. Our whole relationship has been a myriad of lies on both sides from the beginning. Just as one was stripped away, another was layered over, like a tantalizing feather dance. We have been playing this game for so long now that I don't know how to stop. To let her in, I will need to give her everything, exposing myself and my business completely. Can I do that? Generally, when someone bears their soul, they expect a response, Alexis says tautly, lifting her glass to her lips. I realize I have been sitting in quiet contemplation for a long time. I chuckle at her snark. You've changed, I say. People do. <laughs> Not like this. I shake my head and capture her gaze. You've always been sharp-tongued and pugnacious, but I'd go so far as to say you've become utterly ruthless. Alexis shrugs, as though her transformation from single mom to would-be mob queen consisted of nothing more than a trip to the salon. Once upon a time, I thought that for us to be happy together, I would need to tame you, she explains. Recently, I realized that was false, that it was never a matter of taming you. Her eye glints. It was about matching your ferocity. Something about the way her lips curve wickedly around each word sends a bolt of heat through me. I am considering throwing her onto the table right here and now when Victoria bustles through to clean our plates and bring out the entree, lamb shanks and a red wine reduction with herbed mashed potatoes. I want to make this work too, I realize. I want to trust her. 
even though I am still wary, I believe that if I give her the opportunity, Alexis will continue proving herself. There is actually something I could use your help with, I tell her. Go on. You may remember that the cartel forced me to defund a lot of Bellucci Incorporated's rehabilitation centers, I say, stabbing a hunk of tender meat. I want to get the program back on its legs, and I'd like to put more focus into the company's charities in general. I need someone in charge to coordinate the facilities and funds. Someone I can trust. And I don't have the time to do it myself. You would have your own office in my building. Alexis grins. That sounds right up my alley, she says. But what about the rest of what I said? Will you let me in? She pauses, eyes softening. Can you let me in? She looks so beautiful, with her dark hair and soft ringlets around a heart-shaped face, her bright blue eyes staring hopefully down the table. I grind my jaw and will myself to open up. I need to. I don't think I can do this without her. I do need a partner. But I'm a criminal, Alexis, I say. I always have been, and I always will be. I have killed more people than I can count. I will never know if all of them deserved it. Can you accept that? When I first met Alexis, she made no bones about how it was her sole desire to bring good into the world. Being with me would tarnish that, even if she will control the charities. Alexis's mouth curves just a fraction at the edges, and she gives a short nod. Yes. The word hits heavy on the table in front of us. Yes. She is finally giving in to me. Completely. Her submission tastes so sweet on my tongue that I suddenly lose all desire for dessert. Desire floods my senses and I catch her gaze across the table. Why don't we go to my office and make it official, I offer. Alexis's eyes light up. Yes, let's. We walk to the office calmly, as though we are simply going to discuss some business matters. We keep a respectful distance, though I can feel her heat as keenly as if she were pressed against me. The scent of her is in my nose, jasmine and honeysuckle. Soon, the taste of her will be on my tongue. When we get to the door, I unlock it and we enter. I slam the door closed and shove her against it, my mouth claiming hers in a rough kiss. Alexis groans and tangles her fingers in my hair. She kisses back feverishly, greedily. I think about what she said about matching my ferocity, and so I decide to push her a little further, just to see if she can keep up. I hike her legs over my hips and press her back to the door, nipping at the soft skin of her throat. How do you want me to fuck you, Tiger? I ask. I don't want you to fuck me at all, she replies breathlessly. Not until you've made me come with your mouth first. A ripple of need washes over me at her words, and I groan. My cock is stiff against my zipper, and I'm desperate to plunge inside of her. But first, my woman gets what she wants. I turn and walk to the desk, laying her over it and shoving a dress up over her hips. Alexis watches me with hooded eyes, her cheeks flushed with desire. She looks so fucking delicious that... It takes all my effort not to ram my cock into a right here, right now. I hold the gaze as I tug her panties over her legs and drop to my knees between her legs. She smells like sex and heaven all at once. And when I lean forward to take my first lick, that's exactly how she tastes. I groan against the pussy, lapping between her silky folds. She moans and drops her head back lost in pleasure. My fingers grip the soft flesh of her hips and hold her in place while I plunder her with my mouth, 
swirling my tongue over her sensitive nub. My cock throbs in my pants. God, I want her so bad. I slide a finger inside of her and stroke her inner walls. Her thighs quaver on my shoulders, and she ratches up the volume of her moans. I love seeing her like this. Wild. Undone. Ferocious. I alternate between sucking and licking her clit, feeling her grow wetter by the second. She winds her fingers through my hair and urges me closer, panting with need. Don't stop, she pleads. Oh, God, I'm so close. Don't stop. I double my assault, plunging another finger into her wetness, grinding my face into a pussy. My cock threatens to burst out of my pants. I can't wait to feel her come on my fingers. Alexis's fingers tighten, and she lets out a keening wail. The sight, the sound, the feel of it is so fucking hot that I unzip and enter her without a moment of hesitation. Alexis swears and comes again on my cock, and I groan in ecstasy as I start to thrust into her heat. I could be making a mistake, but from where I'm standing, taking on Alexis as my partner in life and in business might just be the best fucking decision I've ever made. Alexis I go to the window and take a breath, scanning the endless New York City skyline as it winks in the morning sun. Cars weave back and forth on the street below, but they are so distant that they look almost like ants, rushing to bring word of food back to their anthill. I absently finish tucking my shirt back into my pencil skirt and notice that I missed a button when I was doing it up. Whoops. Gabriel left my office five minutes ago, but his scent lingers, strong and male. He came by to check out the designer sofa I purchased that was delivered early this morning. My core throbs with the memory. We checked it out, all right. The phone on my desk rings, and I move to answer it, taking a seat in the high-backed leather chair. I'm still not used to all this, to the lacquered cherry desk, the sleek black phone, the fancy chair. I've been working for Gabriel for two weeks now, and it's the most surreal experience. Hello, this is Alexis Wright, I answer. Hello, Alexis Wright, this is Clara Fitzgerald, I chuckle. Hello, Ms. Fitzgerald, how can I help you today? Someone wanted to say hi, she explains. Harry, wanna say hi? Hi, Mama, Harry says, almost shyly. Hey, baby, I grin, though my heart aches a little. I'm not used to being away from Harry. Jessica is a great nanny, but I feel much more comfortable with Auntie Clara looking after him during the day, and it gives Clara something to do other than hours of yoga and self-reflection. What are you guys up to? I ask. We're making cookies with Victoria, Clara says. They're in the oven right now. They smell good, don't they, little guy? I'm hungry, Harry complains. Clara and I both laugh. Are you still okay to bring him into the city for lunch? I ask. Yes, indeed, Clara replies. She adds in a husky voice. Angelo said he'd drive and hang with me while I wait. He says he knows the best falafel truck in the city. I am about to remind Clara that Angelo makes bank, and he can afford to take her somewhere a lot nicer for lunch. But then I remember who I'm talking to. Clara cares about fancy grub and money about as much as I care about yoga. Also, when did I get so picky? I guess I've developed expensive tastes. Be gentle on him, I say instead. Absolutely not, she snorts. 
He's a big, strong mafioso. I reckon he can take whatever I put out. You make a good point, I say with a laugh. How's work going? Clara asks. I spin my chair to face the wide window. You know what? Really good. I've been thinking about this a lot lately, and it felt good publishing that article spreading the word about purple heroin, but I've been able to do more good over the past two weeks than I did working on that for months. I control a lot of funding, and I feel like I'm really making a difference. I've got a meeting this afternoon to finalize the reopening of all the rehab centers Gabriel closed a couple of months ago. I'm glad, Clara says. I hear beeping in the background, and she adds, Whoops, that's the timer. I've got to go, but I'll see you in a couple of hours. See you soon. Clara hangs up, and I spin back to face my desk and hang up the phone. Then, with a happy sigh, it's back to work. Gabriel let me pick out the restaurant for lunch, and I chose a historic bistro near Central Park, with a stained glass, domed ceiling, and reputedly the best clam chowder in the city. As we walk through the front door, I chuckle to myself, thinking it's certainly no food truck. The hostess must recognize us as she leads us to our table right away, which is already set up with a high chair. Gabriel frowns at his watch once we're seated. They're late, he mutters. If she and Angela were wasting our time canoodling, I laugh. You need to relax. They'll be here any minute. I can tell Gabriel doesn't like the fact that Angelo and Clara are spending time together. And I sense it's because Clara is the new wild card in his life. He has absolutely no control over her. And she has more and more sway over Angelo every day. Gabriel doesn't like to share. He'll get over it, though. I'll make sure he does. I've never seen Clara so happy. As if on cue, Clara breezes through the dining room toward us, toting our son. Angelo walks a step behind, keeping a wary eye out for threats. That's one of the reasons I like the two of them together. It's like Clara has a personal guard at all times. I suppose I could assign her one if I wanted, though I don't think she'd thank me for doing so. Sorry we're late, Clara says, leaning over to set Harry up in his high chair. Harry decided he was against wearing pants. I laugh and lean over, stroking my finger over Harry's chubby hand. Like father, like son. I wear pants, Gabriel objects. I shoot him a side eye. But you wouldn't if someone else was telling you to. Cheeky he says in a warning, sexy tone. He shoots me a half grin that makes my heart beat erratically, and I clear my throat and sit back up. Right, Clara says brightly. Have a good lunch. I'll be back for Harry in an hour. She turns to leave, and I call after her. Enjoy your falafel. Is that some sort of code? Gabriel asks. I grin. Wouldn't you like to know? The waiter comes around to take our drink orders, and Gabriel leans over to play with Harry while we wait. Harry giggles appreciatively, and I watch the two of them, totally in their own little world, wondering if life will always be this perfect. Well, I shouldn't say perfect. Gabriel has committed to trusting me and involving me in his operations. However... I can tell that he is not yet totally comfortable doing so. He gives me these looks sometimes, when he's showing me something or asking me something, like he's waiting for the moment when it all becomes too much and I explode. I refuse to disappoint him. I assume that all he needs to settle into our new normal is a little time. Hell, I need some time to adjust too. A few months ago, I was a single mother, doing everything on my own, 
completely unaware of the city's underbelly and the nefarious machinations of people like Gabriel Bellucci. Now I'm a part of it, and a part of a family, too. A family that will grow soon. I drop a hand to my belly and stroke it absently. Gabriel's eyes track the movement, and he sits up stiffly, brow creased. Is everything okay? He asks. It's fine, I reply with a light chuckle. You don't have to freak out every time I touch my belly. Gabriel frowns at me across the table, but I can see he's suppressing a smile. Harry, distressed at having his father's attention diverted, starts to chatter on about the cookies he and Clara made. Gabriel turns and joins the conversation with enthusiasm. I watch them for a while, happy just to see them interacting, without needing to be a part of it. I note their matching dimpled grins and the way Gabriel's eyes light up at the sound of Harry's laugh. We're going to be okay, I realize. More than okay. We're a family again. And this time, I won't let anything change that. My receptionist, Laura, buzzes my phone just as the sun is beginning to set, painting the skyline in swaths of cobalt blue. Miss Wright, she says. Debbie Harris is here to see you. Crikey. I nearly forgot about the interview. I reach over and press the buzzer. Let her in, I say, heart picking up. I try to calm it. There's nothing to be worried about. It's just Debbie, after all. Our respective roles have changed dramatically since I handed in my last assignment two weeks ago, but it's still just Debbie. My former boss waltzes through the door a moment later, looking resplendent in a deep raspberry pantsuit. Possibly one of her finest. Her blonde hair is perfectly quaffed around her cheeks, and her eyes are lined in ink black. She purses her magenta-colored lips when I stand to greet her, evaluating the office. He's got you as his trained pet now, she observes. My smile wavers only a little. Please sit. I wave a hand at the chair opposite my desk and sit back down myself. In regards to your comment, I say, brushing my hair back, I am nobody's trained pet. Debbie pulls out a pad and a pen. Sure thing, hen. I rankle at her obvious contempt. But Debbie has never liked Gabriel, considering that her brushes with organized crime have produced threats against her daughter's life. I suppose I can't blame her. Thank you for agreeing to this interview, she says quite formally. It's very difficult to arrange one with your man, and I'd rather talk to you anyway. I smile. No, thank you. It's been a whirlwind two weeks since I took over the charity wing of the company, and there are a lot of exciting projects in the pipeline that I can't wait to tell the world about. Yes, well, let's start with Gabriel's murder investigation, Debbie says matter-of-factly in her Scottish drawl. Everyone seems to have gotten over it quite quickly. But I, for one, want to know more about why the investigation has stalled. Can you comment? Her eyes lock on to mine, shining with accusation. Debbie Harris is no fool. She knows something had to have gone on behind the scenes, something potentially nefarious. But I won't ever admit it. I smile coolly. I'm afraid I know just about as much as you, Debbie, I shrug. As I understand it, this sort of thing happens all the time. It's just that Gabriel's is quite a high-profile case, so it got more attention. I don't get it, though, Debbie presses. Somebody wanted to put Gabriel away. And then, they didn't. What are you implying, Debbie? I laugh dismissively. You know me. I wouldn't be involved if I thought Gabriel was hurting people to stay out of jail. I'm convinced I know you less and less with every day. 
she replies primly, scribbling something down. Did he do it? I raise my eyebrows. Are you asking me if Gabriel killed his father? Or if he antagonized the investigation? Both, she smiles. No, to both. I mirror her smile. Gabriel loved his father. Fabrizio was a good man. The lies fall from my tongue so easily and so smoothly that I almost believe them myself. Debbie clicks her tongue, but I cut her off before she can ask another question. I'm keen to navigate this interview toward the charity's pursuits. Let me tell you about some of the projects I've been working on since I took over. I say, sitting forward. I'm sure your readers would like to know that Bellucci Incorporated is stronger than ever, and that we're investing that strength back into the community. I'm sure they would, Debbie mutters. But then she sighs, and I know she has given in. Debbie knows she isn't getting anything out of me. She knows that Gabriel and I are a united front, and she knows that if she wants anything from me, she will need to dance to the beat of my drum. I wonder if she knows how much I like it. Gabriel. I finish toweling off Harry and get him dressed in his cartoon spaceship onesie. I try not to glance at my watch too often, but Alexis has taken her sweet time getting ready, and I don't want us to be late. She knows how much punctuality matters to me, yet never fails to make me wait. You look grumpy, Harry comments, then does a very cute imitation of my scowl. You know what will make me happy, I ask, hoisting him into my arms. What? If I come home tonight and Clara tells me you've been a good boy, and that you went to bed without causing a riot, do you think you can do that? I don't know. He grins. I laugh and walk him down to the living room, where Clara is waiting to take over for the night. On the way, I pass Alexis's closed bedroom door and hear the hairdryer running. Is she actually that behind? Clara grins and jumps up from the couch when I enter with the little prince, her blonde curls springing. There he is. She grins and takes Harry from me, setting him onto the floor where she has a few of his toys set up on a blanket. Only healthy snacks, I tell her sternly. I don't care how much he begs for Funyuns. The little hellion is turning into his mother. Cross my heart and hope to die, she says, performing the action as well. What's with the mug? I cock a brow. Clara gestures to her face. You look like you've smelled something bad. Alexis is going to make us late again, I say with a sigh. Clara shakes her head, tutting. If she's taking too long, I guarantee you it will be worth it. Don't be an asshole. Don't call me an asshole, I say in a low voice. Clara laughs. She thus far has proven immune to my intimidation. That being said, I have been going very easy on her because of how much Alexis and Harry care about her. If she were anyone else, I would not tolerate even a fraction of her disrespect. If you don't want me to call you an asshole, don't be one. She levels me with a sugary smile. You've been better, but you've still got some work to do if you want the best friend's green light. Asshole, Harry mumbles from his seat on the blanket. Clara's eyes widen, and she swings her head around. Honey, no, we don't say that word. Now it's my turn to laugh. I don't give a rat's ass if the kid swears, but Clara and I both know that Alexis does, and if Alexis finds out that Clara has just taught him to say asshole, Clara will be in big trouble. Good luck with that, I say, saluting on my way out the door. I wait in the foyer for Alexis to come down tapping my foot impatiently. I am about to send one of my men to drag her out by force when she appears at the top of the curved stairs. Fuck, Clara was right. The wait was worth it. Alexis descends in a shimmering black gown that clings teasingly to her ample hips and bosom, 
The cowl neckline reveals just a little bit of cleavage, enough to make my mouth water. Her hair is twisted back in an elegant bun, leaving her swan-like neck and shoulders exposed. When my gaze lifts to her face, I find Alexis smirking at me. Her lips are ruby red and her eyes are dark, making the blue of her irises look electric. Alexis reaches the foyer and pauses. What are you doing? I ask. She blinks. I'm waiting for you to offer me your arm. Duh. Duh, I mock. But extend my arm for her anyway. She sticks a tongue out at me, and when she takes my arm, I wrench her close to my chest, squeezing her forearm. I glide my other hand around her waist and pull her in tight so that I can feel her breast squashed against me and the shape of her thighs through her dress. Alexis looks up, lips parted. Her pupils spill out into her irises. You look good enough to eat, I drawl, cocking my head to the side to examine her. Perhaps that's what we should do tonight instead. Leave the society cretins to their crudités and spend the night devouring each other instead. Her lips lift in a sensual smile. Promises, promises, Mr. Bellucci. Her hand tugs at my fingers and she backs out of my grasp. But you know that if we're not photographed together at this event, Carmen is going to have a conniption. I sigh. She's right. I just really don't want to go to this fucking thing. At least I will have Alexis there with me. I offer her my arm again. Come on, then. When she hesitates, I grin. I promise I won't bite. We glide across the dance floor, thousands of fairy lights twinkling overhead. As we circle past the back of the room, I see the serving staff pouring a bottle of champagne over a meticulously arranged champagne pyramid. Then we sail toward the stage, where a six-piece jazz band is crooning timeless favorites. It's not a bad ball, as far as balls are concerned. You want to know something funny? Alexis asks. I keep thinking how this feels refreshingly normal. Before I met you, this would have been the most insane thing I'd ever seen. I guide her away from an older couple who are swaying together closely in their own world. The woman's silver head rests on the man's shoulder, and he has his eyes closed as they sway to the beat of the music. I feel like an intruder for even glimpsing their intimate moment. Do you regret your new normal? I ask. Do you miss how vanilla things were before? Alexis presses her full lips together in thought. Then she gives a short shake of her head. I've never bothered much with regret, she says. I figure it's pointless to start now. I chuckle, and we continue dancing. I could dance with her all night. The gentle sway of the music, her soft scent filling the space between us, her eyes on mine, searching. We have fucked a few times since she came back to the mansion. This is the most intimate we've been in a long time. I open my mouth to say something, perhaps much less guarded than I normally would, but my gaze sticks on the couple who have just entered the dance floor behind Alexis. The man looks worn but not in the weathered way a stony cliff does after being beaten by the winds and rain for decades. Rather, he looks like a deflated balloon, droopy, wrinkled, and sad. The woman, on the other hand, is radiant. Her short blonde hair gleams in the low light, and her eyes sparkle bright blue from across the sea of bodies. I swear under my breath. What? Alexis asks. Kevin Lynch and Felicity Huffman. Alexis clicks a tongue. Well, shit. That isn't quite the reaction I anticipated from her. Felicity and Kevin cut through the crowd to arrive in front of us. She is wearing an attention-grabbing floor-length pink gown. Kevin's tux is pressed and neat, yet he seems unkempt somehow. There is a shadow of gray stubble on his cheeks, and his eyes, that bright Walsh green, look dim and distant. He doesn't want to be here. 
Well, hello, Felicity purrs. I was hoping I would catch you here. I grit my teeth and the hand on Alexis's hip tightens. I'm not in the mood, Felicity. Alexis turns and stands at my side, giving my hand a reassuring squeeze as she does. Ah, I do apologize, Felicity's eyes flash. I should have been more clear. I was actually speaking to Alexis. I don't believe we've met, Alexis bites out in a falsely cheery tone. I think you know who we are, Felicity says. For the purposes of this ball, however, you may refer to us as Rusty and Felicia Noble. <laughs> Felicia, Alexis snorts. That's not very creative. Felicity's smile slips only a fraction, her eyes narrow. If I were you, I wouldn't be so keen to encourage me to get creative. As dear Rusty here can testify, the results of my creativity can be somewhat shocking. Kevin smiles, but it's more like a grimace. He is a shadow of a man, and that's how Felicity works. I remember my father, how he used to smile and laugh before Felicity came into his life. He was never a particularly nice character, but he wasn't openly cruel until she came along. By the end, he was a snarling beast. We're just here to have a nice night, Alexis says smoothly. Why don't we leave you to whatever weird role-play thing you've got going on? Felicity's forehead wrinkles, but she doesn't frown. She never frowns. Felicity's defining feature is her sunny smile, which to the undiscerning eye looks friendly and warm. When you know Felicity, though, you know that her Cheshire cat grin is merely the guise behind which she hides any number of horrors. My dear, does it not bother you that the man who fucks you every night is the same man who put a bullet between your father's eyes? Felicity asks. Alexis stiffens. That's none of your business. I want to warn Alexis not to take the bait, but it all happens so fast. Someone's a little touchy about daddy, Felicity drawls. I think it's time for you to leave, Alexis snarls. I don't think I will, Felicity leans against Kevin. I'm surprised his hollow bones can take her weight. How is Clara? I miss the little junkie. I can feel the anger radiating from Alexis, hot and volatile. Don't you fucking dare talk about Clara, she spits, the volume of her voice rising with every word. You're lucky I don't rip you from limb to limb right here. I would like to see you try, little girl. You're nothing without Gabriel to hide behind. If you think that, then you must be truly stupid. Alexis is nearly shouting now, and the altercation has attracted some curious onlookers. Shit. Alexis, come on. I grab her arm, but Alexis wrenches herself free. No! She booms. Not before I give this bitch a taste of her own medicine. I'm so scared, Felicity mocks. Alexis lurches forward, but I snake an arm around her waist and drag her back, hissing in her ear. Calm down. You're making a fucking scene. Alexis wriggles in my grasp at first, but soon stops and looks around, blinking. Cameras flash from every corner of the room. She pales. Come on, I whisper, guiding her outside. I call David and tell him to be waiting out front. That heinous bitch, Alexis mutters, stomping down the front steps. Who the fuck does she think she is? I don't say anything. I'm caught between wanting to yell at Alexis and wanting to push her up against the wall and kiss her. I'm impressed by how well she held her own and how far she was willing to go to put Felicity in a place. I have no doubt that Alexis would have torn the older woman apart in a fight. Felicity talks a big game, 
but she always gets someone else to do the heavy lifting for her. But tonight was not the time or the place. The whole point of us going to this event was so we could be photographed together as a happy couple. I'm surprised Carmen isn't calling me already to read out a list of damages. The town car pulls up and I open the door for Alexis. She and the dark cloud over her head get inside and I follow. David starts to drive. What the fuck was that? I ask. Alexis looks over at me, frowning. What do you mean? She disrespected me. She disrespected both of us. I scrub a hand through my hair and shake my head. You shouldn't have risen to the bait. Now I'm going to have to clean up your mess. Alexis gasps. Uh, you're one to talk. You're constantly getting into some sort of trouble with the press. How dare you? But I kept my composure, I snap. If I could keep my shit together, so could you. The point is that I'm trying very hard not to get in trouble with the press. And if I have to start worrying about how you'll react in public, I'm fucked. She brought up my father and Clara in the same conversation, Alexis argues. What was I supposed to do? You were supposed to walk away, I bite out. You're a mafioso's woman now. You need to be made of sturdier stuff than that, Alexis. People are going to test you. Felicity just did, and you failed massively. Alexis huffs and crosses her arms, looking out the window, muttering something under her breath. What was that? I ask. She spins to face me, snarling. I said, maybe I don't want to be a mafioso's woman. Her words sting more than I would have anticipated. They are just another reminder that although she is back in my life, things are not the same as they used to be. Perhaps they never will be again. Both of us stare out the window for the rest of the drive home. Alexis I type away on my laptop, listening to the distant traffic sounds that whisper through the window from the street far below. My eye strays to the folded newspaper on the corner of my desk, but I force myself to look back at my screen. It wouldn't do any good to read it again. Plus, I have a load of work to do. I keep typing, keep glancing. Finally, I give in with a sigh and slide the newspaper in front of me, opening to the picture of the gorgeous, angry girl in the black dress. A tale of two tempers, it reads. I'm so annoyed that the press has used my spectacle from two days ago as a way to remind the public of Gabriel's previous outbursts that I can't even enjoy the Dickens reference. The article makes it seem like I freaked out over nothing, which I suppose is how it would have appeared to an outsider. It's not like I can set them straight either. I groan and ball up the paper, tossing it in the recycling bin a few feet away. I miss, I swear. My receptionist buzzes before I can get up to retrieve the paper, announcing that Clara has arrived. I tell her to let Clara in and try to grasp some semblance of calm before my best friend enters. Clara comes in a second later, wearing a gray blazer and a matching pencil skirt. I'm still not used to seeing her in business attire, though she has been doing odd jobs for me over the past couple of weeks. She is smiling, but it slips down her cheeks when she clocks my grim expression. What is it? Clara asks. She glances over and sees the balled-up newspaper, then walks over to pick it up. She unravels it and frowns. You're not still beating yourself up about this, are you? Clara asks. I'll be fine. I wave away her concerns. Sit down. You wanted to run an idea past me? Clara sits and slides the folder over the desk. I've had the finance team draw up some figures for expanding a few of the ad hoc treatment centers, she says. It just needs your approval. I look over the paperwork, impressed by Clara's thorough report. That's easy enough, 
I say. Approved. Clara grins and takes the folder back. That's great. I clear my throat. I actually had something I wanted to talk to you about as well. Clara's smile dips, and she cocks a brow. Whatever it is, I'm here for you. Not for the first time. I find myself eternally grateful for my best friend's support. I can always count on her. I had this idea, I say. It's a bit risky, but I think it could work. Ever since my confrontation with Felicity Huffman at the gala, I've been racking my brain for ways to dethrone her. The cartel are a powerful force in the city, but they haven't always been, and they can't be forever. It's up to Gabriel and me to push them out, and I think I might have devised a way to do just that. Purple heroin is overwhelming the city, but after my article was published, there was a brief blip where trade stalled. Back then, I only knew half the story, but now I know all of it. I want to try again, see if we can bring it to a full-on halt. Clara nods slowly. But how would we do that? Obviously, I have access to a lot of funds at the moment, and I also have strong journalism connections, I tell her. I was thinking we could hire a team of reporters to investigate all angles of the operation, like I've been doing with my blog, but more in depth. If we paint their names and pictures all over the news, we'll be giving the police a lot more to work with and making it a lot more difficult for them to function. Clara grins. Let's do it. You don't have any follow-up questions? I ask, chuckling. This could be quite risky. She shakes her head. It doesn't matter. I'll do anything to bring the cartel down. Okay, I say, opening up the file on my computer, where I've been keeping all my notes. Let's begin. It's late when I finish work. I spend most of the day coordinating the first steps in my plan of attack, and by the time I haul my ass down to the car waiting in front of the building, I am exhausted. It feels strange to think I haven't seen Harry since I left the mansion this morning. I miss him like crazy. When I arrive back at the mansion, I take a quick detour to the kitchen to shove some bread and cheese in my face before walking up the stairs to the second floor. I poke my head in Harry's nursery, but he isn't there. I journey down the hall to Gabriel's office and rap on the door. Come in, he calls. I walk in to find Gabriel sitting in his tall leather chair, with Harry balanced on his knee, and a picture book open in his free hand. The pair of them look up when I enter, and Harry squeals happily. Mama! Hey, baby! I greet, walking around the desk. I pull him into my arms. Look at you two, reading together. I was getting him ready for bed. Gabriel says, setting the book down. You're home late. It's a statement, though there's a hint of a question buried within it. Gabriel is uncomfortable with this role reversal, however temporary it may be. I bounce Harry around the room. I was working on something, I say. Gabriel lifts one dark brow and leans back in his chair, urging me to continue. He looks more relaxed than I am used to, in just a plain white t-shirt and sweatpants, rather than his usual full suit. The cotton clings to the muscles of his chest, and I have to rip my eyes away while I decide the best way to phrase what I am about to say. I've started a new initiative, I say finally. Something that I think could help take down the cartel. Gabriel sits straighter, his mouth tightening. What have you done? Nothing yet, I reply. I only just started today. I'm going to hire a team of reporters to expose them, like I did in my article, but on a grander scale. Gabriel rises from his chair and leans against the front of his desk, scowling. You should have talked to me, he says, irritation threading through his words. 
You can't just start making plays on your own. That's not how it works. You might have interfered with a plan I already had in motion, or one I intended to set into motion soon. You could have really screwed things up. If you were putting a plan into motion, shouldn't you tell me? I thought we were going to be partners in this, I say haughtily. No. He stops to face me, dark eyes boring into mine. I am still the boss. Do not mistake my indulgences for testaments of your autonomy. I bristle a little at this, but what did I expect? There is a reason he is in charge. Did I think that just because we have a child together, he was going to hand me the mantle and tell me to do as I please? That being said, I get that, but I still think I deserve a little leeway, I reply. With a sigh, I add, I'm trying, Gabriel. I know, he shakes his head. Take Harry to bed, I have work to do. And with that, I'm dismissed. I'm feeling chastened enough not to argue further with him, so I go to the door and hope Harry doesn't complain about not finishing his book once we get to the nursery. Alexis, Gabriel says as I pull on the handle. I pause and look over my shoulder at him. It's a good idea, he says, folding his arms over his chest. But make sure you ask me next time. I nod and leave, heart skipping with victorious joy. I awake slowly in the middle of the night. At first, I'm not sure why I'm awake, as I'm still wrapped cozily in my comforter, darkness lying heavily over me. I smell sandalwood and earth, and then I feel something silken tighten on my wrist. I blink my eyes open just as Gabriel leans over me and pulls my bound wrist toward my other wrist, where, in a moment, he will bind them together, and I will be completely at his mercy. My heart kicks up into overdrive, and before I even have a chance to think, I wrap one leg around his waist and heave all my weight onto my side. Gabriel is not expecting this and the benefit of surprise allows me to roll him onto his back. He reaches up to grab me, and I slam my hands over his wrists, pinning him to the bed. I doubt I could keep him there if he really wanted to escape, so I'm surprised that he doesn't shake me off. What are you doing? I ask. What do you think I'm doing, Tiger? Gabriel asks in a thick voice. I sit up, straddling his waist and loosen the cord on my wrist. I think that you're trying to feel like a big man again after being forced to concede that I know what I'm doing earlier. Before he can reply, I lash the cord around one of his wrists and start to tie it. Gabriel laughs, a deep, throaty sound that makes my stomach flutter. Do you think my ego is so fragile? I am amazed that I've managed to tie the cord around his wrists, and I quickly lean over to secure it to the headboard. His free hand cups my ass, squeezing indulgently. Maybe, I say breathlessly. Why else would you try to tie me to the bed while I'm asleep? You clearly had it in your head to teach me a lesson. I finish, and one of his arms is now lifted over his head, bicep bulging. He's shirtless, and the sight of his muscles rippling with every breath is nearly enough to distract me from the task at hand. I feel around on the bed for another cord to do the other wrist, and my fingers close on it. Oh, Alexis, he says. When will you learn? Gabriel jerks his bound arm, and the headboard splinters where he was tied to it, before I know what is happening, Gabriel has swept me onto my back, with one hand holding my wrists in a tight grip above my head, while the other snakes under my shirt to find my bare breasts. I don't need to tie you up to teach you a lesson, he says in a gravelly voice. 
And I certainly don't need to do so to prove that I'm the one in charge. His hand slides over my ribcage, toward the waistband of my pajama shorts. I don't know why, but while my body is absolutely thrilled with the turn my night has taken, my mind is furious. Whether he says so or not, Gabriel's ego feels threatened. Without warning, I twist my hips and jam my knees into his solar plexus. Gabriel wheezes and loosens the hold on my wrists, giving me the opportunity to slip out of his grasp and roll toward the edge of the bed. Get back here, he growls, grabbing my shoulder. And God damn it if I don't nearly listen. But he's not the only one with something to prove. I kick back at him and then tumble forward onto the carpet, landing on my stomach with an oof. Before I have a chance to get onto my feet, however, Gabriel swings over the side of the bed and straddles me. He wrenches my arms behind my back and holds them there, leaning over to whisper into my ear. Where are you going, Tyga? I struggle, but he's got me well and truly beat in this position. My heart races, my blood sings, as lust and frustration mingle together in a heady mixture. All I want to do is give in to my animal side, gnash my teeth at him and roar. Anywhere but here, I hiss. He laughs, and his breath tickles my ear. We've been over this, Alexis. You're mine, and that means you're not going anywhere. I feel him, hard and wanting against my ass. My sex throbs with the need of him. I'm just like all those purple heroin addicts who shake between doses of their deadly medicine, except my fix is the sweet surrender of giving myself to Gabriel. Gabriel slides down until he is resting on my thighs instead. He snakes his free hand between my legs and rubs his fingers against my mound. I let out a whimper without meaning to. That's a good girl, he says huskily. The sound of his voice is like a feather down my spine. I bet you're wet already, aren't you? I am, but I'm not giving in that easy. Maybe it's time for me to teach Gabriel a lesson. Why don't you roll me over and find out? I ask in a sultry voice. Gabriel flips me on my back without hesitation, grinding his knee between my legs and letting his mouth hover over mine. I can feel his breath on my lips, and I long to kiss him. My hands come to rest against his hard chest. The grooves of his muscles are smooth under my fingertips. I trace lazy circles into his skin with my fingers, lightly scraping against him with my nails. He lets out a low moan and closes the gap between us. He kisses me softly, his hand gliding slowly over my belly, as though he has already forgotten the game. I guess it's time for a reminder. I dig my nails into his chest and claw down. Gabriel roars with pain, and I slam my hands against his ribs, pushing him off me, then roll onto my knees and start a mad dash for the door. I am just staggering to my feet when I feel his fingers close on my ankle. He yanks me back, and I fall on my face, fingers digging into the carpet as he drags me back. That hurt, Gabriel growls. That was the point, I snap back at him. Gabriel twists me onto my back and closes one hand over my throat, squeezing just enough to allow only the barest amount of air through. I pull at his arm with both hands, but he's too strong. Adrenaline is coursing through my blood in a way it never has before during sex. The fight or flight compulsion makes me squirm and kick, but I am so turned on that it only takes him guiding his hand into my shorts for me to seize up completely. Gabriel roughly shoves two fingers inside of me, and that's nearly enough to make me come right then and there. I let out a choked groan. 
Fuck, you're wet, he says approvingly. What are you trying to prove, Tiger? That you're a tough girl. He twists his fingers and starts to apply pressure to my clit with his thumb. I see stars. Do you want to show me how rough you can be? That you can give as good as you get? He drives deeper inside of me. My eyes roll to the back of my head, and I can only respond with a guttural moan. I've been taking it easy on you so far, but if it's rough you want, then it's rough you'll get. He rips down my pajama bottoms, and I feel my tummy flutter in anticipation. I muster my strength and croak out. Is that supposed to scare me? Gabriel sits back, hauling me up by my throat and wrapping my legs around his waist. He pulls down his boxers and impales me on his cock. I cry out, and I'm not sure whether it's more the pain of his rough handling or the sheer ecstasy of him burying his cock inside of me. Gabriel's hand slides from my throat to the back of my neck, and he drags me forward for a rough, demanding kiss. I kiss him back greedily, and I submit. Endorphins flood my system when I do, and it only takes Gabriel a couple of thrusts before I come apart completely. My body shakes, and I moan helplessly against his mouth. Fuck, he groans, both hands dropping to my hips. Gabriel bites my lips and holds it between his teeth while he lifts me up and down on his cock. His fingers dig into the flesh of my hips, and I am sure they will leave marks. I really hope so. I am utterly at his mercy, and it's everything I can do to hang on to his shoulders while he gives me the rough treatment I so desire. There is something divinely cathartic about our animalistic fucking. It feels like we kicked our pretense out the door in the same shove as all romance. We kept only the raw passion, the need. Gabriel's teeth grit with the effort of bouncing me on his cock, and his forehead glistens with sweat. My eyes have adjusted to the dim light, and I admire his stone-cut features, the long, straight nose, the deep black eyes. He is so beautiful, and at this moment looks so ferocious that it nearly takes my breath away. And then he swiftly deposits me onto the floor on my stomach, hikes my hips up, and buries inside of me again. And that really does take my breath away. Our ragged breaths and the smacking sound of his hips hitting my ass fill the room. Gabriel grunts and groans, furiously hammering away behind me. I feel my body quiver and tense on the inside, feel pressure build in my belly, and I realize I'm going to come again. I let out a guttural cry as the orgasm hits me full force. Starbursts explode in front of my eyes, and electricity skitters over my skin. Gabriel swears and slams into me one last time, and I feel him pulse deliciously inside of me. He rubs his hand over my back, gentler than I would have expected, and then wraps an arm under my belly and pulls me back against him. My body is limp at this point. I feel like a wrung out sponge, and I let Gabriel pull me back into his embrace, even though I'm not sure if I'm still mad at him. What was I mad at him for? Or was he mad at me? I don't know. It hardly seems to matter now. The room is perfectly quiet, perfectly still. Gabriel. Silvano arrives at the mansion at 9 a.m. on the dot. He is always punctual, which is something I appreciate about him. It almost offsets his overall awkwardness. He brings two cups of coffee with him up to my office, which I also appreciate. I was up late last night with Alexis, so my fatigue is my own fault. But I'm in a bad mood already because of it. If I struggled to keep my hands off her before, it's worse now that we've struck up an alliance. 
Something about a full acceptance and cooperation in my business has removed that last thread of hesitation between us, and we've been at it like animals. Good morning, Silvano says, setting the steaming mug down in front of me. Victoria does make a good cup of coffee, doesn't she? She's very good at her job. I gesture impatiently for him to sit. We have a lot to talk about, Silvano. Let's not waste time making small talk. Silvano must be getting used to me because he sits, but his smile doesn't budge, despite my reprimand. His gray eyes assess me from across the desk, and I notice a dusting of dark stubble on his cheeks. Did you not have time for a shave this morning? I ask, sipping my coffee. Silvano chuckles and strokes his chin. I thought I'd try a beard, he explains. I always admired Vito's. <laughs> Why? I scoff. My best friend's beard was heinous. It was probably the worst decision he ever made, besides getting on the boat with me the day he lost his life. Silvano cocks a brow. No time for coffee talk, but now you want to chat about my personal grooming. I narrow my eyes and frown. Fair. Silvano clears his throat and lifts his briefcase onto his lap. He pulls out a selection of newspapers and magazines and sets them into two piles on the desk. Resting his hand on the left pile, he says, These are the past week's mentions of you and Alexis. He moves his hand to the right pile. And these are all to do with the cartel and the Irish. Can you summarize them? I ask, swiping a couple publications off the pile on the left. In general, the public thinks you and Alexis are a beautiful couple. There have been a few mentions of your respective anger issues, but the consensus seems to be that because you're both fiery, you're well-suited. One of the magazines speculates that's why you were never seen with a woman before Alexis. They were all too docile. Not untrue. I say with a shrug. As for the cartel, he wrinkles his nose, as though the words he is about to say taste vile. It's exactly what you would expect. Shootings, stabbings, rapes. Sometimes the crimes are credited to the gangs, but I threw in everything that looks to me like it's cartel-related, even if the police don't think it is. They're getting bolder. I say grimly. Silvano nods. They're settling in. They've brought over a load more men from Colombia in recent weeks, and their pack mentality has become vicious. I've even heard a couple reports of members of the cartel turning on their Irish counterparts. That is never a good sign. Then again, if there's bad blood brewing between the two groups, we might be able to use it to our advantage. Right, I say. I want to find some lower downs in the Irish community. These need to be guys who know things, but who have probably also been shit on by the cartel. We have to find Kevin Lynch as a matter of priority. The city isn't safe. It's the most volatile it's been in years, and right now, I am the only one who can do a damn thing about it. Silvano's lip tugs slightly. He is uncomfortable. I sigh. Fucking hell. What now? I think you should take a step back, Gabriel, he says, somewhat awkwardly. The murder charges are still waiting for you, and if the cops or the public find out you're involved in any of this, it could bring down our whole organization. You've been putting on a public front with Alexis, which is great for Bellucci Incorporated, but it means you're much more recognizable now. I'm not going to start hiding like one of those waltz pieces of shit, I growl. Silvano lifts his palms up. I'm not saying you need to hide. What I'm saying is you need to be more discreet. I am discreet. You killed two men on the street a few days ago, he snaps back, and I can sense his irritation. They raped that woman, I reply. They needed to die. 
I remember my men bringing her to me, bawling her eyes out. They found her down an alleyway behind a bar, where the cartel members we'd tailed there had gone back inside for another drink after they'd finished with her. I would kill him over and over again if I could. I agree. But anybody could have seen you there, Gabriel. You need to be more careful. He does have a point, though I am loath to admit it. I grind my teeth as we stare at each other, neither willing to look away. I will be the first to admit I underestimate Silvano sometimes. I will think about it, I say. Good. Silvano smiles tightly. How are things with Alexis? Better, I reply. I find that I actually trust her now, which I never thought would be possible, though there have been a couple of bumps. I am referring mostly to a week ago, when she greenlit a plan to start investigating the cartel more aggressively using her journalism resources, without consulting me first. Silvano nods thoughtfully. That's good. The more united of a front you can present, the better. I go out after my meeting with Silvano to take care of some business and return in the afternoon. I am tired and hungry, and I head directly for the kitchen. On my way, I pass the living room, and from inside, I can hear Harry's happy gurgles and Alexis's coos of encouragement. I can't resist the urge to look in on them. Alexis is sitting on the floor by the closet bookshelf, with Harry sitting across from her. They are stacking blocks between them. Harry likes this game. He always wants to make the tallest tower. Then he likes to knock it down. Look! Alexis points to me. It's Daddy! Harry turns around, grinning at me, and I watch as Alexis snatches a few blocks from the tower and stashes them beside her. She winks conspiratorially at me. What are you two up to? I ask, coming to squat at Harry's level. I run my hand over his feathery soft hair. Creating, destroying, Alexis answers. Playing God. I chuckle. <laughs> I see. My eyes land on a stack of files next to her, and I frown. They look like files from my office. Alexis's gaze follows mine. What are those, I ask. She shrugs and hands the files over. A little light reading. I open the one on top, and I'm horrified to see that these files look like they came from my office, because they did. Skimming through each of them, I realize Alexis has pulled a large cross-section of documentation, spanning everything from legitimate business licenses to cooked books and protection contracts. Have you read them? I ask, trying to keep calm, despite the rage flooding my veins. It was only this morning that I told Silvano that I felt I could finally trust Alexis again. Is this going to be our relationship going forward? I trust her. She breaks that trust. Rinse. Repeat. Not yet, she says. I was going to put Harry in his playpen after he demolished the tower and then start to go through them. I lick my lips, staring hard at her. I am so angry that I want to scream, but I can't do that in front of Harry. I have to keep calm. How did you get these, I ask, lifting Harry into my arms and walking over to the playpen. Tower, he says, pointing to the rickety pile of blocks after I set him down. We'll build you a new one later, I say, forcing a warm smile. Now, time to deal with Alexis. I walk over and sit down in front of her, waiting for her to explain. She shrugs. I snuck in as you were leaving this morning, she says, as though it is the most reasonable thing in the world. Then, her eyes match the intensity in mine. I told you that if I am going to be part of this, I am going to be part of it. That means going through the looking glass and seeing it all firsthand. 
I swallow, gazing down at the manila folders spread on the carpet between us. This is exactly what I would expect of her, but I'm hesitant to let her see anything. What if it's all too much? I tap a finger on one of the files. You might not like what you find, I tell her. I don't think you understand the level of violence in my world. It's our world now, she snaps. And I do understand. I've been following the cartel's atrocities for months now, and nothing you do could be worse than those monsters. As far as I'm concerned, violence is the only language they understand, and thus, the only one we should be speaking with them. Her eyes have gone cold, her lips flat. She means business. The air between us seems to drop a few degrees. If any of this gets leaked, you know what I will have to do, I warn, because I really cannot abide another betrayal from her. My men would lose faith in me if I did. It would break me to hurt her, but the punishment would befit the crime. She holds my fate in the palm of her hand now. If she crushes it, I must crush her back. Don't you dare threaten me, she hisses. I've told you. I'm in this with you. We are a team. But more than that, we are a family. I'm impressed, albeit a little surprised. When I first met Alexis, she wanted to change the world. She wanted to help people, to find the good among the bad. She would never have dreamed of becoming a Mafia Don's woman, but never have been able to accept that kind of darkness into her life. What has happened to her? I can't say that I mind, and to me, she has never been sexier. But I wonder if, perhaps, she would have been happier if we'd never met. If she had stayed naive to the monsters lurking in the dark. Because of me, she has been kidnapped, tortured, and has learned horrible truths about her father, a man she once idolized. But she is mine now, and that's all that matters. I lean over and kiss Alexis hard. Alexis I stand with my hands on my hips, staring at the mound of packages on the couch in my office. I need a better system for this. Last week, I initiated an appeal for gifts and letters of support to provide to the addicts in our treatment centers. And from the looks of it, the initiative has been quite successful. There must be a couple dozen packages and even more letters spilling onto the floor. Before I hand over the task of opening, reading, and distributing the letters and packages, I want to see the kinds of things people are sending. I asked for homemade gifts, if possible, things that were personal, that might reach someone from beyond the veil of addiction. I start with a package on the top of the heap. Inside is a knitted blanket and a note. This too shall pass. I like that. Simple, effective. This is going to make someone stay. I set it to the side and open up a few more packages, revealing a clumsy but cute clay mug, a pair of pink pajamas, and a framed photograph of a Hawaiian beach scene. Happy enough with that, I move on to some of the letters. Oddly, a few of them are addressed specifically to Gabriel, Though the senders have used the P.O. box I specified in the advertisement, I don't think anything of it and start opening letters. The first couple are lovely. Messages of support, personal anecdotes, kind words. Exactly the kind of thing I was looking for. Then I get to one of the envelopes that has been addressed to Gabriel, I am confused to find that the letter has been written to Gabriel personally. The more I read through, the more my confusion gives way to fury. It's fan mail for Gabriel. But it's far from the sort of innocent fan mail a pop star might receive from an obsessed teen. The letter is filthy. The woman who wrote it promises to love Gabriel forever, even if he is guilty. 
and there's a strong suggestion that it might be even sexier if he was. I snatch another of the letters with Gabriel's name from the pile and open it. More fan mail. I start going through all the letters, horrified that apparently Gabriel's crimes have garnered him the same kind of fan base enjoyed by psychopaths like Charles Manson. These women all offered a wait for him. They would do anything for him to write back. They adore him. Who are these bitches? And don't they know that he's mine? Somebody should tell them. I storm over to my desk and whip out a pad of paper and a pen. I set the tip of the pen to the page. And suddenly, I feel ridiculous. Am I actually going to respond to some pathetic fan mail? That's crazy. These women don't stand a chance with him. There's no need for me to feel jealous. So why am I so protective? Because he's mine, a small voice hisses in my mind. And because anyone who has the audacity to think otherwise needs to be shown the error of their ways. I shake my head and clear it of those poisonous thoughts. Just then, my receptionist buzzes me. Yes, I answer, grateful for the distraction. Um, I have a Ruby Flint here to see you, Laura says uncertainly. She doesn't have an appointment. Ruby Flint, fuck. Whatever it is that the lead detective on Gabriel's case wants to say to me, I know it can't be good. Yeah, let her in, I say, and sit straight in my chair as I wait for her to enter. Laura shows Ruby in and leaves us, closing the door. Ruby is a pretty woman of around 40, with auburn hair and arguably severe features. When she looks at me, it feels as though needle points dig into my skin. I don't know what her deal is, and not knowing bothers me. I don't think she's in her job because she likes to help people, nor do I think she particularly cares about serving justice to those who deserve it. She is in this for something else. I just don't know what. Lovely to see you, Ms. Flint, I greet, gesturing for her to sit. I am pretending that her showing up here hasn't rattled me, but it has. And I'm afraid she sees it. Lovely to see you, too. Ruby replies in a falsely cheery tone. She points to the stack of packages and letters as she walks across the room. All your adoring fans? They're for the rehabilitation program, I reply. A lot of the addicts we take in don't have anyone else. It can be hard to want to change if there's nothing grounding you. So I thought it might help to show them that there are people who support them. Ruby's eyes lift in surprise. How very thoughtful of you. The way she says it is demeaning, like she thinks I am doing the absolute bare minimum. I try not to let it bother me. I have to be stronger than this. After our last chat, you left such a strong impression that I looked into you, Ruby says airily. By our last chat, she is referring to the moment when I cornered her just outside of the police department and warned her not to continue looking into Gabriel's case. I'd been talking about the investigation with one of my old colleagues at the union, who mentioned that he'd once seen Ruby at a sex club he'd infiltrated for an article, and she was there with someone other than her husband. It seemed like too good of an opportunity to pass up. It was a rash move on my part, considering I actually had nothing concrete with which to blackmail her. But I was desperate to do anything I could to help clean up the mess I'd made. I have to be careful not to acknowledge any wrongdoing on my part. She might be recording me. Oh, yes, I say. And what did you find? Your article on the purple heroin crisis was the first result to come up in the search, of course, Ruby replies. I was surprised. I remember the article coming out and how much of a stir it caused. 
but I didn't realize it was written by Gabriel Bellucci's girlfriend. That's because I'm not just Gabriel Bellucci's girlfriend, I reply, baring my teeth in what could barely be considered a smile. I'm a journalist, I'm a businesswoman, and I'm a force to be reckoned with. This is as much as I dare threaten her right now. I hope it's clear enough. I'm sure you are. She simpers condescendingly. Looking around at my office, she nods. I can really see how far you've gotten in the world on your own merits. I mean, look at the view from here. All those people you get to look down on from the top of your boyfriend's office building. I want to punch her. Her cheekbones are so sharp that it looks like they might cut me if I did, but it would be so worth it. You're not just all those things, though, are you? Ruby continues. You're also a mother. But more importantly, you're a daughter. Her lips curl, and I already know whatever venom she is about to spit, it will make me furious. What do you think the great Harry Wright would think if he could see you now? Ruby taunts. Doing your boyfriend's dirty work making pathetic threats, tossing away all your morals for the sake of a man. My blood boils. I clench my hands into fists, feeling my nails dig into the meat of my palm. I focus on the pain, on the distraction. If I don't, I know I'll do something I regret. I don't know what you're talking about, I force myself to say. Ruby's eyes glint. Sure you don't. She stands. I nearly sigh with relief. She will be gone soon. But Ruby doesn't leave right away. She lifts up the framed photo of Harry on my desk and stares at it, smiling wistfully. It's a shame, really, she says with a sigh. You were a disappointment to your father, and now you're going to be a disappointment to your son, too. I explode, jolting to my feet. Listen, bitch, I snarl. I don't know who the fuck you think you are, but you might want to think for a second about who I am, what I can do. You ought to be careful what you say around me if you want to avoid any trouble. I freeze, horrified at what I've just said, but it's too late. Ruby smiles knowingly. It's been nice talking to you, Alexis. She saunters out of my office without so much as a backward glance. And only once she's gone do I sink back into my chair and release a long, frustrated groan. <sighs> what have I done? I was supposed to keep my cool. Gabriel would have. Fuck. I need to get ahead of this. I don't know yet what this is, but I need to be prepared for whatever Ruby has planned. She didn't come here today because she wanted a chat. I call around to a couple of the street reporters I have brought on board to look into the cartel. They are people I can trust. I am already paying them a lot, but I offer even more for them to look into Ruby Flint, too, and see what kind of dirt they can bring up. By the time I'm done, it's time for lunch, and I have to race out of my office to meet Gabriel in the lobby. The elevator doors open to him checking his watch, and he gives me an irritated look as I jog across the marble toward him. I'm sorry, I say. I got caught up. He sighs, but threads his hand through mine. It's fine. You're the one who has to answer to Clara if we're late. On the way to the restaurant, I consider telling him about my run-in with Ruby. I know that I should. If she is planning something, the more Gabriel knows, the better. But I'm too embarrassed. I let her get to me today. And if I tell Gabriel that, it will undermine all the work I have been doing to make him trust me. To make him view me as his equal. He needs to think I'm stone cold and tough. And I don't feel like that right now. We make it to the restaurant. And by then, I've missed my chance. Clara is waiting for us with Harry 
and I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk about something other than work. Clara fills us in on what she and Harry have been up to today. A long walk with her adoring security detail, and some baby yoga, whatever that is. And I can't believe how happy she seems. As well as helping me out from time to time, she has started working at the rehab centers again, and is planning to take on teaching a few yoga classes soon. My best friend is the most resilient person in the world. She amazes me every single day. I wonder if she would be disappointed in me too. Gabriel. I checked the magazine of my gun. Satisfied with the level of ammo, I slide it back into the grip and look over at Silvano. Are you ready? He nods. I look over my shoulder at Antonio and Dom, who are wedged in the back seat of the car. You guys good? They both nod. Let's go make some Irish stew, Dom says with a grin. We step out of the car and cross the street to O'Neill's. The Irish bar is a hot spot for Irish criminal activity, and on any given day you can walk in and find a member of Kevin Lynch's gang. Today, however, there were only two thugs we are interested in, and as I shove my gun into the back of my pants, the bloodthirsty part of me hopes that they make things difficult. Antonio kicks through the front door. The poor girl behind the bar screams, and the two men we followed here shoot up from their table, guns drawn. It's ten in the morning, and the only other patrons are a red-faced old man and a young tourist couple. Everyone get out, I roar. The tourists make a run for it, but the old man doesn't move. Dom ends up going to help him up, and as the two of them hobble toward the door, the Irish thugs keep their guns pointed on us, and we keep ours on them. You too, sweetheart, Antonio says to the bartender. And don't do anything stupid like call the police. We will try not to leave a mess. She won't call the police. She will call her boss, who will then call Kevin Lynch. But by the time he does something about it, we will be long gone. What the fuck do you want? The taller of the two Irishmen asks. He's bald, with a paunch sticking out over the top of his belt. The other is quite the opposite, still fairly tall, but beanpole skinny. They're both lower downs. We followed them back here from a handoff with the cartel. They have two guns on us, and we have two guns on them, and the air between us is thick with tension. We just have a couple of questions for you, I reply breezily. Why don't you take a seat? Neither of them does. I watch a bead of sweat roll down the fat one's forehead. Dom comes back adding a third gun on our side of the equation, and this only makes them both more nervous. We won't hurt you, unless we have to, Antonio says. We saw how things went down with the cartel earlier. It looks like you've taken enough punishment today. Both of their faces flush with embarrassment. Mine would do if my enemy had watched me get pistol-whipped by the cartel after presumably delivering less dough than usual. Why don't you sit, I repeat, pointing my gun at the table. The pair look at each other and then slump into their chairs, setting their guns on the table and pulling their beers back toward them. I shove my gun into the back of my pants as a gesture of goodwill and pull up a chair. Those cartel assholes made fools out of you today, I tell them. Neither one meets my eye. They know. I think we can help each other, I say. I want the cartel gone even more than you do, and I have the resources to achieve that goal. What I don't have, however, is the right kind of knowledge. We won't squeal, the bald one mumbles pathetically. I think that they will squeal. I really do. Of course not, I say in a common voice. I only need one thing from you. One small little thing. Then you can go back to your beer. What is it? Beanpole asks, lips tugged into a taut grimace. 
I just need to know where Kevin Lynch is, I say simply. That's all. Both of them shake their heads, and I hear Dom and Antonio cock their guns. I shoot them a warning glance. Listen, guys, I lean closer, as though we are all buddies. Kevin Lynch is a traitor to your organization. He has completely sold you out to Felicity Huffman and her goons. Do you really want to follow someone like him, who doesn't give a shit about you? I lean back, chuckling. Fuck. I remember only a few months ago, half of you committed treason just because you didn't like that Patrick Walsh was working with me. And now someone else is in complete control of everything you do, is beating the crap out of you whenever they feel like it, and you won't lift a finger to stop it? A light bulb clicks on behind the fat one's eyes. He glances over at Beanpole. Come on, Callum. What do we really have to lose? If they find out it was us, Callum growls. They won't, I assure. All you need to do is give me a location, and then I'll be out of here. I will never tell another soul where I got it from. A long moment passes, with the two of them deliberating silently over their pints. I can tell that Callum is the one that makes the decisions between the two of them, and his fat friend stares beseechingly across the table. I don't usually interrogate this way, so it irks me a little that neither of them seems particularly nervous about what I will do if they don't tell me. But we'll get to that. We don't know, Callum says finally. But we know someone who does know, Callum adds quickly, clearly noting my growing irritation. We can tell you where to find him. I suppose that will have to be good enough. I take down the information, and we leave the two in peace, as promised. I'm annoyed that we can't go straight after Kevin and Felicity, but at least this is a start. On our way out of the bar... Dom and Antonio shared their disgust with our informants' disloyalties. We didn't even threaten them, Dom says. They just gave it all away, easy as pie. I get into the car and shrug. You saw the treatment those cartel members gave them earlier. Loyalty is earned as far as I'm concerned, and Kevin Lynch has done nothing to earn it since taking over from his nephew. He isn't protecting his men. Their situation hits close to home for me. Years ago, when my father was under Felicity Huffman's sway, I did a very similar thing, and then I killed him. I get a call from Mateo at the guardhouse on the way back to the mansion. What is it? I answer. There is a woman here to see you, Mateo says. I don't like the way he says it. Who is she? I ask. Ruby Flint. I swear under my breath, and Antonio looks over at me from the driver's side. Ask her to meet me at the front of the house, but do not let her inside, I instruct. Very well. I hang up the phone and let my head fall back against the seat. What is it? Antonio asks. Hopefully nothing, I reply. But with Ruby Flint, it's never anything good. Ruby is waiting for me on the step of the portico when I arrive, with Silvano leaning on the front door as if to block her from entering. She sits pin straight, eyes scanning the area with interest. I don't like it. I don't like her being anywhere near my home or my family. I'm just glad I'm not covered in blood. I dismiss Antonio and Dom and get out of the car walking toward her with my hands shoved casually in my pockets. You have a lot of security, even for a billionaire, Ruby observes, hauling herself to a feet. And for some reason, none of them will offer me the scantest bit of hospitality. They made me wait outside, she gestures to Silvano, and apparently left me under the guard of a hobbit. On my orders, I tell her. Forgive me for not wanting to give you the chance to stick your nose where it doesn't belong. Ruby is a fierce-looking woman, 
Her large brown eyes glimmer like chunks of copper, thin lips pulled into a smile that's more like a grimace. Not a hair out of place from her auburn ponytail, and she wears a black, perfectly pressed pantsuit. You wound me, Gabriel, she remarks. But I suppose I didn't come here for a cup of coffee, so I can forgive the rude treatment. What did you come here for? I ask. I'm a busy man, and I don't remember being asked to come in for questioning. I usually like a man who's direct, but I think I'll make an exception in your case. She pulls out her phone and starts tapping the screen. First of all, I just want you to know that while your intimidation may have worked on some of my colleagues, it won't work on me. I'm not particularly cowed by any threat delivered by a pregnant woman. None of my men delivered any threats, I say. And I don't know what you mean about a pregnant woman, unless you're implying that you think Alexis threatened you, in which case, that's absolutely ridiculous. Don't play dumb, she chides. It doesn't look good on you. She starts to play a recording, and I hear Alexis's voice, thick with anger. Listen, bitch. I don't know who the fuck you think you are, but you might want to think for a second about who I am, what I can do. You ought to be careful what you say around me if you want to avoid any trouble. The recording finishes, and Ruby looks up at me with a small smile. That certainly sounds like a threat to me. The powerful timber of Alexis's voice, combined with the conviction of her words, sends a tingle down my spine. I always think of her as so soft and warm. A mother. A lover. I sometimes forget that there is a side to her that cuts like a jagged blade. I love that side of her. It's sexy and impressive. I hate it, too. It makes her unpredictable. That doesn't prove anything, I say casually, as though bored. Not to mention, there's no way that would be admissible in court. I know. Ruby shoves the phone back in a pocket. I just thought it was interesting, don't you? To think that such anger could pour out of your little girlfriend. A journalist turned charity organizer? I guess you never know what kinds of things are going on under the surface. She smiles. It makes me wonder what else there is to uncover. She walks past me, toward her car, and I clench my fists to avoid saying something I will regret. Silvano walks down the steps and comes to stand beside me as we watch her car trundle down the drive. He shakes his head. She'll keep coming after you unless we do something about her he says grimly. I know, I sigh. But what am I supposed to do? The only pressure point we could find from her was her daughter, since she clearly doesn't give a shit about her husband. I've got to admit, I just don't have that in me. I think about my own child and how much it would crush me if anything happened to him. I could threaten Ruby's child with no intention of following through, but something tells me that she would call my bluff. And as a mafia don, I cannot ever be caught bluffing. We will figure something out, Silvano says. We have a whole catalog of things we need to figure out, Silvano. I scrub my hand through my hair and watch as Ruby's taillights sink over the top of the hill in the distance. And I don't know where to fucking start. The godhouse calls ahead to let me know when Alexis arrives back from work that evening. I finish up the task I'm working on in my office and go look for her. I am so goddamn tired. Something about Ruby's visit today has amplified the nagging thought in the back of my head, telling me that the walls are about to come tumbling down. I made headway in the hunt for Felicity and Kevin today, but what if that was all part of Felicity's plan? What if I follow these threads directly into an ambush? What if Ruby does manage to get all the evidence she needs to put me away? Would that not be what I deserve? I'm far from innocent. I murdered my own father. 
Should I not be punished for that? I find Alexis in a nursery, bent over Harry's crib, and the very sight of them begins to calm my aching head. He is asleep, and she reaches in and strokes the curl of his dark hair from his forehead. Alexis, I say. She looks over her shoulder and purses her lips. I heard Ruby was here earlier, and I know what you're going to say. She begins. I should have kept my cool. I'm sorry. Just something about that woman brings out the worst in me, and I couldn't help myself. The bitch was taunting me. I walk over and wrap my arms around her, tucking her against my chest with my chin on her forehead. She is warm. The scent of jasmine coils through the air, and I suck in a deep breath. Alexis hesitantly puts her arms around me. Aren't you mad? I agree that you could have handled it better, but I've met the woman, and I know how difficult she can be. Besides, she played me the recording, and I have to say, I'm too proud to be upset. Alexis tips her head back and shoots me a quizzical expression. <laughs> proud? Proud, I repeat, smiling down at her. You refuse to be cowed by her. You stuck up for yourself, and what's more, you made it very clear that you weren't afraid of her. As I look down at her, I wonder, could Alexis and I really be partners? Is she really strong enough to carry a part of my burden, or will she crumble in the face of my demons? So far, she has proven herself, but we're a long way from there yet. If you liked that, you're going to like what else I did, Alexis says, leaning up on her tiptoes to peck my cheek. She pulls away and walks through the dividing door into her bedroom. I follow and find her sitting on the bed with her laptop open, tapping on the keys. I went ahead and had a few of the reporters I hired to look into the cartel do some digging into Ruby, Alexis explains and hands the laptop up to me. Turns out, our girl is deep in gambling debt. I grab the computer and read the documents open on the screen. Alexis's reporters have found bank statements, lines of credit with various casinos, and debt collection notices. I'm impressed. I glance at Alexis over the top of the laptop. You know this is all very illegal, right? Alexis bats her eyelashes. I don't know what you're talking about. I laugh and set the laptop onto the bed, then pull her up by her hands. Her coquettish grin lights up the room, and I take a mental photograph of how beautifully devious she looks. Grab the baby monitor, I instruct. Let's have dinner. Alexis sips the non-alcoholic champagne with a thoughtful expression. After she swallows, she nods slowly. I like it, she says. I mean, it's no Dom Perignon. I laugh. The more time you spend with me, the more snooty your taste seem to be getting. I would use the word refined, she argues. Besides... I wouldn't think that would be a problem for you. It's not. I think it's cute. Alexis narrows her eyes across the table. We are sitting outside on the patio, with the heater turned on to full blast against the assault of the crisp fall air. Alexis is wrapped in a cozy wool blanket, though it has slipped on one side to reveal a tantalizing sliver of bare shoulder. Don't call me cute. Alexis says, sitting straighter. I wouldn't want you to make the same mistake Ruby did in underestimating me. <laughs> I would never. I grin playfully. Speaking of which, I would love to hear your ideas on how to use the information you've gathered about our dear friend Ruby. Victoria comes through the French doors with our meals. Tonight is just a simple dinner of steak, fries, and salad. Alexis's eyes widen when she sees what's on the plates. She has been craving red meat nonstop recently. My little tiger. After Victoria sets the plates down and leaves, 
Alexis picks up a fork and steak knife and starts to carve into her meat. I think we should start with her biggest creditor, the Stardust Casino. They're a competitor of yours, aren't they? Bellucci Incorporated owns a few casinos in the state. They're invaluable when it comes to laundering money. Yes, I reply, taking a sip of my champagne. And presumably they're not the most squeaky clean in terms of ethics. Correct. Alexis chews, swallows, and continues. I think the easiest thing to do would be to make an arrangement with Stardust. They haven't been pursuing her very aggressively because she makes small payments, and they know she will continue to grow her debt. We can offer to silently pay the debt if they put pressure on her to throw the case. Ruby won't be able to trace it back to us, as we have no public involvement with Stardust, and the prospect of clearing her largest debt might just be enough to do the trick. We could go further than that, I propose. We could have them threaten to break something she'd rather remain intact if she doesn't clear the debt, either with cash or cooperation. Alexis makes a face and shakes a head. No, I don't like that. Ruby might be a bitch, but she's not a cartel member. She's a cop, and she's only doing her job. No violence. You were the one who threatened to fillet her if I go to jail, I point out. That was just a threat. Alexis appears genuinely affronted. You didn't think I was actually going to hurt her, did you? It's not about what I think, I tell her, cutting another chunk of steak. The knife glides through the meat like butter. You have a lot to learn about this life. If you're going to make a threat like that, you best be prepared to follow through. It only takes one failed bluff for your enemies to sense your weakness. I pop the steak into my mouth and chew. Alexis sets her fork and knife down, frowning. I'm not weak, she says. I never said you were. I just want you to keep in mind that this life isn't a game of make-believe, Alexis. At some point, you should expect that your hands will be covered in real blood and that it won't feel anything like what you could imagine. Are you prepared for that? She doesn't hesitate. I can accept it as long as they deserve it. We continue eating, watching each other from across the table. I like this side of her. I like the ferocity, the cunning, the ruthlessness. It makes me want to test her, though. I want to push all of her buttons, just to see what will happen. And who gets to decide if they deserve it, I ask. Alexis finishes chewing her mouth full and swallows. She takes her time, allowing the question to marinate in the air between us. I do, she says finally. Why should you make that decision, I press. Are you the ultimate arbiter of right and wrong? I'm my own moral arbiter, she replies. It's not a discussion of mutually shared ethics, but rather what my own conscience can bear. She speaks with confidence and authority, her chin lifted haughtily. I find her boldness undeniably arousing and I lick my lips as I watch her drink the last of her faux champagne. Victoria comes out to check on us and is pleased to see our empty plates. How was it? she asks. Delectable, I say, though my gaze is pinned to the cupid's bow of Alexis's lips. Can I bring you anything else? No. I drag my eyes to Victoria's. Please ensure that we are not disturbed for at least another half an hour. Victoria nods and leaves. Alexis cocks an inquisitive brow. What was that about? I stand up, draining the last of my champagne. I've had enough business and morality chat for the evening, I explain. I rather think I'm ready for a dessert. What's for dessert? Alexis's lips turn slightly at the corner, and her eyes hold mine. I walk over and offer her my hand. She takes it, and I lift her to her feet, 
sliding a hand around her waist. You are. I hoist Alexis onto the table, and her glass goes tumbling off. It shatters against the stone patio, and Alexis giggles. <laughs> Careful. I lean down, shaking my head, and whisper just before our lips meet. Never. The kiss is everything a good dessert should be. Sweet, rich, and utterly addictive. I devour her, bit by bit, our tongues and lips locked in a passionate dance. My hands move up her back under her shirt, and her skin is warm against my palm. She tosses the blanket off her shoulders, and it lands on the table behind her. I wedge my hips between her legs. My cock hardens more and more with every second, and I grind into her as I deepen the kiss. Alexis moans. Mm, someone might see us, she says. She is right that we are completely exposed out here. Anyone could walk past the French doors and see us locked in our amorous embrace. Likewise, if one of the gods were to walk through the garden on his rounds. But I'm not worried. Victoria has worked for me long enough that she knows if I say we are not to be disturbed, we are not to be disturbed. She will warn the gods to keep clear, and they would not dare disobey my instructions. Shh, I murmur against her mouth. Nobody will see us. I press gently on Alexis's shoulder, guide her back onto the table, and bend over to trail kisses and nibbles down her throat and shoulder. The heater is warm on my back, but the slight chill in the air has caused goose flesh to rise on Alexis's skin. My cock throbs instantly in my pants. I lift Alexis's skirt and tug down the tights underneath, tossing them to the ground amongst the splinters of glass. You're insatiable, Alexis says with a small smile. You're delectable, I counter. You make it very hard not to want you. She chuckles, but I silence her with a passionate kiss. I slide a hand between our bodies, rubbing a pussy through her panties. She's hot and wet. The sensation sends a bolt of electric need through my balls. I slip my tongue inside her mouth at the same time as I glide my hand under her panties and press a finger inside of her. My tongue and finger start a languid, synchronized exploration of her body, and Alexis's hands grip at the front of my shirt as she moans in delight. I love the feel of her silky heat, love knowing that it won't be long before my cock replaces my finger. I love the way you feel, I tell her, as I start to rub my thumb over her clit. I remove my finger and suck it between my lips as I hold her gaze. And fuck, do I love the way you taste. Alexis swears under her breath. Her cheeks are pink with arousal, lips parted. She drags me back down for a rough kiss, and I press her body into the table with mine. We fight to consume each other. Lips and teeth and tongues and scraping nails and squeezing fingers. I unzip my pants and pull my cock out shoving her panties aside so I can sink deep inside of her. Her body welcomes me with a familiar squeeze, and just feeling how tight she is makes me grit my teeth with pleasure. We do not break our passionate kiss as I start to thrust inside of her. Alexis wraps her legs around my hips to guide me deeper, and I continue my rough exploration of her mouth with my tongue. The table squeaks back and forth, and the other champagne glass tips over and smashes against the ground. I don't care. My thoughts are entirely devoted to Alexis, to the sensation of liquid pleasure surging through me, to the tightness growing in my balls. I hike Alexis's leg up further and drive into her over and over again. I'm getting close, but I need to feel her climax first. I love the way her muscles squeeze me, Love the way her eyes glaze over and she goes completely blank as she lets the ecstasy consume her. Making Alexis come is the absolute fucking highlight of my day. Uh, oh, God. 
she cries. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Alexis's body clamps down on me as she orgasms. Fuck, yes. I keep driving into her, her body pulling me deeper, urging me to release. Alexis's head falls back against the table, lips slightly parted, and the faintest shadow of a smile on her lips. I don't know why, but just seeing her like this is what undoes me. She's so effortlessly sexy, she doesn't even know it. I come hard, body shaking, and lean over Alexis with my hands framing her head on the table. She smiles up at me, a full smile this time. Thanks for dinner, she says. I laugh. <laughs> Any time. You know. She lifts a finger and runs it along my jaw. A shiver dances down my spine. I'm still pretty hungry. Oh, yeah? She nods. Ravenous, actually. I lick my lip and grin. That simply will not do, I say, and I lift her into my arms. Let's get you to the bedroom and see if we can find something to fill you up. Gabriel. I look over at Alexis, admiring her long, swan-like neck and the animation on her face as she discusses her work with Grace Van Kemp. Her eyes are bright, as though lit from the inside and I can tell she really cares about the Bellucci Incorporated charities. I have always looked after my own, but Alexis wants to help anyone who needs it, regardless of where their loyalties lie, or if they even have loyalties at all. The system still needs a few tweaks, I tune in to hear Alexis say. She ribs me playfully in the side. Gabriel had a little too much on his plate before to be able to devote a lot of time to the charities. Now that I'm in charge, I get to clear the cobwebs off and really use our funding to take our initiatives to the next level. That's wonderful, Grace says. And don't you two make the most beautiful couple? Alexis's smile turns tense. I have to suppress a laugh and cough into my elbow to do so. Would you excuse us, I say, guiding Alexis away by the elbow. Her smile slips away the second Grace is no longer in earshot. Why is it that the only thing anybody at this stupid party seems to care about is how good we look together? Thank God the baby bump is invisible yet. They'd have a field day with that. Come on, let's dance, I say, pulling her toward the dance floor. She frowns, but relents and I pull her close and start to move in easy steps to the brass band's lilting melody. I lean in and exhale her delectable scent, jasmine and honeysuckle. I brush my lips over the shell of her ear. Your problem is that you expect too much of these people, I say quietly. They're shallow. They're vain. You genuinely care about people, and they only care about other people thinking they care about people. That sucks, she remarks. You're looking at it the wrong way, I reply. Look at this as a room of potential donors. All you need to learn is how best to manipulate them. Befriend them. Talk about their vain interests flatter their egos, lay on a thin layer of guilt, and soon enough you'll have them throwing buckets of cash at you and applauding you for the opportunity to do so. Alexis pulls back, lifting an eyebrow. Her mouth tilts slightly in amusement. Is that what you see when you walk into a room? A flock of sheep, ripe for manipulation? I chuckle. That is the nature of my business. I won't apologize for that. I guide her out into a spin and then pull her back. Life is all about knowing what you can get from whom and how. And what is it that you think you can get from me, Mr. Bellucci? She asks coyly, batting her eyelashes. There are a number of things I want from her right now, none of which I can get. 
I dig my fingers tighter into the skin of her back and lean in until my breath fans her neck. With you, it's not a case of what I think I can get. It's what I will get. And what will you get? I drag her an inch closer. When we get home, you're going to strip naked and wait for me on your knees while I decide. Alexis drags in a ragged breath. The sound of it is so sexy that I debate dragging her off to a quiet corner now for a little taste of what's to come. I decide against it. Sometimes it feels like we are skating from scandal to scandal, and being caught fucking in public never goes down well. Mr. Bellucci! A squeaky voice pipes from behind me. Alexis and I turn around to find a teeny redhead bobbing into view, clutching a pen and a small notepad. She looks no older than twenty, with round, cherubic cheeks and big green eyes. I cock a brow expectantly. The woman clears a throat, suddenly looking nervous. <clears throat> I'm sorry to interrupt, but I've been looking for you all night. I'm Shannon Gratham, with the People's Weekly, or a lifestyle magazine that... I know People's Weekly, I interrupt, failing to hide my irritation. A reporter. Of course. Oh, uh, right, sorry, Shannon sputters. We do these fun his and hers interviews, and my editor said if I could get one from you two tonight, then he'd let me write a front page story. So far, I've just been working on the little mini blurbs, and she grimaces. Sorry, I'm sure you don't care. Anyway, I don't think he thinks I'll actually pull through, so you'd be really helping me out. I open my mouth to tell Shannon to clear off when Alexis's fingers dig into my side. We can make time for a short interview, can't we, darling? Alexis says smoothly. I glare down at her, but she simply throws back a breezy smile. Shannon doesn't notice the exchange. She's practically vibrating with excitement and has already started jotting things down in her notebook. Great, amazing, she exclaims. Should we go to your table? We leave the dance floor and lead Shannon over to our table. And Root, Alexis whispers, Give the girl a break. She reminds me of me. Of course she does. I sigh. If Alexis really wants to do a fluffy interview with a toddler, I suppose I can give the girl a few minutes of my time. I can see why you'd think that, I whisper back. Only you were more annoying. Alexis pokes my side again, and I laugh. We take a seat at the table, and Shannon stands in front of us. Her face is pink, and she takes a second to silently read over her list of questions. When she looks up at us, I see that, although her expression is nervous, there is bravery in her eyes. Okay, first question, she says. Which of you is more likely to cook a romantic dinner? Fucking hell, it's one of those interviews. Alexis grins. Definitely me. I'm not sure Gabriel can cook. I can cook, I argue. She eyes me quizzically. Then how come I've never seen you do it? I've never seen you cook either. That's a lie. I watched her cook every day on the cameras while she lived in her apartment. Question two. Shannon continues, apparently unfazed by our bickering. Which of you is more likely to get up and sing karaoke? Me, Alexis says. I nod in agreement. Which of you is most likely to snore in your sleep? Alexis, I say. Gabriel, Alexis says at the same time. We glare at each other. I do not snore. I tell her. You do snore. I have heard you snore. That's simply not true. It is true, Alexis huffs. It's like a Boeing 747 going off sometimes. I look at Shannon. Is there a question about which of us is most likely to lie about the other snoring? Because I can tell you right now who that would be. You're ridiculous, 
Alexis says with a laugh. How would you know if you snore or not unless somebody tells you you're asleep? Because that's the sort of thing I just know. Alexis glances at Shannon. Is there a question in there about which of us is most likely to think they know everything when they really don't? There is, actually, Shannon replies. Alexis looks back at me, and we hold each other's gazes for a long beat. And then we both break down in laughter. My shoulders shake, and I lean over to press a kiss to Alexis's brow. Your trouble, I say. Shannon seems a little stunned by this, but smiles. Are you ready for the next question? I smile at her. Go on, then. By the time we make it out to the limo, both of us are exhausted. It has been a long night of networking, dancing, and lying. Plus one humorous interview that I was surprised to actually enjoy. I find when I am with Alexis, I enjoy a lot of things that I would have found tedious before. Well, that was interesting, Alexis says as we pull away from the curb. <laughs> interesting. She smiles, sliding across the back seat to nestle against me. It was fun, actually. I like us doing things like this together. It feels like we really are a team. I wrap my arm around her shoulders, soaking in her warmth. It could be a very sweet moment. Only, I don't want her to think this is all being my partner will entail. I don't want her to build false expectations of our future together. I hope you know that it will not always be this peaceful, I tell her. In fact, tonight was a brief respite from a war that has been bubbling under the concrete of this city for years. Alexis looks up at me. I know. Do you, though? I frown and run my thumb over her silken cheek. Not for the first time. I wonder if she is still too soft for this life. Every day brings more bloodshed to these streets, Alexis. The only way to put the cartel down is with brutal force. But once the cartel is gone, it won't have to be that way, she says. Promise me that once this war is over, you won't start another one. I stare at her for a long while. The air between us feels thick, as though it's pushing us apart. I can't promise that, I say finally. This will always be a bloody business, Alexis. Violence is what drives this machine, and I couldn't change that even if I wanted to. She sits up, biting her lip. I want to pull her back, stop her from creating a distance between us, but if she wants to be a part of this, she needs to come to me fully and willingly. I can't make her accept the brutal man I am. She has to make that decision on her own. Minutes pass. Neither of us says anything. Alexis stares out the window, her features drawn in concentration, and I try to do anything other than watch her. I check my phone, I look out the window on my side of the car, I pick pieces of lint from my suit. Finally, just when the silence threatens to smother me, Alexis looks over and sighs. I think part of what scares me most about being with you and being a part of this is how seductive the darkness is. I'm worried that the more violence I consume, the more I will become numb to it, and then I'll lose the very sensitivity that makes me a good person. I'll lose my sense of right and wrong. That won't happen. I shake my head and reach out the cup of cheek. You will become more numb to it, but that doesn't mean you'll lose your sense of right and wrong. You will be grateful for that numbness because there are always going to be bad men in this city who need us to deal with them. Murderers, rapists, enemies. We operate outside of the law, and that means we need to dole out our own justice. If that's going to be a problem for you, I need to know now. Alexis covers my hand with her own. Bad, 
men, she repeats. Not innocence, Gabriel. Never innocence. Can you promise that? I squeeze a hand. Killing innocence is never good for business, I reply. Though I think you will find we come across few who could be considered innocent in our business. Fine, she says. For the first time, I get a clear image of her as my mob queen. Beautiful and terrible. I glance at the closed partition. David won't open it unless there's an emergency. We're about halfway back to the mansion, which means I have at least twenty minutes to do whatever the fuck I want to Alexis before we get there. I lean in and kiss Alexis hard. She gasps in surprise, but soon begins to kiss me back. My heart clatters against my ribs. My cock throbs. I hold her face in my hands and plunder her mouth with my tongue, eager in my need to possess her. A robotic whir alerts me to the partition opening in front of us. I pull away, just as David's eyes become visible in the rearview mirror. Sir, he says. I have John on the phone. He says we are being tailed. John and a couple other guards are following behind us as a security detail. I swear under my breath. The cartel's timing is impeccable, as always. How many cars? I ask. Just the one. Take evasive action, I instruct, though I reach for the gun stored away in a compartment behind the champagne glasses, just in case. If Alexis weren't here, I would probably take my chances in a firefight, see if I could capture any of them for questioning. It will be hard to slip away in a limousine, and there are more of us, plus my security detail is armed with a full arsenal. But I can't risk anything happening to Alexis or our unborn child, so for now, we need to get away. Hold on, David warns. I grab onto Alexis just as he slams his foot on the brake, and the limo screeches around in a hairpin turn. He takes off in the other direction, and we pass a car that quickly maneuvers to follow us. Are you okay? I ask Alexis. Just dandy, but I'll feel better with a gun, she replies. You got another one stashed in here somewhere? A devil-may-care attitude surprises me, but I quickly search out another gun and hand it to her. Don't use it unless completely necessary, I warn, since I haven't yet had time to train her. She cocks the gun, bracing against the door as David takes another hard turn. Don't talk to me like I'm a child. It's not often I hand a child the gun, I remark blithely. Her eyes meet mine and all the softness is gone. Her gaze is ice and steel. You know what I mean. The tires squeal and we turn again. Alexis and I both peer out the windows trying to locate our enemy. David swears. We're coming into traffic, he says. I can cut down an alley, but I won't be able to make it all the way through. Alexis looks at me. That's okay, though, right? They won't try to do anything around other people. They will, I say grimly. And when they do, we can't be seen shooting back. It's too public. I call up to David. Go down the alley. I turn to Alexis, deadly serious. You need to stay in the car. You're pregnant. I'm a pair of hands, she argues. You need all the help you can get. I would rather die than see something happen to you, I reply. Stay put, or I will tan your ass. She frowns, but nods. I'm keeping the gun, though. Of course, and if anyone gets in this car who isn't me, shoot them in the fucking face. David turns down the alley, and I bolt out of the car, already shooting as the car that was tailing us plugs the entrance to the alley, and men start to pile out, screaming orders to each other. Get him alive! Find the bitch! I count five in total. Five fucking idiots. 
I shoot one in the head before he even makes it a step toward me. I get another in the leg as my security detail pulls up behind them and starts picking them off. They're a bunch of amateurs, and we make short work of them. I am so angry that they had the fucking audacity to hound me down like this, and that in doing so, they have put Alexis and our child in danger, that I forget all about taking a prisoner. My men and I execute them all, and then my men pile their bodies back into the car they came from and reverse it out of the alley to let us pass. I get back into the limo. Alexis looks up calmly from her phone. Is that it? She asks. David starts to pull back out onto the street, passing a brick wall sprayed with blood. Yeah, I say, stowing the gun away and plucking hers from the seat of the car next to her to do the same. It wasn't a well-organized attack. Are you okay? Alex smiles faintly. Fine. I just want to get home and make sure Harry's okay. You don't think this attack was a diversion, do you? The thought hadn't entered my mind until now, and suddenly my heart lurches forward. Fuck, what if it was a diversion? Though surely even the cartel wouldn't send their men on a suicide mission just to pull the wool over our eyes. It's more likely this was just a messy attack. But I tell David to step on it just in case. While we zoom through the streets, I pull Alexis's hand into my lap. Are you sure you're okay? Relax, she says dismissively and tugs her hand back. She lays it over her belly instead. I was a little worried for the sake of the baby, but I trusted that you had it under control. I study her expression, trying to figure out if she's faking this confidence, but it seems sincere. I'm surprised. I'm also aroused. Alexis has always been sexy, but something about the level of calm she has cultivated over the past few months makes her more attractive than ever. She has never been what I would consider emotionally frivolous, but she has also never reacted with quite as much aplomb to similar situations in the past. We get back to the house, and I am pleased to find everything is quiet. Alexis leaves to check on Harry, and I meet with Silvano in my office to go over the details of the attack. While we are there, I pour a glass of whiskey for us both, and we toast to my ferocious mob queen. Gabriel I feel a pair of eyes on me, and I look up from my phone. Silvano quickly averts his gaze, staring out the window instead of at the red brick buildings flashing by the tinted window, though it's too late. I sigh and deposit my phone in my jacket pocket. What is it? I mutter. Silvano glances back over. It's just... I mean, I just think... He chews his lip. You're being an idiot. I frown. Wanting to support my men on the front lines doesn't make me an idiot, I snap. And watch how you deliver advice. Anyone would think you were trying to insult me. He is not cowed, but instead seems to gain a little confidence. For some reason, Silvano has begun to seem more sure of himself when I'm angry. It could be a trap, Silvano points out. In fact, that's a very likely possibility. I know the Irish are disorganized and clearly frustrated by the new leadership, but that doesn't mean they would just hand Lynch over to us on a silver platter. I know, I reply. We've been over this. Humor me and go over it one more time. Silvano sits a little straighter, gray eyes flashing. We haven't heard anything from Lynch in weeks, and now all of a sudden we get word that he's sitting pretty at O'Neill's like he's waiting for us? The fact that it could be a trap is obvious, I reply. I'm not arguing with you about that. Let's say the odds are 50-50, Silvano continues. Don't you think it would be better for you to hang back just in case? No, I reply flatly. I don't think that. 
I told you I'm not going to stand back and watch. I will fight this war on the front lines, or I will not fight it at all. You'll die on the front lines, he mutters. Or be captured or arrested. Then that will be my fate. I glare at him. My father gave orders from behind a silver screen, and because of that, he lost sight of the suffering and the lives of his men. He viewed his own men and his enemies as chess pieces, not as humans. I will not make that same mistake. Silvano studies me, takes a long breath, and shakes his head. You're a good man, Gabriel, and a good leader but I do worry that will be your downfall. I smirk. Then so be it. David pulls up outside of O'Neill's, and Silvano rests his hand on the door handle. I stare out the window, my gaze flitting from one pedestrian to the next, and my hand flies out to stop Silvano before he can open the door. What is it? he asks, suddenly alert. There is a man leaning against the entrance to the bar. He is sloppily dressed, his beard untrimmed and his shirt buttons askew, but his eyes track up and down the street with razor-sharp focus. A woman walks by talking on a phone, and she stares just a little too long at the car. It's not an ambush, I breathe. It's a sting. Then I yell to David, Get us out of here. David pulls away just as the man leaning against the door pulls out his gun and yells at us to stop. Sirens blare from somewhere nearby. I swear repeatedly as Silvano gets on the phone to bark orders at Dom and his men, who are in an SUV not far behind. This is not good. I grab mine and Silvano's guns and stash them in the compartment under the seat while David tears around the street corner. The number of laws we have broken is relatively low, but if the police catch us, it will only give Ruby Flint the opportunity to make the connection between Bellucci Incorporated and the mob. Felicity and Lynch are behind this, and no doubt they have already told Ruby, or at least implied, that my business stretches beyond the scope of the law. My being caught would confirm that with catastrophic results. David swings a hard right, and it throws me into the side of the car. Silvano slams into my shoulder and swears. I told you that you should have stayed behind, he grumbles. This is not the time, Silvano. We careen around another corner, and this time, a cop car skids into the lane behind us, lights flashing. David, Silvano calls to the front. Dom's SUV is about to come barreling through that intersection. Wait until the last second and make a hairpin turn. David nods in the rear view, and we zoom toward the traffic lights. I grit my teeth. I have outrun other crime syndicates plenty of times, but so far I've never had to outrun the police. Plus, two car crashes in as many days has to be a bad sign. I'm just glad Alexis isn't here for this one, though undoubtedly... She could take it. A dark feeling in my stomach warns that I am witnessing the beginning of the end of my empire. I refuse to listen to it. Not yet. We get into the intersection, and David wrenches on the emergency brake, sending us flying around, just in time to miss Dom's SUV as it runs the lights. The police car brakes hard, but still has to steer into a pole on the sidewalk to avoid slamming into the side of the SUV. David waves at Dom and then takes off back the way we came. Dom's going to lead them away now, Silvano says, staring over his shoulder as the police car reverses. Dom lingers in the intersection just long enough for the police car to get back into the game, and then he's off like a shot. Sure enough, they follow him now instead. An easier target, I suppose. We're not out of the woods yet, I mutter, dialing Alexis's number. If I know Ruby, she's not going to let us get away so easily. 
I rush through the front door while David races to stash the car in one of the garages, sending gravel shooting everywhere. Alexis is waiting for me, holding a bundle of clothes. She's still in her pajamas, a pink tank top and some black leggings. What's that? I ask. She lifts the bundle, demonstratively. Sweatpants and a t-shirt, she says matter-of-factly. We've been home all morning watching cartoons. Harry's already set up in the living room. You just need to get changed and mess your hair up a little. After a beat, Alexis waves a hand at me. Well, get undressed. It feels strange to take my clothes off in the foyer with two guards standing nearby, but I don't argue because I know that time is of the essence. She's here, John says listening to the radio in his ear. She's on her way from the guardhouse now. I shuck off the rest of my clothes, and Alexis hands them to John while I pull on the sweats. He takes the clothes away, and she rises on her tiptoes and ruffles my hair. Then she grabs my hand and drags me through to the living room, where Clara is sitting with Harry. Okay, I'm out of here, Clara says, hopping to her feet. If anyone asks, I'm not here. Alexis chuckles. <laughs> I hardly think they'll be asking for you. Thanks, Clara. Clara leaves, and we slide onto the couch on either side of Harry. He barely seems to notice our arrival, eyes glued to the colorful characters prancing across the screen. The flamboyance of the program mixes uncomfortably with the jagged suspense dancing up my spine, and I struggle to calm my racing heartbeat. Sir, John says, arriving at the doorway. There's a Ruby Flint here to see you. She says it's urgent. What the hell could she want from me on a Saturday morning? I complain loudly. Tell her to go away and make an appointment with me during office hours. We both know she won't, but this is all part of the lie. I'm reacting how I would normally react if Ruby showed up unannounced during time with my family. John disappears and shows up again a second later. I'm afraid she will not leave without being seen. I sigh. Ah, oh, fine, let her in. Ruby stomps down the hall a moment later, her heels echoing on the marble. I tense, and Alexis rubs her hand over my back, just as Ruby appears in the doorway. Ms. Flint, I greet before she has the chance to speak. This is highly inappropriate. Ruby sashays into the room, pointed chin held high. Her robin hair is pulled back into a simple ponytail rather than the severe bun she normally sports, but she is wearing her usual full face of makeup. Dark lipstick, heavily lined eyes, too much blush. I wouldn't interrupt your... She flicks her eyes between Harry, Alexis, and I. Family time, if it weren't important. So, what is it? I ask, voice thick with irritation. She blinks. Perhaps we should go somewhere private to speak. Whatever you want to say to me, you can say in front of my family. I lean back, letting the lie wash over me. I have been here all morning, watching cartoons with my family. I've had two cups of coffee and some toast. I'm planning to take my family out for a nice lunch in a little bit. Hmm. Ruby purses her lips. We received an anonymous tip that a rival crime syndicate was planning to kidnap and possibly murder the leader of the Irish Mafia, Kevin Lynch. After staking out the location, a town car that matches the description of one you own fled from the scene. There was a brief chase, but the car got away. I laugh. I'm sorry, Ruby. Can I just clarify that this has nothing to do with my father's murder? You're trying to insinuate that I'm involved with organized crime now. She takes a long, exaggerated look around the room, at the crown moldings, antique furniture, and brocade curtains.
When she looks back at me, she smiles. I'm not suggesting anything, she says, clearly suggesting something. However, I would be interested in having a look at your town car. It's not here, I reply. I believe it's in the shop today. And I suppose you'll be able to provide all the necessary documentation to support that claim, Ruby asks, in a way that suggests she knows how easily I will be able to falsify some mechanic reports. <laughs> of course, I reply. Though, you'll have to wait until I am back in my office on Monday. Unless, that is, I'm under arrest. Her mouth pinches in a sour smile. Mm, not yet. Good. I wave John over. John will see you out. But Ruby doesn't budge an inch. She turns her piercing gaze to Alexis instead. Alexis, how lovely to see you. Her words drip like syrup onto the floor. I would say the same, but I'm afraid I share Gabriel's opinion on your intrusion, Alexis remarks. This is highly inappropriate, and we will be lodging a complaint with your superiors. Fuck, she makes me proud sometimes. How very interesting, Ruby clears her throat. Just one question before I leave, then. Alexis, can you confirm that you have been with Gabriel all morning? I'd just like to remind you that if I find out you're lying... You'll both be in hot water. Time seems to lengthen as Alexis doesn't answer right away. My heart cracks from one beat to the next, and I worry that this is all too much for Alexis, too soon. She has never had to cover for me with the police before, never had to outright lie to a figure of authority. Alexis finally nods. Yes, he's been here all morning. And it was such a lovely morning before you showed up. Ruby eyes Alexis suspiciously, but turns to leave. I'm not going to drop this, Gabriel, she calls over her shoulder as she exits the living room. We'll see about that, Alexis mutters. We settle back into the couch and watch cartoons in silence. When I have confirmation from John that Ruby is well and truly gone... I turn to Alexis and grab her hand. Thank you, I say. No problem. Was that okay, I ask? Did you, did you not have a problem lying to the police? Alexis pulls my hand over and places it on her belly, pressing down. Her baby bump is barely visible, but I can feel the firmness of it. When it comes to our family, I'll do anything, she says. We stay like that for a long time, until a commercial break effectively unglues Harry from the screen. Dada, he says, grinning up at me. Wanna play airplane? Alexis. Clara's blonde head is bent low over the desk as she examines the set of photographs splayed across the wood. I went through a few of the older treatment centers yesterday and took photos of areas that could use some improvement, and Clara is helping me create a budget for the work. I think the most important things we should focus on are the kitchens, she says. You want these places to feel like a home, and kitchens are the heart of that. You want them clean and accessible, with lots of seating. They should be the kind of place people want to hang out and make a meal together. She looks up, smiling. Recovery necessitates a lot of human interaction in my experience. It's a lot easier to retreat into the darkness if you feel like you're alone. I nod. That sounds good. We can definitely do that. She goes back to looking at the photos. And I wonder if she's ever going to say anything about the cops coming around to the mansion two days ago. I know I only asked her to watch Harry for a few minutes while I got Gabriel ready in the foyer, but that still made her complicit in the deception. 
yet she hasn't said anything about it. It's driving me nuts. Laura buzzes, and I'm so tightly wound thinking about Clara that I jump in my chair. Yes, I ask. Debbie Harris is here to see you, she says. I told her that you're in a meeting, but she said it's urgent. Clara looks up, cocking a brow. I sigh. Let her through. A second later, Debbie storms into my office, a vision in her lime pantsuit. She has gone for a darker lipstick than is her custom, and darkly lined eyes narrow on me from across the room. Laura walks in behind her. Can I get anyone a drink? No, that will be all, Laura, I say, my eyes never leaving Debbie's. Laura leaves, and Debbie perches on the chair next to Clara. I am suddenly very nervous. The two of them have never met, but are aware of each other. I can't remember if Debbie knows that Clara knows the truth about Gabriel. What can I help you with, Debbie? I lean back in my chair, feigning nonchalance. Debbie slaps her phone onto the desk and taps the screen. From the speaker, I hear my voice. Listen, bitch. I don't know who the fuck you think you are, but you might want to think for a second about who I am, what I can do. You ought to be careful what you say around me if you want to avoid any trouble. I am getting tired of talking about this recording. Clara, who has never heard the recording before, looks up in surprise. I meet her eyes and try to communicate telepathically that I will explain later. I see you've been cozying up to Ruby Flint, I remark. I we're like two bugs snug in a rug, Debbie snaps. She sounds even more Scottish when she's angry. Would you care to explain yourself? I'm not sure what you mean. Debbie's attention flicks to Clara. You're the best friend, aren't you? Did you know that your girl has gotten in deep with the Italian mob? I'm not in deep with anybody, I reply smoothly. Debbie whips around to snarl at me, making her fluffy hair bounce. You're in over your fecking head. She returns her attention to Clara. And are you just okay with the fact that your best friend is turning into an utter psychopath? Clara furrows her brow. Number one, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Number two, I'm not sure how it would be any of my business if I did. Alexis and I were literally sitting here discussing renovations to several drug rehabilitation centers throughout the city. She's a good person. Debbie rolls her eyes. Lord have mercy. You've drunk the Kool-Aid too, hmm? Debbie, I say firmly. What do you want? She purses her lips and slides her phone back into her pocket. I want information, she says. And I will release this recording online if I don't get it. I've got a hot tip for you, Clara grins. Never eat yellow snow. I giggle. Debbie frowns. You should take me more seriously, girls. This recording will be devastating if it gets out. I take a breath and stifle another laugh. What kind of information do you want? I don't want much, Hen. Your man's empire is cracking as we speak. I just want to get ahead of it. You don't have to confirm that he's the leader of the Italian mob, but at least give me some evidence of his involvement. That'll be enough for now. I stare at her long and hard, and then let out a bark of laughter. You're nuts, Debbie. Absolutely nuts. It wouldn't have mattered if Debbie had just asked me to reveal what color boxers Gabriel wears. I'm not giving away even a crumb of information on him. Not after everything we've been through together. Debbie is not the kind of person who likes being laughed at. The corners of her mouth sink down, and she narrows her eyes. You know, you're not the only one who can settle things unconventionally. I have my ways. I'm sure you do. I open the top drawer of my desk and rifle inside. Debbie leans over, staring hopefully into the drawer. 
Her expression folds into irritation when I merely pull out a tube of salt and vinegar Pringles. Clara snorts. Clara, could you excuse us? I ask, opening the lid and pulling back the paper seal. And please ask Angelo to join us in here. Clara nods and leaves, and I sit back in my chair and pop the first Pringle into my mouth. Debbie watches me sourly. The room is silent, except for the sound of my crunching. Angelo glides into the room a minute later. He stops in the center of the room, hands clasped behind him, and awaits my instructions. Debbie, I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but the amount I trust you has recently taken a nosedive. Angelo is going to check you for bugs. If you want to continue our conversation, you will oblige. Debbie brushes the wrinkles out of her pantsuit and stands up, walking over to Angelo. She spreads her arms. I sit and devour a quarter of a can of Pringles while I wait for Angelo to give me the all clear. Debbie obviously thinks I'm about to tell her something incriminating. Otherwise, she would have told me to feck off. She's about to be very disappointed. Debbie sits back down, and Angelo leaves. I tilt the can toward her. Pringle? No. Fine. More for me. I set the can aside and lean over the desk, staring deep into her eyes while I finish chewing and swallow. I like this. I like commanding the room. I like that we are in here on my time, and I am calling the shots. Debbie isn't used to this dynamic between us, and I can see that it bothers her. It was very nice to see you, Debbie, but I'm afraid you'll be leaving here empty-handed, I began. I have to say, I'm quite disappointed with you. I thought we were friends. I was friends with a different Alexis, she sniffs, one who wanted to do good in the world. I am doing good, I smile tightly. But if you want to see my bad side, I can easily arrange that. In fact, how about this? I lean in a little closer and hone my words so they come out razor sharp. If you ever threaten my family again, I will make sure you live to regret it. Do not test me, Debbie. Debbie shakes her head sadly. You could have been so much more, Alexis. She goes to stand, and I sit back in my chair as though her words haven't gotten to me at all. I toss another Pringle in my mouth and wave jovially as she leaves, Angelo following close behind. When I am finally alone, I let my eyes flutter closed, and my head falls back against the chair. I did the right thing. Well, I did the wrong thing, objectively speaking, but for the right reasons, right? I am committed to my family, to Gabriel, to building a good life for our two children. Debbie thinks she knows me, but she doesn't. And she certainly doesn't know what's best for me. Then why has her visit shaken me so much? I guess it's just that at one point, Debbie and I were in this together. And now, seeing her so disappointed in me, it's hard but that doesn't mean I regret it. I flick my eyes back open just as Clara re-enters the room. She puffs air in her cheeks and blows it out, eyes wide. Oof, she seemed mad. Clara reaches for the Pringles, her slim hand retrieving chips from the bottom of the tube effortlessly. I'm jealous. With my big wrists, I always have to wrestle for the last few chips. At least it's nice to see her with a healthy appetite again. I think we're about to find out how mad. I open my laptop and navigate to the front page of the New York Union. I hit refresh. Nothing yet. You don't think she's actually going to leak it, do you? Clara asks. I think that's exactly what she's going to do. Debbie doesn't mess around. I doubt my threat will have had much sway over her, though it was worth a try. She barely ever took me seriously as a reporter. She's certainly not going to take me seriously as a mob queen. 
Clara's eyes widen a little as she fishes for another chip. What are you going to do if she does it? I shake my head, refreshing the screen again. I don't know. Will you wait with me? Clara's blue eyes meet mine across the desk, shining with sincerity. Of course. We don't have to wait for long. Debbie must have had the article locked and loaded, because sure enough, two refreshes later, and a new headline is splashed across the front page. Billionaire's mistress threatens police officer in secret recording. I turn the laptop to Clara, and she reads the title. Yikes. Yikes is right. You know what's most annoying? I grumble. I'm not his fucking mistress. Clara lifts one brow. That's the most annoying bit? We read through the article, which contains a transcription of the recording, but also includes a link for anybody who wants to listen to my seething threats themselves. It's bad. Really bad. And I know any moment Gabriel is going to burst in here and... Laura buzzes. Miss Wright, Gabriel Bellucci is here to see you. Gabriel strides through the door before Laura has even finished speaking. I press the intercom button. Thank you, Laura. Clara's head swings around, and when she looks back at me, she grimaces. I'm going to go. Thank you, Clara. She scurries out of the office. I don't blame her for evacuating the scene. Gabriel looks furious. His dark eyes are narrowed with deadly precision, jaw tight, lips flat. As usual, he looks sexier than ever when he's angry. As always, that's highly inconvenient. Hey, I greet once we're alone. What the fuck was Debbie Harris thinking? He asks, and like a bolt out of the blue, it hits me that Gabriel isn't angry at me. What happened? I take a breath. Gabriel's dominant energy is flooding the room, and I struggle to form words. Yeah, uh, she came to visit me today. Bit of a nightmare, actually. She said that if I didn't give her information on you, she was going to leak Ruby's recording. And I wouldn't, so she did. Gabriel crosses the room in three long strides and plants his hands on the desk. We need to deal with her. We can't let her get away with embarrassing you like that. Embarrassing me? I mean, of course, I am the one with egg on my face, but I'm used to Gabriel taking everything I do and twisting it around to how it affects him. But he isn't concerned about his image right now. He's worried about mine. He's angry that Debbie has humiliated me. He wants to make her pay for what she did not to him, but to me. I swallow. It's hard to be angry at Debbie when I'm so goddamn turned on. Is it wrong to find Gabriel sexy when he's contemplating murder? I don't want to hurt her, I say, briefly pulling my libido back in check. She's been through a lot because of this war, I think we should scare her, but I want to be very clear that no harm should come to her or her daughter. Gabriel's jaw works back and forth. Fine. Heat flashes between my thighs. This powerful man, this force to be fucking reckoned with, is ceding to my wishes. God, that feels good. And hell if it doesn't turn me on. In the meantime, I say, rolling back in my chair. I'm wearing a knee-length pencil skirt, and when I widen my legs, Gabriel's eyes flick to the movement. Maybe you could help distract me from what the mean Scottish lady did? His lip ticks slightly at the corner, and when his eyes meet mine again, they burn with arousal. I suppose I could do that. Gabriel stalks around the side of the desk like a leopard circling its prey holding my gaze the entire time. My heart catches in my throat. My sex clenches in anticipation. I go to stand, but Gabriel holds his hand out. Stay, 
He commands. I stay. He places his hands on the arms of my chair and bends over to kiss me. The kiss is tender, sweet. He pushes, and the chair rolls backward until it bumps against the window. I glance over my shoulder, and the whole city sprawls out behind me. And even though I know I am perfectly safe, having a set of wheels near such a steep drop still makes my heart putter nervously. Gabriel guides my mouth back to his and deepens this kiss. His tongue traces over my bottom lip, and I widen for him. He begins a languid exploration of my mouth, and one of his hands starts to roam over my body, squeezing my breasts before trailing down my stomach and over my thighs, and finally to my bare calves. His fingers leave fire in their wake. Gabriel traces a finger up the inside of my leg and dips it under my skirt to skim along my naked thigh. I desperately want him to continue this exploration, to reach all the way up to my sex. He doesn't. He removes his hand and breaks the kiss. I open my eyes and watch as Gabriel lowers to his knees. He must read the question on my face as he grins and yanks my ass to the edge of the chair, then scrunches the skirt up over my hips. Gabriel lowers his mouth to my now bare thighs, and I let out a low moan. Are you distracted yet? He asks between kisses. Nope, I lie. I'm still very, very tense and upset. He chuckles, and the sensation of it vibrates over my skin. I feel so exposed here, with the city wide open behind me and my skirt around my waist. But that only adds a level of excitement to the already erotic sight of Gabriel kneeling between my legs, his lips hovering teasingly over my panties. He kisses me through the fabric. His breath is hot, his touch soft. I moan and let my head fall back, vibrating with my need for more. Gabriel obliges, pressing harder against me. He kisses my left thigh, then my right, and then starts to peel my panties over my legs. When he tosses them to the floor, he reaches up to grab my chin, forcing my head down so our eyes meet as he runs his tongue between my cleft. I lose myself in the pleasure and Gabriel's swirling, dark irises. He adjusts my legs so they are over his shoulders, and then proceeds to lick and suck at an almost lazy pace. My body thrums with electricity. I tangle my fingers in his silky hair and forget all time and space. I forget that I'm in my office, that it's the middle of the day, that at any moment my receptionist could buzz in and announce the arrival of any number of people whose only intent would be to ruin my day. Ruby Flint, Felicity Huffman, Kevin Lynch. Those names fly out the window, because the only name my brain has space for is Gabriel Bellucci. He is the only thing that matters, his lips, his tongue, the nibble of his teeth. Gabriel is an expert when it comes to bringing me to orgasm, and it isn't long before I feel that molten awareness sizzle up from my belly. He looks up at me, a challenge in his eyes. If his mouth wasn't on me, Gabriel would be commanding me to come, and I would, because obeying Gabriel is its own special release. His tongue swirls faster. He moans against me, and the sensation makes me throw my head back in ecstasy. I feel it build and build and build. And then, oh God, I hiss as my body ripples. For a second, the entire fabric of reality ripples too. I squeeze my eyes closed as sweet serenity floods my veins and relieves my senses of any last shreds of thought. Now there is no more Gabriel, no more anything, utter darkness. And when my thoughts come sashaying back in, I open my eyes and look down at Gabriel, who has sat back on his heels and is staring at me appreciatively. Well, he says, 
I suppose we should both be getting back to work. Yes, I clear my throat. <clears throat> work is a thing that I do. Gabriel chuckles and stands up. He kisses me on the forehead. Until next time, Tyga. Gabriel. Alexis fiddles nervously with the bow on her shirt. I watch her, amused by how cute she looks with her nose wrinkled, batting at a piece of silk like a curious feline. As though she feels my eyes on her, she pauses and looks up. What? She says. I smile. <laughs> Nothing. She frowns, but misses her opportunity to retort when Laura knocks on the door and leads our guest into the office. Alexis wanted to do this interview alone, and I understand why. Victor Crawshank claims his article will focus on Alexis's work in Bellucci Incorporated's charity division, so she doesn't need me for that. However, I've met Crawshank before at a couple of PR events, and as far as I'm concerned... The man's a snake. I told her not to take the interview, but since she insisted, I've decided to sit in on it, just in case. I wouldn't be so worried if we hadn't had a run of tricky interviews recently. With the murder investigation still ongoing, Alexis and I have been very much in the public eye, and that has made fighting a war that much harder. Crawshank glides into the room on a cloud of expensive cologne, He's in his forties and has silver streaking through his neatly combed hair. He wears a simple polo shirt and chinos, like he has just come off the golf course, and gives Alexis two air kisses before shaking my hand. I can tell she begrudges him for it. Thank you for seeing me, Victor says, settling down on the chair opposite us. Thank you for coming, Alexis says with an easy smile. Would you like a drink? Oh, just a black coffee for me, he says in Laura's direction. To us, he adds, I'm fasting. How nice, Alexis says, that same smile still firmly lodged on her cheeks. Victor pulls a notepad out of his satchel and fluffs his feathers. I must say... When I heard I was going to get to sit down with both yourself and the CEO of the company, I felt like a very special boy. I had a free afternoon, and it has been such a long time since we last spoke, I reply congenially. His green eyes flash with wicked amusement. <laughs> Too long, he pulls out a pen. Shall we get started? The interview is pretty standard at first. Victor asks a couple of questions about which charities we run and which of them we just furnish donations to. Alexis impresses me with how knowledgeable she is. Considering she's only been on the job for a few weeks, she can recite more facts and figures than I could and seems to know each of our charities inside and out. Then Victor moves on to slightly more personal questions. He asks these between sips of his black coffee, setting the scene so that it seems like he and Alexis are just old friends gabbing on their lunch break. Where did she grow up? What was her family like? Why did she make the move from journalism to charity work? Alexis answers these easily. She spent some of her childhood in Kansas, left when she was very young. She grew up amidst New York City's skyscrapers and barely remembers Kansas at all. They were a loving family, and she misses her parents all the time. An opportunity arose to take on this new challenge, and she thought she could do more good by getting a hand stuck into it than just writing about it. And then Victor asks, with point-blank sincerity, When you say an opportunity... Do you mean the blatant nepotism you enjoyed following your tryst with Bellucci Incorporated's enigmatic CEO? My hand curls into a fist, and I picture myself tossing Victor through the plate glass window. Alexis doesn't answer straight away, and Victor blinks, takes a sip of his coffee, and continues staring at her. 
I'm just about to announce the interview is over when Alexis laughs. <laughs> well, I wasn't expecting that, Victor. But I suppose I should have been, she says. Why's that? Because that's how it looks, isn't it? I mean, in reality, that's what it is. I was put into this position because of my closeness to Gabriel. But that doesn't mean I didn't deserve it. I didn't kick anyone out of the job. This position was created for me to consolidate the many loose threads of our charity work and to hone our efforts. She continues to reel off facts and figures about what she has accomplished so far since her appointment and what her plans are for the company going forward. When Alexis finishes, she paints on a polite smile. I hope that eases some of your concerns, Victor. He dislodges his eyebrows from the ceiling. <laughs> yes, I suppose it does. The rest of the interview goes smoothly. Victor tries to throw a couple other curveballs, but Alexis nimbly bats them away. I realize by the end of it that my being present was pointless. Alexis has a remarkable capacity for dealing with troublesome reporters on her own. That shouldn't surprise me, considering that she used to be one. I take my time walking up the front steps and through the door. My body aches. The front of my shirt is warm and wet, and I can feel a bruise blooming on my cheek. All I can think about is a hot shower and a long sleep. Jesus. I look up and see Alexis at the top of the stairs. She's wearing an expression of horror and also the little pajama shorts I like so much. What happened? She asks in a hushed voice, bounding down the stairs. Why are you still awake? I counter as she crosses to the foyer toward me. I don't know the exact time, but I know at least it's very late. Alexis lifts a hand on my face, prodding gently at the cut on my cheek. I wince. I was waiting for you, she says. I saw you go out with Silvano earlier, and I was worried when you hadn't come home. I'm not used to being fussed over like this after a fight, and I stand stock still as she tugs open my shirt buttons and hisses when she sees the wound on my chest. You should see the other guy, I joke, but it's not really a joke. The other guy's dead. Alexis presses her lips together in a frown, unimpressed by my attempt at humor. Let's get you cleaned up, she says. Is everyone else okay? As far as I know, I say. I haven't heard back from Silvano's team yet, but they were just doing recon while we distracted the Irish. I've got a first aid kit in my office. Alexis and I go upstairs, and I sit in my office chair while she hunts through one of the cabinets for the first aid kit. I watch her, searching for any signs of stress, but find none. I have just come home covered in blood, and yet it doesn't seem to phase her at all. Doesn't this upset you? I ask. What? Alexis grabs the kid and lays it out on the desk. She starts to ease the ruined shirt from my shoulders. The blood, the implied violence, the fact that you are patching me up while our son sleeps just down the hall. Alexis grabs a wipe from the kit and starts to swab at the slash on my chest. It's not deep, but it stings like a motherfucker when the disinfectant hits it. I hiss in pain. Should it upset me? Alexis asks eyes trained on the task at hand. It would have before. Before what, though? When did Alexis first become desensitized to the realities of mob life? Was it when she was kidnapped? When the Irish hitman tried to kill her? Or maybe even before all of that? Alexis glances up at me briefly. Let me make this clear. I don't like this. It worries me when you don't come home, and it would worry me a lot more to see you come home covered in blood if I didn't know that the alternative was so much worse. But I am a part of this now, and if I'm going to be a part of this, 
I need to toughen up. She finishes wiping the wound and quickly presses a bandage to it before it starts to well with blood again. Do you resent that? I ask. Do you resent that the only way for us to be a family is for you to descend into the underworld to join me? How much blood have you lost? Alexis jokes. You're getting awfully deep. I grab a chin and lift it to face me. I look deep into her blue eyes, my own expression deadly serious. Answer me, Alexis. I think she might hesitate, but she doesn't. No, I don't resent it, she says. I thought I would, but I don't. I never wanted this life, but I'm not ashamed of it. Your world exists in a dozen different shades of gray, but there's good in it, too. We're the only people who can fight back against the cartel and push purple heroin off the streets for good. Our charities help more people than I could have ever reached through other means. She licks her lips. And if you want me to be really honest, I find it all to be quite thrilling. I know I should be scared after everything I've seen, but I'm not. I smile and release her chin. She grabs another wipe and starts dabbing at the cut on my cheek. Good, I say. Good, she repeats. I reach out and press a hand against her belly. You know I will always keep our family safe, right? She rests her hand over mine. I know. I trust you. Her words hang in the air between us, their sincerity surprising me. I clear my throat, pulling my hand back. So, <clears throat> what are you hoping for, I ask. Boy or girl? I will be happy with a healthy baby she says. Though it might be nice to have another girl around. And what would you name the little princess? Alexis chuckles. <laughs> I don't know. I think you should get to choose the name this time, since I named her firstborn after my father, who was secretly a sadistic criminal. I chuckle. <laughs> I've always liked the name Serena, I admit. It was my grandmother's name. Alexis's eyes meet mine, and she smiles. I like that. A brisk knock on the door interrupts the moment, and then Antonio bursts into the room. His expression is like a brick wall. Sir, I'm sorry, but I have important business to discuss, he says. Alexis gathers up the bloody wipes and garbage from the desk, preparing to leave. Whatever you want to say, you can say it in front of Alexis, I reply. What happened? Antonio clears his throat. Silvano's crew was ambushed, he says. He's downstairs. The doctor is on his way, but I don't know if Silvano will make it until then. I shoot to my feet. Show me. The three of us dash out of the office. Alexis. Silvano is just as stubborn as ever, and I think that's the only thing keeping him alive. The doctor has managed to stop the bleeding, but he has three bullet wounds, one of them where the bullet is still lodged inside, and has lost a lot of blood. Are you sure we shouldn't take him to the hospital? I ask. Gabriel has told me twice before that Silvano will receive the same level of care in the mansion as he would in the hospital. But even though I can see the machines beeping and the doctor adjusting the bag of saline, I still struggle to believe it. After Gabriel's near-death incident a few months ago, he had one of his spare bedrooms outfitted with enough medical equipment to resuscitate a small army. I only hope it will be enough. I'm going to be fine, Silvano murmurs, eyelids fluttering. I've never died before, and I'm not going to start now. His voice comes out thick, groggy. 
I'm surprised he's still awake. Antonio's bulky form hovers in the corner. He filled us in while the doctor was patching up Silvano's various wounds. Silvano and four other men were meant to merely be providing a distraction while Gabriel's team followed a lead on the location of Kevin Lynch. They attacked O'Neill's, which should have been mostly empty at the time. Somehow, Felicity knew about the attack, and she and a dozen men were waiting there when Silvano arrived. He was the sole survivor. Alexis, Silvano croaks. His hand lurches over the side of the bed, searching for me. I grab it. Yeah? Gabriel watches the exchange suspiciously. In all fairness, Silvano and I are not friends, so I don't understand why he's addressing me on what could be his deathbed. Felicity said something, he tells me. She said something that you need to know. What is it? Gabriel demands. I glare at him for his lack of tact. Gabriel ignores me. Silvano's eyes close and his head drops to the side. Silvano, Gabriel presses. What did Felicity say? But Silvano is galloping away from consciousness, and he only manages to mutter two words before passing out entirely. My angel. My angel. Gabriel repeats. What does that mean? He looks at me, and I shake my head, though the words do pull at a thread somewhere in the back of my mind. I'm too overwhelmed with the evening's attack to figure out why. Silvano's whole team was killed. That could have easily been Gabriel. Gabriel prods Silvano's arm, and the doctor shoots him a sour look. Sir? I need to start the surgery as soon as possible, and he needs his rest. He has lost a lot of blood. I tug Gabriel up. He's still shirtless, and his skin is hot under my fingers. The doctor's right. Let's go talk about what we're going to do. He looks as though he's going to fight me on it at first. But after blinking a few times and releasing a sigh, he follows me into the hall. Gabriel always loses his edge a little where Felicity Huffman is concerned. I don't blame him. She's been a constant antagonist in his life for years, and seems to have a very personal vendetta against him and his family. Plus, she has a frustrating ability to pop up in the places you least expect it. It makes her hard to fight. We go back to Gabriel's office. Gabriel stops for a shirt on the way, much to my chagrin and I clear up the rest of the garbage from the first aid kit while I wait for him. When he enters the room, he pours a glass of whiskey. If Silvano dies, he begins, but doesn't finish his thought. He downs his glass and fills it again before taking his seat. Silvano's not going to die, I say. He's too stubborn for that. Vito was stubborn too, Gabriel points out. He scrubs a hand over his face. What should we do, Alexis? I'm touched that he's asking my opinion. Our relationship has changed over the past few weeks, but something about me tending his wounds tonight seems to have cemented our new normal. What would you normally do in a situation like this, I ask. He takes a sip of the whiskey, shadows dancing over his features. I would repay them in kind. Find every one of them who was there and cut them down so that the first drop of Italian blood they spilled is their last. Then do that, I say. But make sure that while you do, you don't get lost in the revenge. Be careful. Felicity is probably expecting you to retaliate. Hell, I bet she's hoping you will. Don't fall into her trap. Gabriel scrubs a hand through his hair and it feathers around his face like a black curtain. The cut on his cheek and the purple spreading beneath it make him look every bit the stern warrior I know him to be. Gabriel is danger personified. Felicity has no idea what she is messing with. My mother used to say that when demons come to Earth, 
They pretend to be angels, and they get away with it because nobody expects a beautiful demon, he says, swirling the glass absently. I listen intently. Gabriel never talks about his mom. She died when he was young, and the second Felicity came into his life, she began to erase all traces of the woman who'd been Fabrizio's queen before. Demons and angels share the same makeup, you see, he continues. The same genetic code. She used to warn me about meeting angels, because there is no way to tell if they're devils in disguise. My angel. Felicity used those words in her text to me from Clara's phone, too. But that's not the first time someone has called me that. In my earliest memories, my mother called me her angel, too. She didn't call me that when I was older. She didn't really use terms of endearment at all once we moved to the city. Like she'd left Kansas a different person. I wonder that about you, you know. Gabriel says, pulling me back from my thoughts. Whether you're an angel or just pretending. I'm not pretending to be anything, I tell him. And if angels and demons are made of the same stuff, then why can't I be a bit of both? Our eyes meet, and his mouth pulls to the side. He takes another drink. Before either of us can say anything else, the baby monitor comes to life and Harry's cries fill the room. I'll get him, I say, rising to my feet. Gabriel shakes his head and downs the rest of his drink. I'll get him. I smile and extend my hand to him. Why don't we go get him together? Gabriel takes my hand and smiles back. Gabriel. The week after Silvano's attack is one of the worst weeks of the war. The cartel destroyed two restaurants and one bodega under my protection. The Irish plant a bomb in one of our warehouses, which explodes and kills three of my men. Silvano is still barely clinging to life. The only sliver of light in what is otherwise a fucking grim week is that Antonio manages to track down the cartel members who've leveled Silvano's team, and we take them out one by one. I feel like a man running out of time. My skin itches as the last few grains of sand in the hourglass spill. I will never stop fighting, but I am beginning to worry about the future of the city. More importantly, the future of my family. The thought kept me from sleeping all last night, and so I call Alexis into my office first thing. She arrives with messy hair and sleepy eyes and slumps into the chair across from me. Angela said she had something urgent to talk to me about? I take a second just to look at her. Even having just rolled out of bed, she's still easily the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. She blinks warily and frowns when I don't answer right away. Gabriel. The world floods back in around me, and I remember why I called her here. Things are getting more and more dangerous, I tell her. I'm worried that it's no longer safe for you and Harry to be around me. She presses her lips together. What are you suggesting? I think perhaps you two should get out of town for a bit. Go somewhere off the grid. Somewhere safe. The color drains from Alexis's face and her eyes widen. Are you trying to get rid of us? No, I say, shaking my head. I don't want you to go. Good, because I'm not going anywhere. She thrusts her chin out and folds her arms. The effect would be a lot more dramatic if she weren't wearing pajamas with little hearts all over them. I open my mouth to argue, but Alexis cuts me off. This is my home, Gabriel. You are my home. I don't believe that I could be any safer than I am here. And as long as here is where you are, then it's where I am too. Her eyes flash, daring me to tell her no again. And I'm tempted. I'm tempted to have her dragged out of the mansion, kicking and screaming, because if that's what it will take to keep her and the baby in her womb safe, then I should. But she's not wrong. 
At least here, there is a bevy of guards, security systems, and cameras. If someone attacks the mansion, backup can arrive in as little as five minutes. If I send her to a safe house, she will only be safe as long as nobody knows where she is. Fine, I say. But if anything goes down, you need to follow my instructions to a T. Understand? Yes. She nods with soldier-like intensity. I know how this works. Good. A long second passes between us, and I nearly say more. I nearly say that I don't know what I would do if something happened to her, and that it would drive me wild with grief. I nearly say even more than that. But then Alexis swallows and sits forward in her chair, and the opportunity is gone. You came back late last night? It's neither a question nor an accusation, just a statement. I nod. The Irish set a bomb off in one of our warehouses. I was on the scene until late. That's horrible, Alexis says, eyes widening. It's not uncommon for them, I tell her. Was everyone okay? I think of the soot-blackened faces, the wide, staring eyes. I shake my head. No, three did. I watch as the coating of shock and horror on Alexis's face drip away to reveal the anger underneath. She understands me now, perhaps more than she ever has before. We will make them pay, Alexis, I assure her. We? I like referring to us as a we. I can tell Alexis likes it too, because there is a dash of pride in her eyes when she nods. I have something to tell you, she says. Ruby Flint came to see me at the office yesterday. I bristle at the very mention of the woman's name. If she's harassing you, I begin. But Alexis shakes her head. She tried to get me to flip, Alexis says. She painted a beautiful picture. Me and the two babies out in a little house in the countryside somewhere, far away from all the blood and lies. For a second, the image appeals to me, too. I picture Alexis safe, with Harry and his sibling chasing butterflies, sunlight gilded and waving fields of wheat. But Alexis is right. The safest place for her is by my side. Aren't you going to ask me what I said? Alexis prods a second later. I'm surprised to find that trusting Alexis has become so second nature that I haven't even considered her flipping as a possibility. You said no, I reply. I trust you, Alexis. She looks fully awake now, blinking at me somewhat in surprise, but also in appreciation. A generous mouth curves, and she leans across the desk, planting a soft kiss on my lips. I capture her face in my hands and hold her there. I kiss her back slowly. My thumbs stroke over her cheeks, and I bask in the warmth of the moment. When Alexis pulls away, her eyes sparkle. She sits back down and drums on the top of my desk. I've got more news. She says. I sit back and gesture for her to continue. I went ahead and did a little more digging into Ruby's debt at the Stardust Casino, she says. Her creditor is a man called Thomas O'Shea. I think you're probably familiar with him. He's related to Kevin Lynch. He is, I say, nodding. I'm impressed by her research. He was friendlier with the Walshes than he ever was with Lynch, but they do business together. So, what should we do? Alexis asks. What do you think we should do? I counter. I get the feeling Alexis already has an idea, and in all likelihood, it's probably a good one. I'm beginning to discover that she's a keen strategist. Alexis licks her lip. She understands how monumental it is for me, the mob boss, to be asking her advice, and she doesn't want to disappoint me. I know we talked before about pressuring Ruby with the debt, 
she says. But that would involve either us paying off O'Shea or bringing him onto our side somehow. An easier and cheaper solution would just be to discredit Ruby. Oh, I say. And how do we do that? We out her connection to the Irish mob, the primary distributor of purple heroin in the city, and spin it so that it seems like she's trying to take you down because you're reopening treatment centers to combat the war on drugs. She smiles. Nobody will care that it's not true, especially if we leak details of her affair and gambling addiction. Her reputation will be so tarnished that they'll have no choice but to take her off the case, and at that point, it won't be difficult to get the case thrown out entirely. Alexis is nearly breathless with excitement by the time she's finished. She watches me, eager for any sign of a reaction. She wants to please me. She wants to impress me. She always does. It's a good plan, I tell her. My chest swells with pride. She's going to give Silvano a run for his money with her scheme and once he's back on his feet. She grins. Thank you. For a second, the brightness of her smile pushes away the dark clouds that were hovering over me only moments before. I don't think about the dead, or how many more are still to die. I don't think about what will happen if I lose this war, and what else I will lose with it. I only think of Alexis and our family, and how bright my life is with them in it. It is the most peace I've felt in days. I drag my heavy limbs up the stairs and down the hall, feeling as though I am more stone than man. Another long day. I spent most of the day working on Bellucci Incorporated's business, and the rest of it chasing down Kevin Lynch. He's an elusive bastard, I'll give him that. I tire of this game of hide-and-seek, but no matter what leads I follow or whose face I break, I can't find him. On the plus side... One of the men we interrogated today was responsible for the warehouse bombing. It was my personal pleasure to dole out the appropriate justice. It's late now. I know when I go into Alexis's room, I will find her sleeping soundly, and that once I settle down next to her, it will only be a matter of time until I am doing the same. I always sleep easier with Alexis. My thoughts often torment me and keep me awake when I am alone. But with her, it's like I have already slipped into the dream before sleep can catch up. I twist the knob on Alexis's door and walk in, then begin to strip down in the dark. Hey. She greets quietly from the bed. You're awake. I shuck off my shirt and pants and cross the room, sliding onto the mattress next to her. Her warmth seeps into my bones, and my eyelids feel heavy already. I wrap an arm around her and pull her in close. Yeah, can't sleep. She grunts and curls in against my side. I've got wicked cramps. <laughs> cramps? My eyes flick open, sleep scampering out of reach. Yeah, she hisses. I'm considering just getting up to go do some work. I don't think I'll be getting to sleep anytime soon. How long have you been having the cramps, I ask. Why didn't you tell me? Alexis detects the stress in my voice and runs a hand over my cheek. It's only been a couple of hours. You were busy. I didn't want to bother you. Alexis, I say through gritted teeth. If you're in pain, I need to know. I sit up, hot hammering against my ribs and shuffle to the end of the bed. I'm calling the doctor. I'm sure it's nothing, she protests. I'm calling the doctor. Alexis sighs and lies back in bed. I turn the light on and fish my phone out of my pant pocket, dialing the number for Dr. Steinman and waiting as it rings. He answers, somewhat groggily, and I demand his presence at the house. I'll be there right away, he says, and I hear him shuffling in the background probably rushing to get dressed. Good, I hang up. I approach the bed, and Alexis sticks a tongue out at me. You're freaking out over nothing, she says. Then her face contorts in pain. 
I get on the bed and pull her into my lap, cradling her in my arms. Fuck, what if something's really wrong? I can't lose her. I can't lose this baby. Gabriel, she hisses. Too tight. I'm squeezing her, crap. I loosen my hold and the Lexus chuckles. Honestly, I'm going to be fine. But what if you're not? I don't say. Because I cannot even face that possibility. Dr. Steinman arrives quickly, so I don't have much time to stew. When he gets here, he suggests that I give them some space while he examines Alexis, and I suggest that unless he intends to remove me himself, he should get on with it. That earns me a glare from Alexis. The examination takes a frustratingly long time. Dr. Steinman asks questions and Alexis answers. He prods around his stomach. Sometimes they make little jokes. Neither of them seems stressed about the situation, and for some reason that stresses me out more. If anything happens to Alexis or this baby, I am going to string Dr. Steinman up from the ceiling. Finally, the doctor provides his diagnosis. The cramps are normal, he says. It could be anything from the rapid growth of the fetus, to changing hormone levels, to gas. Nothing to worry about. I'd recommend some acetaminophen for the pain. Cool relief floods through me. I lean against the wall and let out a long breath, watching as the doctor packs up his things and hands Alexis the pills. Thank you, she says, smiling. My men will show you out. I add, gesturing toward the door. Dr. Steinman nods as he passes me, looking somewhat nervous. Good. I'm glad I make him uneasy. When we are alone again, I climb onto the bed with Alexis and pull her into my arms, careful not to squeeze this time. Thank God, I whisper. I was so worried. It's fine, Gabriel, she says with a laugh. You need to chill out more. How can I? I reply. I don't know what I would do if something happened to our child. And in this, I am powerless. She strokes my cheek, pressing a soft kiss to my shoulder. I know. I let my eyes fall closed. Both of us fall asleep like that, fully dressed, with the lights on, tangled in each other's arms. Gabriel. I am startled awake by a knock at the door early the next morning. Alexis slumbers on, mouth agape, snoring slightly. She's still the most beautiful creature I've ever seen. I gently extricate myself from the bed and tiptoe toward the door, not wanting to wake her. She needs all the rest she can get, so I'm annoyed that somebody has deigned to wake us, though... If they have, it must be important. I open the door a crack and slide through, closing it quietly behind me. Angelo is waiting for me, smiling. Silvano's awake, he whispers. The doctor's just finished checking him out, and it looks like he's going to be okay. Thank fuck. I take a deep breath. Have Victoria bring some coffee up to his room. I'm going to talk to him. Angelo nods and heads for the stairs. I walk down to the makeshift hospital ward and knock on the door before letting myself in. Silvano is sitting up in bed, and he straightens a little when he sees me enter. His skin is pale, though there's more color in it than there was the last time I saw him. He's no longer knocking on death's door. Hey, boss. He greets with an easy smile. His lips are dry and cracked. I knew you would pull through. I sit on the chair next to his bed. I'm just surprised it took you so long. Silvano lets out a bark of laughter. <laughs> Sorry, stopped for coffee on my way back to the world of the living. His smile fades a second later as though sobered by the realization of how close he came to joining his brother. I'm glad you're here. 
I learned some things before we were attacked that you really need to know. Suddenly I realize it wasn't the thought of death that sobered him, it's the tale he lived to tell. What is it? I ask. First, some good news, he says. I think I know where Kevin Lynch is. I overheard a conversation about a warehouse on the docks where Lynch is lying low. Since they don't have much docks territory, he should be easy enough to find. And the bad news. Silvano's gray eyes blink slowly. It's about Alexis, he murmurs. I don't know if it's true. Just tell me, Silvano. And he does. Victoria comes into the room with a tray of coffee and two croissants just as he finishes, but I'm too shell-shocked by his words to stay for another second. I need to find out if there's any truth in it. And if there is, fuck. I don't know what I'll do. I don't know if there's anything I can do. Victoria, why don't you stay and keep Silvano company for a bit, I suggest, already on my way to the door. She turns, a little bewildered by my evident distress. Okay, sure. I call Antonio the second time out the door. From the thickness of his voice, I can tell that I have woken him, but I don't care. I tell him what Silvano told me. I need you to find out if it is true, I say. It can't be. It doesn't make any sense. Just find out, I order. And prepare the men for war. I think we finally located Kevin Lynch. I spend most of the day avoiding Alexis, which isn't fair. It's like I'm worried that the second she sees me, she will read on my face what Silvano told me, even though I know that's ridiculous. I just don't know what to say to her, so I say nothing. I have a good excuse anyway, as I am busy preparing to finally put an end to Lynch. Antonio works quickly, and by the time dusk has settled over the trees, we are ready to go into battle. Only then... Can I no longer avoid Alexis? There is a chance I won't return from this mission. I enter the nursery, where I find Alexis reading to Harry in the armchair in the corner of the room. What's wrong? She asks, immediately picking up on my stress. I have to go, I say. I have some urgent business to take care of. Harry looks over when he hears my voice and smiles. Dada! Alexis's eyes flash with concern. This time is different. Why? I walk over, lifting Harry into my arms. He smells like baby powder and innocence. I hold him close, rocking back and forth. We think we've found Kevin Lynch, I say. And if we have, he's going to be well protected. Alexis stands, folding her arms. She looks angry, which surprises me. Did you come in here to say goodbye? She asks in a clipped voice, her blue eyes narrow on mine. I did, I admit. Just in case. Harry twists his chubby finger in a lock of my hair and tugs. It hurts, but I can't help but laugh. This in turn melts some of Alexis's stern expression, though it ices back up again a moment later. She gets out of the chair and stands in front of me, trying to look big and fierce despite the gap in our height. Alexis reaches up and holds my face in her hands, dragging my chin down to look at her. You will not say goodbye, Gabriel Bellucci, because you will make sure you return home safely. You will come back to your family. She wrenches me closer and leans up on her tiptoes before I have a chance to respond. Her kiss is wild, passionate, aggressive. It is a kiss that reminds me of exactly who I belong to and who I am beholden to. It's the kiss of a queen. Eeny, meeny, miny, moe.
Dom says, point in between the three warehouses on the map spread between us. Where to start? Dom, Antonio, and I are parked just outside of the Irish Docks territory. Three dozen men are awaiting my command, and I don't hesitate to give it. He's in the middle one, I say, point into the correspondent building on the map. I'm sure of it. Kevin Lynch is a coward. He would want to be at the very center of the territory, surrounded by protection. I want us in, and then I want us out, I instruct. As soon as we have eyes on Lynch, he's our priority. I want to bring him back to the mansion for questioning, so keep him alive. Dom and Antonio nod in agreement and take out their phones to send these orders down the chain of command. I check the clip on my semi-automatic rifle while they do, even though I've checked it four times already. We need this win. If Lynch slips through our fingers again, we may never catch him. Orders delivered, we press forward. My pulse thrums. I can feel the vein in my neck throbbing, and my forehead prickles with sweat. Everything seems to go in slow motion at first, as our convoy crawls through the empty dockyard. Headlights off, the only source of light from the dim lamps that reflect in the puddles on the concrete. We stop outside of the warehouse I pointed to on the map. From the outside, it looks empty. Quiet. At least, for a moment. Chaos erupts in the air around us then, and we are no longer in slow motion. Lynch's men start to shoot at us, from what seems like every direction. They are on the rooftops streaming out of the warehouse's yawning front door. We pile out of our SUVs and return fire. I expected them to be ready. Their lookout at the entrance of the dockyard was anything but discreet in his frantic radioing, and I'm not stupid enough to think that we could actually catch them wholly by surprise. But that's okay. We came here to fight, not to sneak. And it's going to be one hell of a fight. Dom and Antonio flank me as we approach the middle building with a handful of men. Dom and Antonio shoot at the surrounding rooftops while I take out the two men firing from just inside the warehouse door. I shoot one in the head, but the other I only manage to clip in the shoulder. Nevertheless, he stops shooting. Another takes his place, but there is nowhere to take cover, so I shoot relentlessly to keep him from firing back. Fuck! Antonio hisses. I look over, and he is holding his shoulder, red blooming beneath his hand. Can you still shoot? I ask. Try and fucking stop me, he roars, more to our Irish assailants than to me. He manages to hit one of the men on the rooftop of the building to our left, and his body falls to the cement with a sickening thump. We keep pressing forward. We're nearly at the door to the warehouse now, and the thug who is firing at us from just inside makes a hasty retreat. I know that once we get inside the door, there will be more waiting for us. The fight is far from over. Spread out, I order. Dom, did you bring what I asked? Dom pulls the grenade out of his pocket with a wicked grin. Of course I did. It's rude to show up to someone's house without bringing a gift for the host. I laugh. <laughs> well then, I think it's time for you to do the polite thing and deliver your present. I make a hand gesture to the rest of the men outside, warning them to hold back for a moment. Dom pulls the pin from the grenade and chucks it into the open warehouse door. We duck down, hands over our ears. The explosion nearly knocks me on my ass. Heat floods out from the warehouse, and from inside, there is a cacophony of screams and groans. Go! I yell. We flood into the building while its occupants are still reeling from the explosion. Gunshots crack through the air as we take out one after another after another. A couple of my men fall down and don't get back up again, and... That only makes me more savage in the delivery of my justice. Come with me, I say to Dom. We're going to find Lynch. To Antonio, I yell. Cover us! Dom and I slip through the carnage. 
down a row of crates, and then finally to the set of offices at the end of the warehouse. It's quieter back here, but I don't let that fool me. If Lynch is back here, he's protected. Dom tries the first door, but it's locked. He launches his stocky form against it until the lock breaks and the door swings open. A shot rings out from inside, and Dom crumples in the doorway, hissing in pain before angling his gun and shooting at the person inside. I press my back to the wall next to the frame and grab Dom's arm, tugging him out of danger. There's two in there, he murmurs, squeezing his eyes shut in pain. They shot him in the leg. I think one's Lynch. My heart picks up. This could be it. Can you get up? I ask quickly, knowing that any second now, one of the assailants will come out to finish the job. Dom shakes his head. I'll shuffle into the door and cover you, though. You'll be a sitting duck, I argue. He takes a breath, nostrils flaring. His mud-brown eyes meet mine. Better me than you. He starts to drag himself into the doorway before I can say anything else, and I know I have to act quick or my capo will be dead. I dart into the room just as one of the men inside takes a shot at Dom. He roars with pain, and the sound is like nails on a chalkboard. I take quick stock of the situation. There are two men, just like Dom said. One is sitting at the back wall, gun drawn. He's the one who shot Dom. The other I immediately recognize as Kevin Lynch, despite half of his face being obscured by the desk he is crouched behind. Fucking coward. I duck and charge the standing gunman, who fires at me but misses. I slam him into the wall behind the desk and start to wrestle the gun from his hand. He's smaller than me, but his movements are quick, and he manages to slide out of my grasp before I can get the gun. I turn and aim, but notice Kevin raise his arm in the periphery of my vision. Shit. I swing around and shoot, hoping to hit him in the arm. No such luck. Blood spurts from the wound in his throat. I hear another gunshot, and I look over. The other gunman has fallen to the floor. Dead. Dom groans and lets his hand fall to the side. His face is ashen. I need to get him help but if I leave Lynch, he will die before I get a chance to question him. I have to think quickly. Lynch is sputtering, face down on the floor. I flip him onto his back and press the heel of my foot against his neck. Tell me if it's true, I demand. My voice comes out wild and desperate. I'm running out of time and we both know it. Lynch coughs, black blood staining his lips. I can only see the whites of his eyes. Is what true? He croaks. I repeat what Silvano told me. Lynch coughs again, but then smiles. It's true. I am so angry that the only thing I can think to do is put a bullet in his brain, even though he would have been dead in minutes anyway. Lynch goes limp. I race over to Dom. Where are you shot? I say. Dom doesn't open his eyes. My chest and my leg, he answers faintly. The wound in his leg seems to be bleeding more, so I start to apply pressure there. It's okay, boss, Dom says. Now that the shooting has stopped, it's quite peaceful. The shooting has stopped. I hadn't even noticed. I hear footfalls approaching and whip my gun up, hands shaking from the adrenaline searing through my veins, but I'm relieved to see my own men jogging toward me and not Lynch's. I turn my attention back to Dom. His skin is pale and waxy. Dom, open your fucking eyes. He does, though his eyelids seem heavy. He has always been a good soldier. We've been through far too much together. I hiss. You don't get to throw in the fucking towel now, do you hear me? I hear you, he says in a gravelly voice. Gio kneels down beside us and presses on the wound in Dom's chest. We've cleared the area, he informs me. 
The rest of them ran off when it became obvious it was a fight they wouldn't win. Felicity, I ask. Geo shakes his head. No sign of a... Fuck. My head swims with everything that I've learned. Everything that has happened. I can hardly believe that Lynch is actually dead. Before I can think about anything else, I need to gather up the wounded and get my men out of here. It could be only a matter of minutes before the Irish return with reinforcements. Can we move him? I ask Geo, who has some medical training. He nods. We have to. The two of us carry Dom out while Antonio pulls out the rest of the men, coordinating the removal of the dead and wounded and setting fire to the warehouse once everyone is out. Dom groans and hisses the whole way to the waiting SUV, but I take that as a good sign. He's going to make it. He has to. I can't lose anyone else. Gio manages to stanch the bleeding in the car, and we drop him and Dom off at a private medical center for further treatment. On the way, Antonio reports three dead and five more wounded, though none as bad as Dom. All in all, the attack was a success. I wish we had been able to take Lynch alive, though. Felicity will go into hiding now, and without her lover's help, I doubt we will be able to find her. That's a problem for another time. Right now, all I can think about is getting home to my family. When we reach the mansion, I hop out of the SUV before it has even come to a complete stop. I rush up the front steps and into the foyer. For the first time, I regret having such a large house. Is she upstairs in the nursery or downstairs in the living room? Angelo and Clara walk into the foyer from the direction of the living room. Alexis is through there, Angelo offers. I nod to him and dart down the hall. It isn't until I'm in the living room that I realize Angelo and Clara were holding hands. Alexis is sitting on the couch with her laptop bounced on a knee when I enter. There is an open bag of Twizzlers next to her, and one is dangling from her lips. She looks up and smiles, biting off the end of the Twizzler and chewing as she closes the lid of a computer and sets it aside. Hey, she says, as though she isn't at all surprised to see me alive, as though she had full confidence that I would keep my promise and come back to her, as though it doesn't faze her to see me covered in blood. She unfolds herself from the couch and picks away through the room until she is in front of me a small hands resting on my chest. It's not yours, right? She asks. I look down at my shirt and hands, stained brown with dried blood. I shake my head. It's not mine. I need to tell her. I need to tell her what Kevin Lynch confirmed with his last gurgling breath. I missed you. Alexis says, and pops up on her toes to press a soft kiss on my cheek. My heart thuds, and I pull her into my arms. I need to tell her. But not tonight. Gabriel The problem with the calm before the storm is that even though you know the storm is coming, the calm still feels good. You still want to relax in it, revel in it. Enjoy that, even just for this moment, the chaos cannot reach you. I have had a week of this calm since I killed Kevin Lynch. I can tell that something big is brewing. Fuck, I can practically taste it on the wind, see the clouds gathering on the horizon, bloated and gray. But it still feels good not to spend my days in chaos and to be able to take the time to enjoy some of life's more subtle pleasures. like. Bring in my woman flowers. I knock on the door to Alexis's room, the scent of roses tickling my nose from the bouquet in my hand. Come in, she calls. I enter. Alexis is sitting at a desk, typing on her laptop. She has been threading together all of her research to write a follow-up article to the one that caused me so much trouble the last time. She worries she will never finish it because, in her mind, the only appropriate ending would be a happy report that purple heroin has been pushed from New York's streets forever. 
In the past week, the market has been flooded with the drug, which is partly how I know the worst is still yet to come. Hey, she says, without looking up. Where's Harry? She jabs her head in the direction of the nursery. I literally just got him to go to sleep, so don't start screaming or anything. I approach the desk, and Alexis finally looks up from her work. Her face splits into a wide grin when she sees the roses. Are those for me? She asks, closing the lid of her laptop. No. I bring the roses up to my nose and sniff them thoughtfully. They're for my other girlfriend. Do you think she'll like them? I can see Alexis's attention snag on the title of girlfriend. We rarely ever talk about what we are, and almost never broach the subject of what we feel. Girlfriend feels like an extraordinarily weak descriptor for what Alexis is to me. You're a dog. She snatches the roses out of my hand and cradles them to her chest. Did you purposefully get me the same kind of roses as the ones you sent when I was living in the apartment? I can still remember the delight on Alexis's face as I watched her on the screen, receiving her flowers, the way it made my stomach flip, and I didn't know why. Yes, I say. Because, as it turns out, I'm not terribly creative. She laughs and sits the roses on the desk walking around it to place her hands on the lapels of my jacket. Alexis senses the oncoming storm just as much as me, but over the past week, she has become a more relaxed, joyful version of herself. When she looks up at me now, it is with bright blue eyes that sparkle with mirth and a cheeky tilt to her full lips. How can I thank you? Alexis asks. Her voice has grown husky full of promise. Blood instantly starts to gather in my cock. She has that effect on me. I have gone years without indulging in a woman's touch. But with Alexis, as soon as the thought enters my head, I have to have her. She's mine, and that claim is one I need to stake over and over again. Hmm. I brush my thumb over her cheek. I can think of a couple ways, though there is a risk it would wake Harry. Perhaps I should just go. I pretend to turn away, and Alexis follows. I can be quiet. Can you? I chuckle, lower in my mouth to hers. <laughs> I'll be holding you to that. We kiss. It's a delicate, almost hesitant touch, like two lovers discovering each other for the first time. My cock is insistent that I get Alexis on her back as soon as possible, but I like taking my time with her. I like the way she sighs when I run a hand over her back, or the way she clutches onto my shirt desperately when I deepen the kiss. I guide her back toward the bed. My hands roam over her body, feeling the taut plane of her back, the ample flesh of her ass, the soft curve of her waist. I press her tightly to my body. I love the way she feels against me, the way her tits flatten against my chest. I love the jut of her hip bones and the way she fits so neatly within my arms that it's like she was made for me. I pull away Alexis's shirt and kiss down her shoulders as I loosen her bra. She moans softly, and the sound sends wildfire blasting through my body. But that's not the game we're playing. Shh, I warn, nipping her throat. I want you completely quiet. She nods, and a hand slides between us to land on my impatient bulge. A quiver goes through me. Now I'm the one struggling to stay silent. I push her back onto the bed. I love the way her tits jiggle. I am unable to resist the urge to lean over and suck one pink-tipped nipple into my mouth. Alexis's fingers claw into my scalp, and I can tell she's trying very hard not to make any noise. I move to the other nipple, rubbing at her mound as I do. The fingers tighten, 
She's trying very, very hard. I smile as I move down her body, kissing over her stomach and to the top of her pants. I undo them and pull them over her legs. She's wearing a pink lacy thong underneath. When I rub over the top of it, the fabric is damp. Fuck, she's already so wet. I don't think I can hold out from fucking her much longer. My cock is uncomfortably hot against the zipper of my pants. I crawl off the bed to undress, and Alexis watches me with sexy, half-lidded eyes. She looks like a wet dream. Finally, I pull her panties over her legs and drop them on the floor. Her naked skin feels like velvet against mine as I climb over her. My cock rubs between her folds, and the sensation of that alone is nearly enough to make me groan with delight. Alexis pulls my face to hers and kisses me deeply. I grind against her. Electricity skitters over my skin, and everything outside of this bed slows down to a standstill. The head of my cock rubs over her entrance, and I guide my hips forward, relishing her tight heat. Alexis moans. It's quiet, but it's still not allowed. But something about this moment feels different to our usual dynamic, and I don't want to punish her. I want to show her my soft edges. I want to feel hers. Shh, I whisper, and then cover her mouth with mine for a sensual soft kiss. I bring my hips to meet hers and then pull out again. The tension inside of me builds with each languid thrust. I fuck her like we have all the time in the world, like our enemies aren't converging on all sides, like we are just two normal souls colliding in the ether. Alexis's fingers draw a map of passion on my back. Her kiss grows more insistent as she gets closer to coming, and I start to thrust harder. She bites down on the pillow to keep from moaning, and I bite down on her. Our movements grow desperate, frantic. I feel a tug of need in my balls. I need to come. I need to feel her body squeeze me as she comes too. Alexis releases a muffled cry into the pillow, and the world turns three degrees to the left. She milks me, and I come, hard, jamming my length inside of her one final time. Euphoria spreads through my limbs like a warm mist. I shudder. We lie in each other's arms for a long time after that, still silent, but only because it feels like we can communicate just by touch. The wind rustles through the leaves outside. The clock ticks slowly away on the wall. The calm before the storm. The knock on the door is barely perceptible. I wouldn't have heard it if I hadn't already been awake. Whoever it is has something important to tell me, but not important enough to wake me up. Interesting. I get up, careful not to move Alexis too much, and quickly dress. When I slip outside the room, Silvano is waiting for me with a strange expression on his face. He looks confused, almost pained, but also a little happy. Good morning, boss, he says quietly. Good morning, I yawn. Coffee? We head downstairs to the kitchen. Silvano is a little slower than usual, but given the fact that he nearly died a week ago yet has insisted on getting back to work, I don't hold it against him. Victoria is in the kitchen when we arrive. She's kneading dough, but stops when she sees us and wipes her hands on her apron. She gives Silvano a sweet smile. Back for more? I chuckle. So, this is not the first time Silvano has gotten coffee this morning. You make the best coffee, he replies. Can you blame me? Victoria laughs and starts to prepare our coffees. Silvano sits on one of the island stools with a wheeze and rubs a hand over his chest. Why does nobody talk about how much it fucking hurts to get shot? I know what he means. I was shot three times a few months ago, and I still feel twinges of pain sometimes. I presume there is something you wanted to tell me, I ask. 
Silvano nods, his gray eyes waver with uncertainty. Yeah, I got word from the police department this morning that they're dropping all charges against you. Is that so? My eyebrows lift. This is excellent news, but my second looks far from ecstatic about it. From what I understand through some of my police contacts, certain external pressures have lessened over the past week. Then with Ruby Flint being taken off the case, the department has decided it's no longer worth their time to pursue. Certain external pressures. Victoria sets an espresso down in front of me, and I lift it. I presume you mean the cartel. He nods. From the sounds of it. I take a sip. The bitter liquid is hot and burns my tongue. It tastes amazing, though. Victoria does a good espresso. You don't look happy, Silvano. I muse. Were you hoping to see me locked up? He shakes his head. Of course not. It's just that something doesn't feel right about this. I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. The air hisses and crackles with the sound of Victoria steaming milk. I meet Silvano's silver gaze, and I know we're both thinking about the same thing. The secret we learned. Felicity isn't about to let this go so quickly. I don't think we'll have to wait long, I tell him, taking another sip of my espresso. I'd say we're about due for another calamity. Victoria slides the cappuccino in front of Silvano. He thanks her and lifts his cup toward me. Well, at least there's good coffee. I go back to Alexis's room after my coffee with Silvano. She wakes when I close the door behind me, long lashes blinking open. Hey, she smiles. Where'd you go? I was just talking to Silvano. I explain as I crawl up the bed, peppering her with kisses. The police have dropped their investigation into me. That's great, she exclaims. Then she frowns. That is great, isn't it? Why the sour mug? I chuckle and collapse next to her. It is great, you're right. I'm just nervous. I don't like how Felicity just disappeared. We can be vigilant, but still take our wins when we can. Alexis throws her arm around me, nuzzling against my chest. Are you sure that's all that's bothering you? I consider telling her. If now isn't a good time, then when is? But I just can't face it. Not now. Not when she's so happy and when telling her what I know will break her heart. There's something I want to show you. I say instead. A distraction will be good for both of us. David drops us off in front of a proud Victorian revival on a quiet street lined with maple trees, their burnished leaves waving weakly in the afternoon breeze. The air smells like freshly mown grass and mulch, and Alexis inhales deeply the second she steps out of the car. Can I take my blindfold off now? She asks. I smile. Yes. Alexis rips away the blindfold and blinks as her eyes adjust to the light. Her grin loosens just a little, and she looks at me in confusion. It's our house, she says. And then, scrunching her forehead. Is this still our house? A few months ago, I purchased the house for Alexis and me something smaller than the mansion where we could hopefully achieve a level of normalcy. We came here one time before Alexis published the article that tore us apart, and it has been waiting for us to return ever since. It's still our house, I say, wrapping my arm around her. The surprise is actually inside. She brightens. Show me. We climb the front porch the wood squeaking softly under our weight. Inside, the house is just as we left it. Empty rooms and bare walls. I gave Alexis carte blanche to decorate it, but she never got the chance. 
I figured she wouldn't mind if I took the initiative to breathe life into one of the rooms. I lead Alexis up the stairs and past the door to the master bedroom. Next to that room is a smaller one, currently painted a light sea foam. And the one next to that... Alexis gasps. Is this... She trails off, spinning around to face me with a wide smile on her face. Is this for the baby? I had the new nursery painted in a sunshine yellow color and outfitted with sleek, white wooden furniture. It's similar to Harry's nursery at the mansion, but a little smaller. Homier. There is a fluffy armchair in the corner by the window, overlooking a tree in the backyard that I think would be perfect for a treehouse. It is, I reply. But you're going to have to start making plans now if you want the rest of the house to be finished by the time the baby arrives. Alexis leaps into my arms, legs tight around my hips. She giggles and kisses my forehead, then my cheek, then my lips. We're going to be so happy here, she says wistfully, gazing around. I can just feel it. A smile is infectious. There was something else I wanted to say to you as well, I say. What is it? She lowers her legs, and I release her, though she stays close. I don't know how she will react to this. I am going to hold a dinner in my city penthouse, I begin. A dinner in your honor. She cocks a brow. In my honor? Why would it be in my honor? I gather Alexis's face in my hands, looking deep into a sea blue irises. Because all of my most trusted men and their wives will be there, and I want to anoint you as my queen in front of everyone. Alexis sucks in a breath. I can't tell whether she hates the idea or loves it at first. And then... The corners of her mouth twitch up into a smile. Her hands bunch into the front of my shirt, drawing me closer. I love you, Gabriel, she whispers. The words are more delectable than chocolate. I didn't realize how much I'd wanted to hear them until they danced from her lips. I love you too, I whisper back. Alexis. Stop freaking out. I'm not freaking out. You're absolutely freaking out. Clara bats a pretzel out of my hand and glares down at me. You're practically vibrating. Just chill a little. Chill a little, I mutter. The spotlight is going to be on me tonight. What if I make an ass out of myself in front of everyone? All Gabriel's men? All their wives? Clara goes to the closet and pulls out the garment bag with my new dress in it. It arrived yesterday, a gift from Gabriel. I haven't tried it on yet, but I know it will fit perfectly. Gabriel will have had it made for my measurements. I wish you were going, I say. Why would I be going? Clara turns away from me to hide the blush on her pale cheeks. It's not like I'm married to any of Gabriel's men. I snicker. No, but at this rate, you could be. Clara hangs the dress over the closet door and removes the wrapping, fingering the delicate green silk. Shut up. Angelo's not a capo, so he wouldn't have been invited anyway. He might be a capo one day, I say in a sing-song voice. Clara, who has grown more and more comfortable with the mafia lifestyle, shrugs, but there is a hopeful gleam in her eyes. There's a knock on the door, and I bolt out of my seat. That'll be Sandra, I say. Sandra? Who the hell is Sandra? Before Clara can get too jealous, I pause at the door and wink at her. My stylist. Sandra bustles into the room in a cloud of strawberry-scented perfume. She looks exactly the same as she did when I last saw her, when she made me up before the fundraiser where I first met Patrick Walsh. Every inch of her 5'5 frame is primped and polished, 
glossy chestnut curls, a perfect, even tan, and a set of teeth so white I have to squint to look at them. It's good to see you, darling, she greets jovially. Where should I set up? I sit at the desk and wait as Sandra lays out her hair and makeup tools around me. Clara sits on the bed and watches with a wistful smile. And I would bet anything she's picturing her own future pampering session at the hands of Sandra. My cell phone rings, and I go to silence it. Then I see who's calling. I look up at Clara and frown. It's Debbie. Really? Clara cocks her head a little. Are you going to get it? Should I? The last time I talked to Debbie, we both threatened each other. She followed through on hers. I didn't. Clara shrugs. But I know that I'll only wonder if I don't answer. So I pick up the phone. I wasn't expecting to hear from you again so soon, I say. If you're calling to blackmail me again, it won't work. I, I figured that after it didn't work the last time, she comments grimly. I come in peace. Sandra starts brushing through my hair, and I grimace as she savagely drags the bristles through the knots at the back. Peace? I'm not even sure you know what that word means. Debbie has been a constant antagonist and occasional friend since I first started working at the New York Union around three years ago. I used to take the stairs up to my office to avoid walking past her desk. The woman can be a nightmare. Well, it's certainly not the first word in my vocabulary, she admits. So what do you want? Sandra starts curling my hair, apparently not bothered at all that my phone is obscuring half of my head. I heard the charges were dropped against your man, she says. Congratulations. Thank you. We're both very pleased that the police finally accepted his innocence. I can hear the sly grin in Debbie's voice. Sure you are, Hen. But that's not the main reason for my call. Oh? Clara is watching the scene unfold with interest. She has seen me going from cursing the very ground Debbie Harris walks on, to forming a tentative friendship, to outright threatening her livelihood. She's very curious to see how this plays out. Yes, as it turns out, I recently found myself in a wee pickle, Debbie says. You see, the paper has been struggling as of late. I was lacking maybe at having to lay some folks off, and I really wasn't keen on the idea. Lucky I'm no longer on the chopping block, I muse. I would have been the first to go. Lucky indeed. Luckier still that a very generous anonymous donation has been made in my name to both the paper itself and the Finn Stryker Foundation. My mouth goes dry. The Finn Stryker Foundation was what started it all for Gabriel and me. He made a large donation, and because of that, Debbie assigned me to interview him. To be fair, I suppose things started between us when we had sex in a VIP booth two years earlier, but our paths might have never crossed again if not for the Finn Stryker Foundation. That's very fortunate for you, I say. Debbie laughs humorlessly. I, too fortunate. We both know where that money has come from and what it's for. Debbie, I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't, though I can guess. I told Gabriel I didn't want to hurt Debbie, and so he's taken the approach of the carrot rather than the stick. But will that work on a wily old fox like Debbie? I think you do, she says. I did consider rejecting this donation. However, I believe it would be easier for everyone if I were just to accept it. What do you think? I smirk. Yes, I should think that's wise. The reason for my call then, Alexis, is to say goodbye. Am I detecting a hint of sadness in Debbie's voice? Surely not. 
We could still do some great work together, Debbie, I say. I'm looking to start producing a non-profit publication for Bellucci Incorporated soon. I could use a sharp mind like yours. Debbie snorts. Not a feckin' chance. Worth a shot, I chuckle. Have a good life, Alexis. And take care of yourself. You too, Debbie. The line goes dead, and I find myself blinking away tears. I set my phone on the desk and take a deep breath. What's wrong with me? Clara leans over and rubs her hand over my cheek. It's for the best, babe, she says. I sniff. I know. Make sure you get all the tears out now, Sandra chirps from behind me. Once I get your makeup on, a single tear will make you look like a swamp monster. I'm made up, done up, and dressed. My eyes are outlined in gold and black, and my lips a decadent red. The green dress wraps tightly around my bosom, and the long skirt swishes dramatically when I walk. It also has the added sexiness of a slit high up my thigh on one side. To top it all off, there was a necklace hung inside the garment bag that I didn't see before because I didn't try it on. The string of diamonds twinkles on my neck, bold and beautiful. I couldn't even guess at the cash value of such a luxurious piece of jewelry. I can't stop staring at myself. There is a knock on the door. It's Gabriel. This is your ten minute warning. I'm ready, I call to him. You can come in. Gabriel enters, and his jaw drops when he sees me. I smile coquettishly and do a little twirl. I thought I'd try not making us late for once, I tease. What do you think? He crosses the room, inky eyes swallowing me up with every step. Clara and Sandra take the opportunity to slink out into the hall, and I don't blame them. It is starting to get seriously hot in here. Gabriel's hands skim over my waist, and he pulls me tight to him. I think about that afternoon a few days ago, when we stood in the nursery of our unborn child and confessed our love to each other. Hearing those words was a balm to the part of my heart that still ached from our overdrawn game of push and pull. The only problem is that now, I don't want to go anywhere or do anything. I just want to make love and eat Doritos in bed. You look good enough to eat, Gabriel murmurs into my ear. Don't think you won't be doing just that once this shindig is over, I whisper back. He hums appreciatively into the skin of my throat and then backs away. There is a strange look in his eyes, one that I struggle to decipher. It's almost guarded. It looks out of place for this tender moment. What's wrong, I say. Gabriel's jaw ticks. He goes to the window and looks out, his hands thrust in his pockets. I imagine painting him like that. Portrait of a mood swing. I follow Gabriel to the window and rest my hand on his arm. We both stare out at the rolling green lawn, at the bruised purple sky, at the mist gathering above the grass. There is something I have to tell you, Gabriel begins. I'm about to crown you queen of the city, and if I'm going to do that, I can't lie to you. My heart stops on a dime. What now? I picture myself stuffing the words back in his mouth. It's not that I would rather turn the other cheek when it comes to the horrors of this life. But right at this second, I'm just not ready to hear whatever it is. I'm already vibrating with nerves about this dinner party. Half of the people there probably think I'm some common bimbo who trapped Gabriel with a baby. I bet none of them think I'm the right person for the job. Gabriel. I start to tell him to stop, but he turns to me and places a hand on either arm. You have to know, he says. There is a wildness in his eyes now. 
The reason Felicity has been targeting you. The reason she sent you those strange texts. Gabriel forces the next few words out, even though it looks like they burn as they cross his tongue. Felicity Huffman is your mother. Everything stops for one second. My heart, my brain, my breathing, it all stops on a dime. And when it starts up again, the panic sets in. No, I shake my head, backing out of his grasp. That's not possible. I had a mother. I sat by her bedside while she died of what I thought was cancer. I pointed him. You were the one who found out that my father had been poisoning her. You know she existed. That was your father's mistress, he replies. He left Felicity when he moved you to New York, but you were too young to really remember her. I had my men search out your original birth certificate, and what about our dads, though? I spout. They were friends. Don't you think my dad would have mentioned that your dad's new squeeze was his ex-wife? He steps toward me, and I step back, sending him a warning look. Gabriel sighs. Felicity is a world-class psychopath who lives to manipulate those around her. I expect when she popped up on my father's arm, she and your father made an agreement to keep their past a secret. She was looking for a first-class ticket to the top, and he was looking to relieve his guilty conscience for dumping her in Kansas all those years before. Of course, that's just my speculation, but... How long have you known? My voice booms through the room. He meets my gaze unflinchingly. Silvano told me after the ambush. Anger sends a hot flush through me. Gabriel, that was nearly two weeks ago. Yes, but for the past two weeks, you've been lying to me. And now you drop this bombshell on me right before this important dinner? I yell, tears clinging to my lower lashes. I'm two seconds away from turning into a swamp monster. Are you fucking kidding me? I point to the door. Get out. I'm not going to this dinner. My chest is too tight. I need to get this dress off. My eyes sting. I just want to curl up in bed and cry. But I can't do that while Gabriel is still here. I'm so angry at him for not telling me. Gabriel stands a little taller, and rather than looking sheepish as I expected, his features hammer out into a stern frown. He steps closer. I step back. He steps closer. I step back. We continue this dance until my back is against the wall, and he is breathing down an inch from my face. You will come to the dinner, he says. The dinner is in your honor. And if you don't come, you will humiliate me in front of my men. And once you are there, you will eat and drink and dance. You will not mope. The harsh authority in his voice sends a tingle through me, as it always does. But I'm still furious. I grit my teeth and glare at him. Gabriel runs a hand through his hair. I didn't tell you sooner because I was waiting for the birth certificate. I'm sorry you had to hear it at all, but you did, and now you know. A tear spills down my cheek, and Gabriel looks away. Finish getting ready, he says, and I know he means clean yourself up, because for the first time, I was ready early. And now I'm going to cry off my makeup. Gabriel lopes out of the room, and both Clara and Sandra tiptoe back in a moment later. Clara comes to my side and wraps an arm around me. What happened? We heard shouting. Sandra is already dabbing away my tears and fixing my makeup. I want to snarl at her to leave me alone. But it's not the poor girl's fault my birth mother's a witch. I tell Clara what Gabriel told me and how he's still forcing me to go to this stupid dinner. She listens, nodding along sympathetically. 
He's not wrong, you know, she says when I finish. This shocks me. I blink, unsure that I just heard her right. You're on Gabriel's side? I ask incredulously. You've hated him from the beginning, Clara frowns. I still think he chose his moment to tell you poorly, and you should absolutely give him shit for that later. But for now, you've got to go to the dinner. The main currency in this life that we both seem to have waltzed into, besides actual currency, is obligation. If you say you're going to do something, you do it. If you vow not to, you keep your word. If you're going to be the queen of it all, you can't be flaky, even when you're upset and would rather do anything but. <sighs> You've got a point, I mutter begrudgingly. When did you get so pro-Gabriel? Clara smiles thinly. Behind me, Sandra starts to pack up her things. My time is running out, and soon I'll need to put on a brave face in front of everyone. I wouldn't go so far as to say I'm pro-Gabriel, Clara replies. But what I would say is that I see how happy he makes you. And now that I've gotten a taste of this world myself, I understand why you're here. I go to the mirror. Sandra has done a good job, though my eyes are the tiniest bit pink. But give him hell later, I repeat. Clara smiles at me in the mirror. Girl, you're a queen now. Later, you get to tear an absolute strip off him. Gabriel. Alexis hasn't looked at me for the entire limo ride. Her gaze is fixed on some distant point out the window, and the silence between us is unbearable. I should have told this sooner. I know that now. Alexis deals in hard facts, and I thought it would be better if I had the proof to back it up first. I told her the second I did have it, which just turned out to be right before we left the house for this dinner, and now she is furious with me. Alexis, I say. She glances over, as though annoyed that I've interrupted her reverie. Yes. This is an important test. You're a mafia queen now. Can you maintain a mafia queen demeanor with this news fresh in your mind? Is it really true? She asks in a small voice. The mask slips, and I realize she's not angry anymore. She's devastated. A single tear rolls down her cheek, and she rushes to pull out a hand mirror to clean up the black smudge it leaves. My chest tightens. I can't stand seeing her like this. I hated having to be so firm with her back in her bedroom, but I did what was necessary. Even so, I'm half tempted to cancel the whole circus and spend the night spoon feeding her Ben and Jerry's while we watch home improvement shows. But duty is duty. If she's going to be my queen, she has to understand that. It's true, I say. You should have told me the second you found out, she chastises. I can't believe you've been sitting on that for two weeks. She shakes her head, brushing past sadness and into anger again. This whole time, you've been making me prove that I'm worthy of your trust. But what about proving yourself to me? You're right, I admit. I should have told you, but I didn't. So all I can do now is promise I'll be more up front next time. Alexis laughs bitterly. There better not be a next time. I'm not sure how many more life-changing secrets I can take. I wish I could see what's going on inside her head. I barely knew my mother, so finding out that she wasn't the woman I grew up believing she was wouldn't be that hard of a blow. Finding out she was Felicity Huffman, on the other hand, that would tear me apart. Alexis, I take a hand, drawing her across the back seat until she is nestled against me. I'm sorry you're upset. 
I'm going to do everything I can to avoid giving you any more reasons to cry, because honestly, I'm not sure I can take it. She looks up, cracking a small smile. The big mafia man can't handle a few girl tears? I smile back. Don't tell anyone. Don't worry. Your secret is safe with me, she says. Though you've handed me the means of your destruction, and I think that was very unwise. I press a kiss into the top of a head. You were always the means of my destruction. That's never been a secret. Alexis has been to my penthouse apartment in the city once before, when we had lunch there as a family, and conducted our first family interview. It looks a lot different tonight. The elevator doors open to a red carpet, which leads down the hall and to the oversized double doors at the end. When we go through the doors, the grand ballroom is lit by hundreds of candles. They are stacked on every surface and hang from lanterns on the ceiling. The buttery glow illuminates the faces of our guests who are milling around the long banquet table when we enter. Dom and his wife Mira smile at us from across the room. He is leaning on a wooden crutch, but looks well otherwise. Mira's eyes flit over Alexis and me. She's wearing a pinched expression, her long blonde hair pulled back to emphasize her severe cheekbones and blazing blue eyes. One of the things my men's wives always struggle with is their husband's undying loyalty to me over all others. Most are more graceful about it than Mira. I scan the rest of the crowd. Antonio is standing front and center with a foaming beer and his wife, Sheila. Elia Conti is near the buffet with his wife, Aria. Mirko and his wife, Gina, are talking to Silvano, who stands out as the only single person in the room. Finally, Thomas Ricci and Piero Bianchi are clustered in the back of the room with their wives, Liz and Antonella. All eyes turn to me, and I slide my hand around Alexis's waist as I address the group. Welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. I gesture to the table. Please, take a seat. Once everyone is set, I walk to the table and pull out a chair at my right-hand side for Alexis, then take my seat at the head of the table. All of the men here have seen Alexis before, if only in passing. But it's obvious none of the wives have. They stare at her like she's a tropical bird, and I might chastise them for their rudeness if my ego didn't like it so much. Alexis is a sight to behold. I glance at Alexis to see how she is holding up under the scrutiny, and although her face is neutral, there is a panicked gleam in her eye. I'm disappointed. She's my ferocious tiger. She's not supposed to be afraid of anything. I clear my throat and raise to my feet, holding my glass aloft. Perhaps a speech will set her more at ease. I am pleased to see all of your faces gathered before me, I begin. It has been far too long since we have convened like this. Until recently, the city has been overrun with enemies and rife with violence, and it is only due to the brave efforts of the men here that our operation maintains its strength in the face of such adversity. But today is a celebration of the women amongst us. I glance down at Alexis. The women who bandage our wounds, who dare us to push our boundaries, and whose endless devotion feeds us and makes us strong enough to fight against what can sometimes feel like impossible odds. Until I met Alexis, I never understood the value of a partnership. I thought I already had everything I needed, but I was wrong. She is my strength, my rock. She gives me something to fight for when it feels like all hope is lost. She is my queen. I lift my glass a little higher. To our queen. There is a chorus of, To our queen. And everyone drinks. I look at Alexis as I sip my champagne, and she has ironed the anxiety out of her features. She surveys the table coolly, almost as though she is bored, and gives me a small smile when our eyes meet. 
I nod to the server waiting at the door. The second I sit down, the room is flooded with delicious smells as the serving staff brings in the first course. The night begins. Alexis tips a head back, exposing the long, beautiful column of her throat. Her laugh flutters through the air, the sound of it intoxicating. When her eyes meet mirrors across the table again, they are full of mirth. <laughs> Is there any sight as wretched as that of a man in pain? She jokes. Mira just finished recounting how she spent the past couple of weeks looking after a moaning and groaning Dom, who couldn't even bring himself to reach for the remote for the first few days. Mira chuckles and rubs Dom's arm. They are so delicate at times. Dom bristles. No more delicate than you. That's where you're wrong, Alexis says, sipping her faux champagne primly. A woman spends her whole life in pain. She gets used to it. <laughs> More than that, she gets used to having to keep that pain to herself because our pain is taken for granted by society. We're also much less likely to be taken seriously by a doctor, Mira pipes up. Women in pain are told all the time that there is nothing wrong with them. Alexis smiles at her new friend. And then they just have to get on with it. I think about when Alexis was kidnapped by Andrew Walsh. She went days without food, without being allowed to sleep, with the threat of her death hanging over her head every second. When I freed her, I expected a broken rag doll of a woman. But she was fine. Battered and bruised, but not broken. She could barely walk, but she only cared about getting Harry to safety. And she's right. I've taken her innate strength for granted ever since. I dropped a world-shattering secret on her right before a dinner where she needed to be at her strongest, and I didn't think twice about it because I knew she could take it. Guilt sits heavy in my stomach. As it turns out, I'm an asshole. Mira and Alexis keep chatting, drawing in the opinions and voices of the wives who are close enough to contribute. I'm proud to see Alexis dominate the table, and I sit back and let her. This is her night. When the last of the dessert plates have been cleared, we retire to the parlor, where the staff sweeps the tables away to make room for a dance floor. The men sit and sit whiskey by the fireplace and suspiciously are the group of women that have gathered around Alexis. Normally on these occasions, the wives hang around their husbands all night like shadows so seeing them giggling in a corner together is unusual. I don't know how I feel about this, says Mirko. He is scowling, but then again, he always is. Antonio grins. I like it. Sheila is always complaining that she doesn't have enough female friends. It's nice to see her so happy. I will never understand how a guy as good as Antonio got wrapped up in organized crime. Look at them, Mirko says. They're not starting a book club. They're talking about us. Silvano chuckles. <laughs> I highly doubt that, Mirko. You're not that interesting. The men all laugh, all except for Mirko, who glares at my consigliere but doesn't snap back. Silvano is above him on the food chain, something I know the old-timer has had issues with since the position fell to Vito's younger brother. A server comes back to announce that the dance floor is ready, and we all file back into the ballroom. I take Alexis's hand and draw her to me before the music even starts. I've missed her. Her attention has only been divided for a couple of hours, and yet I've missed her. Love is a strange thing. I see you've been holding court, I murmur, smiling down at her. The music starts, and I begin to lead her across the floor. Alexis smiles back at me. They're a good bunch, those girls. It's nice to talk to people who get it. Get what? All of it, she says, jutting her chin around the room. 
Raising kids, following our passions, knowing that each time the man we love leaves the house, it might be the last time we see him alive. My hand tightens on Alexis's waist. I gaze down at her, a little lost for words. Then she laughs. <laughs> Plus, they're absolutely hilarious. Gina has a mouth like a sailor on her. I laugh and draw Alexis closer, inhaling the scent of a flowery perfume. I press my lips against the rear, and my hand runs over her back. I'm sorry, I say. I should have told you sooner. Yes, you should have, she replies tersely. But I can forgive if you promise that there will be no more secrets between us. Before I agree, I want you to fully understand what you're asking of me, I tell her as we glide across the room. I will need to show you the darkest side of me and share the most vicious aspects of this business. That's what I want, she replies. And in return for this complete honesty, Alexis, I will expect you to always put our family, as well as the family, first, because now they are one and the same. Alexis steps back, staring up at me fiercely. That's what I want. I look down at her, my tiger queen, so beautiful, so ferocious, so hungry for power and control. I love her now and I think I have always loved her. It was just hard to recognize when I'd never had love in my life before she came into it. I lean down and kiss her. Our lips slide against each other in time with our feet, and the rest of the world seems to slip away under a golden veil. We are together, and together we can accomplish anything. Bang! Crack, crack, crack! The sound of muffled shots and gunfire permeates the ballroom. My hands tighten on Alexis as adrenaline shoots through my veins like liquid fire. We are under attack. Alexis. I barely have time to register the sound of gunfire before Gabriel starts marching me toward the door at the side of the room. I crane my neck and watch as Dom and Antonio barricade the grand double doors. Follow Gabriel, Dom yells to the wives. He'll take you to a safe room. Fuck that, Sheila calls back. Get me a gun. Antonio grins at her, but I tear my eyes away from the touching scene to look up at Gabriel just as we reach the doors. I want to fight too, I tell him. Gabriel looks down, mouth curved slightly. I bet you do, tiger. He pushes through the door and heads down a hardwood-lined hallway lit by golden sconces. I might be more inclined to let you if you'd had any training and if you weren't pregnant. But you haven't, and you are. So you're going to stay in the safe room until I come to get you. Understand? Begrudgingly, I have to admit he has a point. Though I hate the idea of all the other mob women getting to help fend off whoever is attacking us, while I wait in a closet somewhere, twiddling my thumbs. <sighs> I understand. He pulls me into an elegant bedroom and strides through to the closet door at the far end. When he opens it, I see a hidden steel door at the back of it. He punches a four-digit code into the keypad, 1823 and the lock on the door releases. Gabriel presses a chaste kiss to my lips, and then nudges me toward the door. I enter and turn to tell Gabriel to be safe, but he has already closed the door. It locks with a heavy click. The room is small but comfortable, with a sofa and a mini fridge stocked with water and some sandwiches. I suppose Gabriel must have had it specially stocked for tonight, just in case. But I doubt he really expected to use it. It's quiet back here. Too quiet. My mind whirs. I hate feeling this useless, and there must be something I can do from back here. Shit. Harry and Clara are back at the mansion. 
Has Gabriel had time to warn the guards there of this attack? I need to make sure they're okay. I go to grab my phone and realize with a frustrated groan that I left it on the table by the side door we slipped out of. Gabriel told me to stay, but Clara and Harry could be in danger. I need to warn them. Plus, Gabriel will be too busy to notice if I slip out for a second, right? I don't know why I'm even trying to justify my actions. I'm leaving this room come hell or high water. I punch the code into the keypad and step into the dark closet. I hear a solitary gunshot somewhere in the apartment, but otherwise, I can't hear anything at all. I slide open the closet door cautiously, as if someone might be waiting to leap out at me, but the room is empty. I slide out of my heels and tiptoe to the door, cracking it open enough to peek down the hall. It looks clear. I creep out and close the door behind me, then tiptoed toward the ballroom. I can hear the unmistakable sound of violence from somewhere up ahead. Screams, gunshots, glass shattering. The walls seem to shake with the force of it. My heart is doing its best to climb out of my throat, but I force myself to stay calm. I am no good to Harry and Clara if I let my fear take over. I start to approach the ballroom door. Something slams against the wall next to me from the other side, and I grit my teeth. Game plan. Get in, get the phone, run like hell, and hope nobody notices. I try not to linger on the various catches with this plan, particularly the fact that I'm in a stunning gown, which is dramatically backless, with an eye-catching diamond necklace, because it doesn't matter. The plan could suck, but I don't have another one, and I won't sit in safety while the people I love suffer if there's something I might be able to do to help. Before I can reach the ballroom, a door opens ahead of me, and a red-faced man in a black turtleneck steps out, gun drawn. He must have been sent to clear the rest of the rooms, but I can tell from the look on his face that he wasn't expecting to meet an elegantly dressed woman in the hallway. The man roars and leaps at me, knocking me to the ground. He straddles my legs and extends his arm to aim the gun at my face, but I grab both of his arms and wrestle them away. I won't be able to hold him for long, so I do the only other thing I can think to do. I bring my leg up quickly and knee him in the balls. The man wheezes and grows even redder in the face. You bitch! His hold has loosened, but only slightly. I try to use it to my advantage and grapple him onto his back, but he flattens his body lower over mine, immobilizing me with his weight. You're Gabriel's girl, aren't you? He hisses, spittle spraying onto my cheek. The pregnant one. He drops the hand holding the gun between us, and I feel the cold muzzle of it against my stomach. He digs the gun into my flesh, and I yelp with pain. I'm not supposed to kill you, he says, but nobody said anything about your baby. I can taste the panic on my tongue, sweet and sickly, like overripe strawberries. I don't think, I don't plan. My instincts take over. In one movement, I twist my hips so the gun is no longer over my belly cover the hand holding the gun with mine, and sink my teeth into Turtleneck's ear. He yells out. The coppery taste of blood fills my mouth, and my stomach turns over in disgust. But I don't let that distract me. This man was going to kill my baby. He deserves to die. My fingers close over the gun, and I roll back, destabilizing him enough that I can throw him off me, he falls onto his back with one hand cradling his bloody ear, and I shuffle back on my butt like a crab. You fucking bitch, he cries and starts to get up. I don't give him the chance. I aim, I fire. Turtleneck falls back onto the floor, blood pooling around his torso from the two gunshot wounds in his belly. There is an expression of genuine surprise on his face. That irks me. 
Did you think you could lay hands on the Bellucci Mafia Queen and get away with it? I ask. He sputters but doesn't answer, then stares up at the ceiling, eyes growing distant. The hand holding the gun shakes, and I let it fall to my side. My heart is racing. This man is bleeding out on Gabriel's parquet floor, and it is my fault. But he deserved it. He was going to hurt me, maybe even kill my baby. My hand goes to my belly. I shake my head in disgust. Any man who would try to kill an unborn baby deserves to die. You're lucky that it will be so quick. I hate the thought of touching him, but somebody probably heard that gunshot, and I don't think I'm going to make it to the ballroom. The guy probably has a cell phone on him, which will do just fine. After being kidnapped by Andrew Walsh, I made sure to memorize a list of important phone numbers in case I was ever separated from my cell phone. I lean over and rifle through the man's pockets, coming up victorious with a black iPhone. I quickly unlock it using his face and dash around the corner just as I hear footsteps approaching. I don't know the layout of the penthouse well and have no idea where I am. I just need to get somewhere hidden to make the call. But there don't seem to be any rooms leading off this corridor. Too late, I start to recognize where I am. I'm nearing the main double doors for the ballroom, the ones that the Italians were barricading, just as Gabriel pulled me out. Except the doors have been forced open, and broken splinters of wood litter the hall. I can hear voices coming from inside the room, but no gunshots and no scuffles. Oh God, what if they're all dead? I know that I should go back, find a room to slip into, but the thought that Gabriel might be lying lifeless on the ballroom floor makes it impossible for me to do so without at least looking first. I approach the door, navigating between chunks of wood and glass, and peek my head around the corner. My heart sinks. Gabriel's men and their wives have been rounded up in the middle of the ballroom floor. They are sitting with their hands tied behind their backs, guns aimed at their foreheads. There are about two dozen cartel goons hovering around the room, either chatting with each other or actively antagonizing their captives. Then I see the woman the one who started this all. Felicity Huffman is standing with her back to me, facing the captives. She is wearing an elegant snow-white gown, as though she were planning on attending this soiree herself. She's tall with a blonde pixie cut, but I can't see her face from here. She seems to be talking to someone. But where is Gabriel? You're just like your father. I hear Felicity say, and I realize she must be talking to Gabriel. Weak, easily fooled, pathetic. I'll kill you for this, Gabriel replies. The sound of his voice is a balm to my soul. I am still shaken by the attack in the hallway, and all I want to do is disappear into his arms. But now is not the time for that. I need to be strong. Felicity steps to the side a little, and I catch sight of Gabriel's face for the first time. Black blood is caked around his nose and mouth, and one of his eyes blushes with a fresh bruise. He looks like he's been hit by a bus. I can't help myself. I gasp. It's the worst thing I could have done, because it immediately draws the attention of no less than four of the hostels in the room, including Felicity. I duck behind the doorway, but it's too late. I know you're there, Alexis, Felicity drawls. Why don't you be a big girl and come on out? I don't move. I'm trying to think of an exit strategy, but it feels like the adrenaline has turned my brain to sludge. Okay, darling, Felicity calls again. Let me put it this way. If you don't come into this room right now, I'm going to shoot your boyfriend somewhere I'm sure he'd really rather not be shot. Fuck. 
Okay, it's not game over yet, but I need to be really careful about the next moves I make. I wedge the gun into the back of my dress and walk into the room, holding the cell phone aloft. Alexis. Felicity is sophisticated and beautiful, with bright blue eyes that are a carbon copy of my own. Her pink lips curve into a smile I can only describe as welcoming, which throws me off entirely. She looks friendly, sweet. There you are, my darling. Felicity purrs as I step into the room. She points to the phone in my hand. And what have you got there? The cartel men all turn to watch as I enter, but they don't bother aiming their guns at me. I'm a little offended. All I need to do is press the call button, and backup will swarm this building in a matter of minutes, I tell her. I'm bluffing, of course. I have no idea what number to call to summon the troops something I'd definitely like to know for the future if we get out of this. Felicity laughs. She starts to approach me, and I stop dead, rooted to the spot. She cocks her head to the side, as though I am some sort of circus curiosity, and smiles languidly. That's cute, she says. I bet you have a lot of questions, my angel. It must have been a shock to learn that the mewling buffoon you thought was your mother was just some stranger. I stiffen. Don't talk about her like that. She was my mother. Just because she didn't share my DNA doesn't change that. So you're of the nurture camp in the nature versus nurture debate? Felicity asks eyes flashing. She stops only a couple of feet in front of me. The gun is cold against my spine. I glance past her to Gabriel and the others. All the cartel eyes are on my interaction with Felicity, and none of them seem to notice that their captives have started struggling against their bonds. I don't know if they can break free, but if I can distract Felicity long enough, they just might be able to. Gabriel's eyes meet mine, and I try to communicate wordlessly that I'll keep her talking as long as I can. I stare Felicity down. That woman raised me. She looked after me. Where the fuck were you? I moved on to bigger and better things, Felicity replies. Harry was only ever a stopgap for me. The fact that I had you was... She shrugs. Inconvenient. My throat is painfully dry. How could the woman who birthed me be so cruel, so callous? I want to put my hands to my ears and shut out all of her venomous words, but I need to stay strong. I do not let any of my distress show and instead glower at her with distaste. So, you left us, I say. It was all very amicable, she says with a simpering smile. I was always too strong of a personality for your father anyway. He wanted a woman he could control, someone pathetic and weak. We both thought your mother was a suitable choice, the kind of meek creature that could keep his plate full and his bed warm without asking any questions. Bile rises in my throat. I stand taller and tighten my jaw. You may have thought of my mother as weak, but she did not raise a weak daughter, I say in an even, razor-sharp tone. If you harm the dawn of the Bellucci crime family or his woman, you will be hunted for the rest of your life. And when we catch you, we will make your death a spectacularly painful affair. So if I were you, I would make the smart choice and leave this apartment now. Something like pride flashes in the depths of Felicity's sapphire eyes. Her lips draw into a feline grin. Oh, my angel, 
how delightful. She turns back to Gabriel. I hope for your sake that you're not as much like your father as Alexis is like her mother. I panic when I realize that in looking back, Felicity and the cartel guns might see Gabriel or the others struggling with the ropes. I need to draw their attention back to me, and quickly. I whip the gun out from the back of my dress and press it against Felicity's pale throat, heart hammering. Almost every gun in the room aims at me, and I can practically feel the weight of the target hanging over me. Felicity stills and swivels to face me slowly. She is no longer smiling. What do you think you're doing, my dear? She asks. Let them go, I say, digging the muzzle of the gun into her skin. Or what? She asks. Is it not obvious? I growl. Or I fucking shoot you. Her lips part into a wide grin. I think that would make things terribly interesting. Go right ahead. Are you crazy? Felicity nods, eyes bright. Oh, yes. I rather think I am, she says in a delighted voice. I am not going to order my men to release the Italians, Angel. So either you shoot me or you put that gun down and go sit with your boyfriend while I decide what to do with you. I'm certainly not going to put the gun down, but I hadn't considered that the crazy bitch would actually dare me to shoot her. I swallow a lump of frustration. What am I going to do? I glance back at Gabriel, and he is no longer struggling against the ropes. He has gotten free, I realize. And so have at least a few of the others. Gabriel's eyes lock on mine, and he nods. Your funeral, I mutter, and my finger hovers over the trigger. The Colombians are all watching the scene intently. Gabriel and the others take advantage of their distraction and charge at them. All hell breaks loose. Bullets fire blindly through the air, including the one I meant for Felicity. She knocks my hand up a second before I shoot, and the bullet lodges in the ceiling. I barely have time to process the fact that I actually pulled the trigger before she's on me, trying to wrestle the gun out of my grip. I try to yank the gun away, but the sudden movement sends me teetering off balance. I fall, and the hand holding the gun smacks painfully against the ground. My grip releases, and the gun goes skittering over the hardwood. Felicity and I lock eyes for one fraction of a second before we both dive after it. Gabriel. Felicity is going to get the gun. Both Alexis and Felicity are reaching for it, but Felicity is closer, and I know Alexis won't make it in time. I can see the dreadful scene playing out in my mind. Felicity's hand closing over it a second before Alexis. Felicity aiming at Alexis's head and firing. Alexis going limp on the floor. The ballroom is in chaos, and there are at least six cartel members standing between my woman and me. There could be a whole army and it wouldn't be enough. Felicity, I roar, charging across the room. I'm an easy target, and a bullet rips through my arm before she even turns to look. I hiss in pain, but push forward, not caring how many guns are pointing in my direction and how slim my chances of surviving this gauntlet of fire are. I need to save Alexis. Harry needs his mother, and I cannot live in a world without her. Alexis's eyes meet mine. They are wide with terror. Go, I yell. Run! I am nearly there. I shove past one of Felicity's thugs, who tries to grapple me to the ground. I shake him off, but I haven't made it two steps before blinding pain shoots through my thigh. I grit my teeth and keep going, even though every step is agony. Felicity's features knit in surprise when she sees that I haven't gone down. I use this to my advantage and tackle her to the ground, grabbing the gun she'd been just about to pick up and holding it to her head. It's going to be over soon. 
one more second and Felicity Huffman will be dead. Alexis will be safe. My finger closes over the trigger, but before I can shoot, someone kicks the gun out of my hand. I look up, just as the cartel member lands the next kick on my face, sending me sprawling onto my side and freeing Felicity. It feels like every inch of my skin is on fire. I try to lift my arm to halt my fall, but the bullet is ripped through the muscles and made it all but useless. I land hard on my shoulder, the wind knocked out of me. I open my eyes, head pulsing. The sounds of battle seem distant, like I'm hearing it all through layers of cotton. The gun is lying on the floor a few feet ahead of me, and I propel myself toward it. A hand reaches down and closes over the handle of the gun. My gaze tracks up the person's arm, and I realize that it's Alexis. Her features are honed in a dark fury, and she lifts the gun, aiming it at Felicity, who is just off to my left, struggling to get to her feet. Alexis has never looked more beautiful. Strands of silky dark hair have pulled free of her updo, and her eyeliner has smudged a little under her eyes. With her elegant gown and the bloody diamonds at her throat, she looks like a warrior queen. I pity any who would refuse to bow before her. Before Alexis can aim the gun, one of the cartel men slams his boot into her spine, and she cries out in pain, but does not fall. Instead, she wheels on him. I am distracted for only a few seconds, but it is long enough for Felicity to retrieve a knife strapped to her thigh and sink it into my chest. The pain is white hot. I scream and lurch toward her, but Felicity scuttles out of my path. Bang! The man who kicked Alexis falls dead to the floor, and Alexis swings the gun toward Felicity. Felicity tries to scramble to her feet. If she starts to run, Alexis might not be able to hit her. I really need to make sure she gets combat trained when this is over. I try to sit up, and the knife wound screams at me. I only have a precious few seconds before Felicity is on her feet, so I push through the pain and lunge after her. My fingers wrap around her ankle, and I yank her back to the ground, holding her in place despite her kicking at my face. Shoot! I urge Alexis. Alexis has both hands on the gun. She stares down at Felicity with a hatred so dark and so bitter that I wouldn't be surprised if Felicity perished from the look alone. You were never my mother, bitch. Alexis snaps. Then she pulls the trigger. The bullet hits Felicity in the chest, and she collapses. Silvano, I roar, catching the attention of my second, who is nearby holding a bloody knife. Get Alexis to safety. The hardwood floor is wet and sticky against my hand, and I lift it groggily up to my face. It's blood. I look down at the wound in my chest. My blood. My strength saps away, and I sag to the floor. Alexis. There is so much commotion in the ballroom that I can hardly tell who is who, which side is which. There are people grappling on the ground, someone strangling someone against the table, bodies strewn across the floor. Antonio's wife, Sheila, roundhouse kicks a cartel member in the face, and her dress rips all the way up her thigh. I decide if I make it out of here... I have to learn how to do that. Silvano, get Alexis to safety. Gabriel. I blink, and it's like the world comes back into focus. My fingers are clenched so tightly around the gun in my hand that the knuckles have gone white. The gun. Felicity. I look down and see the woman who claimed to be my mother bleeding out on the floor. The ruby red blood is striking against her pale skin and white dress, and flecks of it have spattered her blonde hair. It looks like I killed an angel, an angel in disguise. Someone grabs my arm, and I whirl on them, pointing the gun. Silvano puts his hands up, grimacing. Careful, I don't have many lives left, he says. 
We need to get you to safety. Do you have a phone? I ask, lowering the gun. He leads me past Dom and Antonio, who are hoisting Gabriel up between them. Both of them hiss in pain, as the action elicits complaint from the wounds they endured the night Gabriel killed Kevin Lynch. I called for backup already. I need to make sure Harry and Clara are okay, I insist. When we get to the safe room, you can call whoever you want. Salvano pushes through the door and peeks around the corner before guiding me through. I look behind me to make sure Dom and Antonio are following with Gabriel, and my heart breaks. They're having to drag him because he can barely move his feet. His head hangs down, long black hair falling over his face. Alexis, you can't help him right now, Silvano says, drawing my attention back to the task at hand. We're almost there. Do you still have bullets? I lift the gun up to eye level and frown. I have no idea how to check. We make it into the bedroom with the hidden door, and Silvano lopes across the room to the closet, calling instructions back to me. That's a semi-automatic handgun, so click the button on the back to slide out the magazine. I check and the magazine is about half full. I slide it back in. Yeah, I'm good. The door is open, and Silvano ushers me inside. Dom and Antonio bring Gabriel through and lower him onto the sofa. I rush to his side. I don't understand, I say to Silvano, as he and the others retreat from the room. Felicity's dead. Why hasn't the fighting stopped? Because the cartel are sick, violent bastards, Silvano replies. Backup should be here any minute, and we should be able to hold them off until then. But do not open this door until you have confirmation that it's safe. He tosses me his phone, and I catch it. The password is 3265. Don't make me regret telling you that. With that, Silvano is gone. The lock on the door clicks closed, and I can barely hear a whisper through the reinforced wall. Now that it's quiet, I can hear Gabriel's rasping breaths, and I bolt over to the first aid kit and pull out gauze and disinfectant. I dial Clara's number and put the phone on speaker as I start cutting Gabriel's shirt away. Um, hello? Clara answers. Relief swells through me. At the very least, Clara is alive. Clara, are you okay? Alexis, what the hell is happening? I've been trying to call you. I peel the bloody fabric back from Gabriel's chest and wince. The knife wound is still weeping blood, and as I remove the fabric from his shoulder, I find a bullet wound in his arm as well. I left my phone in the middle of a battlefield, I tell Clara. Gabriel and I are safe for now, but I needed to know that you and Harry are okay. Gabriel murmurs weakly. Harry. I pour a load of disinfectant on his chest, and he growls in pain. Yeah, we're fine, just freaked out, Clara replies. They've shoved us in some sort of safe room and won't tell us anything. I tried to call Angelo, but he's not answering either. Thank God. As long as Harry is safe, I know that I can get through whatever else happens tonight. He's probably on his way here, I say, pressing dressing to the wound. The cartel attacked the dinner. Gabriel's been stabbed and shot. I got kicked in the back. Didn't enjoy that. Otherwise, I'm okay. Jesus, Clara hisses through her teeth. I've gotta go, I say. I need to bandage Gabriel up, but I just wanted to make sure you were okay. Give Harry a hug for me and tell him that I love him. I will. Stay safe. I chuckle darkly. I'll try. After I hang up the phone, I wrap Gabriel's chest in bandages and move on to his arm. I have no idea what I'm doing. Just another thing I need to learn when we get out of this. If we get out of this. I hate that I can't hear anything through the thick wall. I have no idea if the fighting is still going on, or if more Italians have shown up, or if Felicity's men are standing in the bedroom only a few feet away from me, 
trying to figure out the best way to force their way inside. Then I hear the knock, heavy, fast, and insistent. Alexis, I hear. It's a female voice, but I can't place it. Who is it? I call back. Antonella, backup has arrived. It's safe to come out now. The fact that Silvano hasn't come to fetch us personally is worrying. Is he dead? Gabriel will be devastated if he loses another Gambaro. I really hope Silvano is just busy somewhere. In any case, Gabriel needs to get to a hospital now, so I don't have time to dwell on who it is delivering the news, just that they're here. I punch the code into the door, and the lock clicks open. The door slams inward, nearly whacking me in the arm. I open my mouth to yell at Antonella when I see who is really on the other side of the door. The complaint dries up on my tongue. Felicity Huffman is slumped into the side of one of her goons, breathing heavily. She is caked in blood, her face wan, eyes wild. Two other cartel members are there with her, and one of them has a knife to Antonella's throat. Blood drips down from where the knife has begun to slice into her skin. He tosses the poor woman to the floor, and all four of them barge into the safe room. I run to Gabriel's side and grab the gun, shielding Gabriel with my body while I aim. The biggest of Felicity's brutes lunches for me, but I have a millisecond window of opportunity, and I use it. I don't give Felicity a chance to hurt Gabriel again. I don't even give the bitch a chance to speak. I put a bullet in her head and watch as she slumps forward, finally dead. Then the Colombian tackles me, and the gun goes sailing across the room. She's dead, I think. Felicity is dead, and Harry and Clara are safe. So it doesn't hurt as much when the man on top of me punches me in the face, even though the coppery taste of blood fills my mouth. It could be worse. Get off her, I hear Gabriel slur. He launches himself from the sofa and manages to knock the cartel thug off me, but the other two quickly descend into the fracas. It's a small space, and I lose track of who is who and which way is up. I kick and claw and bite at anyone who tries to touch me, and even though I know we are vastly outnumbered and that Gabriel and I are going to die in, of all places, the safest room in the penthouse, I intend to go out fighting. Bang. The gunshot is deafening in the small space, and I cry out in surprise. My ears ring. Bang. Confusion is the name of the game, especially when the man on top of me stops strangling me and goes limp. Bang. I try to heave the man off me, but he's too heavy. I only succeed in pushing his shoulder away from my face. Silvano is in the doorway, and he shoves his gun into the back of his pants and rushes over to help me. I leave you alone for two seconds, he jokes, as I slide out from under the hefty corpse. I glare at him. Now is not the time. Is backup actually here this time? I say as I get to my feet. Silvano has already started to lift Gabriel, and I go over to help him. They're here, he grunts. Gabriel is heavy. Luckily, Dom and Antonio appear in the doorway, blood spattered across their faces and the front of their white shirts. Shit, is he alive? Dom asks, running over to take my place. For now, I say, he needs to get to the hospital. I grab Silvano's phone from the floor and hand it back to him. Silvano, go make sure all the injured are taken care of, and I want a list of the dead. I gesture to Antonio. You and Dom take Gabriel down to the car. I'm going to grab my phone and I'll run down to meet you. The men all nod, and Antonio and Silvano switch places and carry Gabriel out of the room. I expect maybe a little pushback from Silvano who I'm sure is used to assuming the mantle of authority in Gabriel's absence. 
but he doesn't hesitate to start actioning my command. I run through the penthouse, grimacing at the utter carnage the cartel have left behind. Blood and broken glass is everywhere. One of the ballroom doors lies in broken splinters on the ground, and I pick my way gingerly through the mess, conscious of the many cuts I have already suffered to my bare feet. The table where my phone was has been upended, and I manage to find it after only a brief sift through the detritus. I try not to look at the bodies. Silvano will tell me who is dead and who survived soon, and I can't focus on that right now. Gabriel needs to get to the hospital, and I won't be the one to hold that up. I race to the elevator and then through the lobby, attracting concerned stares as I smear bloody footprints across the marble. Antonio and Silvano have just finished loading Gabriel into the SUV, and I hop in next to him. Silvano takes off just as sirens begin to ring in the distance. I buttress myself against Gabriel, and his head lolls to the side, then rolls forward. He looks up, blinking blearily, as though he has just woken from a bad dream. Hey, I say, turning to face him. Gabriel smiles at me. It's a woozy, drunken smile. He has lost a lot of blood. Hey, tiger, he says. I hold his face in my hands. Stay with me. We're going to be at the hospital soon. Silvano is driving like a hellion through traffic. I'm surprised we're not already there. Tiger, tiger, burning bright, Gabriel murmurs. He must have really lost a lot of blood if he started quoting William Blake. I seize the opportunity to try to keep him awake. What's the rest of the poem? I ask. Gabriel blinks in confusion. Tiger, tiger, burning bright, I prompt. In the forests of the night. Gabriel's eyes are unfocused, and his light smile rolls down his lips into a lopsided grin. He turns his head to kiss my hand. I'm proud of you, he slurs. And it's not the next line of the poem, but it makes my heart hiccup all the same. Then he passes out. Alexis. It's a very long night. Gabriel goes into surgery as soon as we get to the hospital. No sooner have the nurses wheeled him away than I am approached by a nurse who tells me that Silvano has arranged for the baby and me to be checked out. I had been so busy worrying about whether Gabriel was going to make it that I'd forgotten how stressful of an evening I'd just had and how that might have impacted our baby. I spend the next hour worrying about that nonstop until the doctor gives me the all clear. Once the nurses have cleaned me up, I am brought to a private waiting area where I find Clara and Harry playing on a mat in the corner. The second I walk in, Harry looks up and squeals happily. Mama! Tears brim in my eyes, and I swoop down to pick him up, holding him tightly to my chest. He smells like heaven, and I breathe in deep as I walk with him around the room. There was a moment in the penthouse where it looked like I would never get to hold him again. There's still a chance that his father never will. You look awful. Clara comments. Are you okay? The doctor just checked me out, I tell her. Healthy as a horse. Gabriel, on the other hand. I heard. Clara comes over and rubs her hand over my back. Silvano told me I should stay at the house, but I thought you might want someone to wait with you. I have never been more grateful for my best friend. It could be hours until I find out if Gabriel's going to make it, and the thought of spending that time in some cold hospital waiting room by myself is dismal. Now I have my friend and my baby, and I can deal with the rest as it comes. A nurse comes into the room a few hours later to tell me that Gabriel is okay and that he's waking up after the surgery. 
I let out a breath it feels like I have been holding since he first passed out in the SUV, and hand Harry to Clara, kissing my son on the cheek one last time before I rush to his father's bedside. Gabriel looks way too big for his hospital bed. He is strapped into what seems like a dozen machines, with tubes and wires going everywhere. But he's alive. I slide into the chair next to his bed and rest my hand over his. His eyes open slowly, and when he sees it's me, he smiles. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry, he murmurs. What? I don't know what I was expecting his first words to be, but it wasn't that. The next line of the poem, he explains. It all comes back, and I laugh. Reciting Blake in the back of the SUV while Silvano weaved through traffic feels like a lifetime ago. I didn't think you'd remember any of that, I say. Gabriel licks his dry lips, looking around the room. I make a habit of committing every second I've ever spent with you to memory. His eyes return to mine, the black of his pupils spilling out toward the white. Is the baby okay? I rest a hand over my stomach, smiling. Baby's fine. I'm fine. Harry's fine. Good. His eyes drift closed, and he nods. Good. Gabriel, I say, and his eyes blink open again. What do we do now? His smile falls, and he grows more solemn. That's a good question. Call a meeting of my advisors, whichever of them are left alive. I already know who is still alive, having received the news from Silvano a couple of hours ago. I squeeze Gabriel's hand. I'll call them, I say. But you should know that Piero didn't make it, and Mirko and Liz are in intensive care. A couple of the men who came with the backup were killed as well, John and Matteo. Gabriel closes his eyes, as though feeling the pain of their deaths through the fog of the morphine. My heart breaks for him. He has seen so much death. I hope that this was the final battle and that an era of peace will follow. In fact, I intend to do everything I can to make sure that happens. Gabriel has been allotted a larger than average hospital room. But even so, it is much too small a venue for an assembly of husky mobsters. Antonio somehow folds himself up in a chair in the corner, and the rest pack in around Gabriel's bed like sardines, though they leave space around me. Silvano slips through the crowd and asserts himself at Gabriel's other side. I'm on pretty powerful pain medication, Gabriel says by way of greeting. If I start muttering nonsense, I expect one of you to tell me. Some of the men chuckle. It's nice to have even a sliver of lighthearted banter amidst what has been a truly hellish day. Gabriel's eyes skim over everyone in the room, as though he is grateful just to see them alive again. He takes in a great breath and then sighs. It's not over yet, Gabriel says solemnly. Antonio and Silvano, I want you to coordinate a blitz of the remaining cartel members. I want the city wiped clean of them. He looks at Dom, whose bulky form is towering over the end of his bed like a gargoyle. Dom, do a sweep of O'Neill's. If there's any Irish mafia still around, make it known in no uncertain terms that we will not tolerate any attacks on our people or businesses. They will either accept peace or they will die. Dom nods. Gabriel's eyelids flutter. I can tell that he's working hard to stay awake. When he speaks next, his words have taken on a slurred edge. Alexis's word is to be taken as law, especially given that I don't know how long I will be laid up. She has my full trust. 
and if anyone has a problem with that, they must speak to me directly. Understood? All of the men chime their agreement. I can't believe that Gabriel has all but crowned me in front of them. I'm glad, because there's a much bigger mess to clean up here than Gabriel is currently capable of dealing with. Gabriel dismisses his men, and I follow them out into the hall. Ilya, I call. The older man turns to face me. He has a splint on his nose, and his lip is split on one side. Yes, he says. I suddenly grow nervous. I've never commanded one of Gabriel's capos before. Not like this. What if he tells me to fuck off? No, I'm being stupid. It is my right to make demands of him, and it is his duty to follow them. I want you to start funeral arrangements for John, Piero, and Matteo, I say. Have men go around to tell their families personally. I also want the families of those in intensive care notified and brought to the hospital if they so desire. He nods. One more thing, I say. Have the nurses set up a cot for me in Gabriel's room. Of course, Elia says. It will be done. He disappears down the corridor, and I feel a rush of adrenaline. I get the feeling I could have asked him to do anything, and even though he barely knows me, Elia would have been only too happy to oblige. So, this is what power feels like. I vow to use it responsibly. Gabriel is asleep when I go back into his room, so I go find Clara and Harry. Angelo is in the private waiting room with them, and when I walk in, Clara is curled against him on the sofa with a sleeping Harry nestled between them. I almost don't want to interrupt them. Hey, I say. Clara looks up, smiling. Hey. Gabriel's asleep. I walk over, squatting down until I'm level with Harry. He is drooling all over Angelo's expensive suit jacket. I smile and stroke his head. Will you take this one home for me? I'm staying here tonight. Of course, Clara replies. I'll bring him back in the morning. I thank her and then start ambling back to Gabriel's room. Only then, once everything has been organized and sorted into neat little piles, do the day's events truly hit me. I killed two people. A man I didn't know who wanted to hurt me, and a mother I never knew I had, who also wanted to hurt me. I know that I should feel remorse, that snuffing out another human life should weigh heavily on my conscience, but I don't, and it doesn't. I didn't enjoy doing it, but I wouldn't hesitate to do it again. In one squeeze of my finger, I dove straight into the gray area that Gabriel operates his whole life within, and it's not the wretched place I thought it was. In fact, I have an odd sense of clarity. The remaining misgivings I'd had about participating in the dark side of Gabriel's business flutter away, because I know that at the end of the day, I will always do what I feel is right. The darkness won't turn me into someone unrecognizable. I might be more myself now than I ever have been. Gabriel is still asleep when I get back to the room. A little bed has been made for me beside his, but for now, I go to the chair. I rest my hand over his and stare at him, sleeping peacefully, eyes flickering behind his closed lids. I hope he's dreaming about something nice. I'm suddenly exhausted. I know I should go to the cot, but I'm hesitant to take my eyes off him. Like if I do, he will disappear in a puff of smoke. So I hold out a minute longer. Just another minute. I wake suddenly, shooting upright from where I'd been resting my forehead on the side of Gabriel's bed. I whirl around and check the corners of the room, but there's nobody there. With a sagging sigh, I turn back to Gabriel and notice him smiling at me in amusement. Good morning, he says. The sky is still black outside. 
I check the time on my phone and see it's 3.30 a.m. Good morning to you, too, I say. You should be asleep still. You need to rest. I know. He lifts his hand and strokes my cheek. I heard that you've started the arrangements for the funerals. Thank you for doing that. It was what you would have done if... If I hadn't been hopped up on pain meds, he asks. You're right. And that's what makes you such a good partner for me. You know me. Know how I operate. What I would do in certain situations. I laugh. And you think I'm always going to do what you would do? I didn't say that. He pats my hand. You do the right thing, though. And that's always what I try to do. Gabriel smiles gently. I'm proud of you, Alexis. You're going to make a great queen. My cheeks flush, and I glance away. I've spent so long trying to gain Gabriel's trust. And now that I have it, it feels even sweeter for having worked so hard to earn it. Thanks, I say. Because what else can I say to that? Gabriel tips my chin back toward him. I love you so much more than I ever thought I could love anyone, he says in a gravelly voice. Will you marry me? I nearly choke on my own tongue. With everything going on with the Irish and the cartel and the purple heroine, I guess I never thought about the next step in our relationship. It always seemed more important to focus on making it through the day without losing life or limb. But now, now I've never wanted anything more in my life than to be Gabriel Bellucci's wife. I nod so hard that my neck hurts, tears gathering in my eyes. Yes, of course. I rush to lean over and kiss him, brushing my hand over his chest in the process. Gabriel flinches, but when I try to pull back, he grabs the sides of my face and pulls my lips hard against his. It's such a joyous, victorious kiss. It's a kiss that yells from the rooftops that we have vanquished our enemies and that the best years of our lives are ahead of us. It's a kiss of hope. When we finally come up for air, Gabriel grins at me. His left cheek dimples, and the sight of his rugged features taking on that boyish tilt makes my heart flip-flop. Come up here, he says, shuffling to the side of the bed. I eye the tiny sliver he has freed up skeptically. Gabriel, I don't think there's room. There will always be room for you at my side he says sagely. I see the drugs are still doing their job, I remark. Literally, I don't think I'm going to fit. Gabriel's eyes meet mine, and his stare is full of authority. Alexis, get on the bed. A little thrill goes through me, and I do as he says, wedging myself against his side, and hoping that in doing so, I'm not causing any further damage. It feels good to feel his body against mine. I lean my head on his shoulder. We should get some more sleep, I say. Gabriel kisses my forehead. Not yet. Let's talk for a bit. What do you want to talk about? The future, he says. Our future. Alexis. The officer leads me away from the waiting room, and I cast one last look at Gabriel before I go. He is sitting on one of the shabby chairs and smiles reassuringly. I see him wince as he lifts his glass to take a sip of water. It's been several weeks, but his injuries are taking their damn time to heal. At least we don't have another battle to fight anytime soon, so he has a bit of time to rest. Not another physical battle, at least. A legal battle, on the other hand. I am led through to a chilly interrogation room, where I take a seat on a cold metal chair. The officer leaves, 
and a second later, Derek Windsor, the detective investigating the slaughter at the penthouse that night, sweeps into the room, holding a folder. I should have known that the criminal investigation into Gabriel would resurface again. I suppose the penthouse full of corpses didn't help things, though at least this time, the police haven't formally pressed charges. And that makes it all much easier to fight. The police have nothing, and they know it. And without that rabid dog, Ruby Flint, biting at their ankles, their case is about to blow away like a straw house in a tornado. They're hoping I'll flip, since without a witness's testimony, they've got zero concrete evidence. Good luck, folks. Ms. Wright. Windsor begins, pulling out the chair opposite with a loud metallic shriek. What were you doing in Mr. Bellucci's penthouse on the night of the attack? Straight to it, then. Not a pleasantry in sight. We were hosting a dinner, I reply. And who attended this dinner? Some of the most dangerous men and women in the city. Gabriel's family friends. Windsor flips the file open on the table, and I try not to look too interested. Have you ever seen any of these family friends meet with Gabriel in private prior to this encounter? He asks. I cock a brow. As far as I know, that's sort of what you do with friends. Of course. Windsor laughs at himself, but it comes out tinny and fake. What I meant was, does Gabriel conduct regular meetings with all of these family friends? I cross one leg over the other. It was the first dinner I'd attended or heard about, and it would have been absolutely lovely if not for the party-crashing gunman. Why are you in here interrogating me about Gabriel's social habits when you could be out chasing down the cartel? I hit him with the full force of my displeased frown. Windsor buckles a little, and I have to hide a smile. Right, yes, he mutters. Well, it's just that some of Gabriel's business dealings leave a few question marks. It seems like he might be involved in some illegal trading at a few of these properties. He pushes a few pages from the folder toward me, showing exterior shots of a pizza parlor, a laundromat, and Fiamma. Plus, there don't seem to be any cartel members left to track down. Ah, Fiamma, where it all began. My gaze lingers on the picture of the nightclub, and Windsor sits forward excitedly. You know that one? He says. What can you tell me about Gabriel's business there? I laugh bitterly. I know that one because I've had a dance there once or twice. I have no idea what you're talking about with all this illegal trading garbage. And frankly, I think this is all a massive waste of my time. Windsor frowns. Okay, then tell me in your words, what happened the night of the attack on the penthouse? That's easy. I barely even have to lie. Gabriel saved my life is what happened, I tell him, holding his gaze steadily. We were having a nice dinner with Gabriel's family friends, and then the cartel attacked. They told us themselves why they were there. They were unhappy with his charity work because it had been impacting their drug trade. They wanted to make an example out of Gabriel. I drop my hand to my belly, making sure Windsor sees. And of his family. I add a little sauce to my voice for that last sentence, and I watch Windsor's eyebrows knit in concern. I have to remember that anyone else who'd been through a night like the one where the cartel attacked would be absolutely traumatized. I sniff. They came bursting through the doors and started to round us up. I got away and called for help, but they caught me too. They were about to... My voice breaks. They were about to hurt the baby. Gabriel's security team came in at the last second, and Gabriel fought his way through the ballroom to get to me and make sure the baby and I were safe. They shot him two times. 
I finish with a big fat tear rolling down my cheek. I deserve a fucking Oscar for this. Whatever steel edge Windsor came in here with has been blunted by my performance, and he hands me a tissue. When he speaks next, his voice is softer, kinder. I understand that you and Gabriel have a family together, but if he's a bad man, you're only going to get hurt. I want to snap that Gabriel would never let anything happen to me, but I'm playing a part. Plus, I'm not that naive. I am a part of this now, and that might involve getting hurt somewhere down the line. I've made peace with that. Gabriel is a good man. I pat my tears dry like a grieving widow in a film noir. He really cares about people. He would never do anything to hurt anybody. Okay, Windsor sighs. There goes his case. I can almost see it drifting away behind him, like smoke disappearing into the vents. But if you did want to tell us anything, Ms. Wright, we could protect you, you and your son. Time for the nail in the coffin. I reach across the table and clasp Windsor's hand, smiling as though grateful. Thank you, Detective Windsor, but I don't need any help. He nods. Okay, you can go. He escorts me back into the waiting area, where Gabriel is still in the same chair. He already completed his questioning. Ready to go, Gabriel says, getting to his feet. His features pull taut as he fights through the pain. I link my arm in his. Let's go. When we get outside, Gabriel pulls me to him on the curb before we get into the car. He kisses one cheek, then the other, and finally my forehead. What's that for? I ask, giggling. Gabriel's ink black eyes swim before me. I could have lost you that night, he says. I just want to make sure I cherish every last second we spend together. Even if it's outside of a police station, following your interrogation regarding my criminal pursuits. Alleged criminal pursuits, I correct. He grins. Let's go home. We have been living in the house on the leafy street for a couple of weeks now, but I'm still not used to the feeling of peace I get just from walking through the front door. It has been painted, decorated, and outfitted with hand-picked furnishings, and now it is our home. This place doesn't belong to the Bellucci dynasty or to the mob. It belongs only to us. Me, Gabriel, Harry, and soon another little one who I can't wait to meet. I practically float through the front door. I'm so relieved that I can finally close this chapter of our life. The cartel, Felicity Huffman, and the aftermath. It's been a long few weeks, but it's finally over. I want to sit on the deck, I announce. Clara and Angelo have taken Harry out for the day. And since my interrogation took less time than I thought it would, we've got a couple hours to ourselves. Gabriel, who had started to take his coat off, shrugs it back on. It's freezing outside. So? I grin. He shakes his head, chuckling, and follows me through the house to the back door. The wooden deck was freshly stained a couple of weeks ago, and the railings painted a delicate cream. I perch on one of the comfy wooden deck chairs, and Gabriel brings me a blanket, wrapping it around my shoulders. I have grown very fond of our backyard. It's big, but not massive. It's just big enough for a family like ours. There is a shed parked in the back corner, which I intend to fill with gardening tools once the spring comes back around. A crooked oak tree grows from the center of the yard, its gnarled branches reaching for the sky. Perfect for a treehouse, just like Gabriel promised. The grass is lush and green, if a little overgrown. I will trim it tomorrow.
Gabriel sighs as he sinks into the chair next to me. I reach for his hand. What do we do now? I ask. The Irish are gone. The cartel are gone. The last of the purple heroin has evaporated from the streets. What do you want to do? Gabriel counters. We own the city. We can do anything we want. I can almost feel the limitless possibilities stretching out ahead of me. Anything we want. So, Alexis, what do you want? I just want us to live a full, happy life together, I say. I want to raise our kids and have movie nights and go camping. I want to teach them right from wrong and feed them healthy snacks. I look over at him, smiling. I want to have romantic dinners with you, and I want to eat chips in bed without you getting annoyed about the crumbs. He squeezes my hand. You can have everything except that last one. I stick my tongue out. We've got a couple of hours before Harry's back, Gabriel says. I think I know how best to fill them. He starts to get up, and I cock an eyebrow. Oh, yeah? My mind starts to twist around the various potential interpretations of his words. It's been a long day, and I'm exhausted, but I'm never too tired for him. Gabriel goes inside and comes out a minute later, holding my laptop. He hands it over to me, and I cock my head in confusion. How are we going to make this sexy? Are we going to send racy messages to each other from separate rooms? Gabriel laughs. You have a filthy mind, Ms. Wright. He taps the laptop. I think it's time for you to finish your story. With everything that has gone on in the past few weeks, I completely forgot about the article I was writing. I didn't want to finish it until there was a satisfactory conclusion to the drug war. And now there is. No more purple heroin. No more cartel. Excitement bubbles through me. When I realize that this is what I have been waiting for. Yes, I exclaim. That's a great idea. I open the laptop and start typing away before Gabriel has even sat back down. He settles into the chair with a light sigh and then stares off into the distance. And that's how we spend our afternoon. In silence, with a chilly breeze fluttering through the wind chimes. Me, writing about the past. Gabriel, dreaming of the future. Epilogue One. Alexis. Gabriel, I would like to remind you that it's highly unusual to kidnap the bride after the ceremony, I say holding the long train of my gown in one hand and his hand in the other. Gabriel laughs. I have not seen him without a smile once today, and it's positively infectious. It's almost unfair how handsome he looks. I nearly tripped over myself when I saw him waiting for me at the altar. His tuxedo fits perfectly, and there's a sprig of baby's breath tucked in the breast pocket. I, on the other hand, am very pregnant, and it shows. I felt self-conscious when I stepped into the aisle, until Gabriel looked at me and grinned like I was the most beautiful girl he'd ever seen in his life. Part of me likes the idea of us both just disappearing now that we're married, skipping the reception entirely and going somewhere private to get lost in each other's bodies. The other part of me wants to eat the Wagyu steak I ordered for dinner and hear all the lovely things everyone is going to say about me in the speeches. You'll be back before anyone even knows you're gone, he says. I highly doubt that. People tend to notice a missing bride. I'm sure our photographer is in pieces, but he can wait. We head out the side door of the church and down the stone path toward a black car idling at the curb. I have a wedding present for you, and I don't want to wait, 
Gabriel opens the door and brushes his hand over my cheek. Do you trust me? I rest a hand over my belly and smile. Always. It isn't a long drive. And when we arrive, I'm disappointed to look out the window and see the Bellucci Incorporated building. For the love of God, Gabriel. I swing a glare toward him. We're not going to work, are we? On our wedding day, which is also a Saturday? His grin stays in place despite my best effort. What was that about trust? I grumble, but get out of the car and follow him inside. I feel ridiculous walking through the foyer in my wedding dress, silk swishing by my feet. This surprise better be good. In the elevator, Gabriel pushes the button for the floor above the one I operate the charities from, which is strange. It has been under construction for the past month, which Gabriel told me was so he could expand his financial division. What does that have to do with me? The doors open, and I see it's not under construction anymore. There is a whiff of fresh paint in the air, as well as the faintly plasticky smell of new furnishings. The large space is populated with clusters of desks, all outfitted with top-of-the-line computers and ergonomic chairs. There are some breakaway areas with sofas in bold colors, too. It all looks a little too hip to be an extension of the financial division. What is this? I ask. Gabriel doesn't answer. He guides me through the space, and we head toward the front of the building, where a row of office doors are. He stops in front of the middle one, and I read the name inscribed on the door. Alexis Bellucci, it says. Editor-in-chief. Gabriel. I look up at him. He's grinning from ear to ear. Bellucci Incorporated is ready to launch its first ever publication, he says. If you're up for it, that is. I fling my arms around him and squeeze. I'm overwhelmed with emotion. Tears well in my eyes, and I have to blink them back because I am wearing way too much makeup to start crying. In lieu of tears, I squeeze harder. Thank you, I say, voice muffled against his shirt. He hugs me back. The feel of his strong arms around me is the best feeling in the world. And I can't believe that this gorgeous, amazing, electric man is now my husband. I'm the luckiest girl in the history of lucky girls. I back away, sniffing. I'm going to do such good with it, Gabriel, I vow. I'm going to make a difference in this city. I can help you, too. Keep the business running smoothly, help find alternate routes to violence. I think about how I was already able to avoid violence with Ruby and Debbie by using my investigative connections. There's no saying how much more I'll be able to accomplish now that I'm editor-in-chief of my own newspaper. Thank you, Gabriel, I say finally. I love you so much. He gathers my face in his hands. I love you too. Pressing a soft kiss to my forehead, he adds, Now, let's get this reception done with, so I can get you out of this dress. I grin. That sounds like a plan. It's quiet in the office. My door is open, and beyond it, all I can see are empty desks. An hour ago, almost every single one had someone sitting at it, and a chorus of chatter and laughter filled the room. They're a lively bunch, my new team, but they work damn hard. Not as hard as their editor, apparently who was supposed to have gone home around an hour ago like the rest of them. I've just caught my first big fish, though. I click through the documents on my screen again. Pedro, one of my top street reporters, has forwarded a shipping manifest and a series of transcripts from conversations he has recorded. 
He's been keeping an eye on the dregs of the Irish mob for me since the newspaper first launched a week ago. There is no organization anymore, no finesse. Those who remained split into a dozen or so factions. But without any leadership, they've been crashing around the city like a herd of bulls in a very large china shop. And now Pedro reports that one of these factions is expecting a shipment of weapons tomorrow, and they're planning to use these to hold up a series of storefronts. Well, I simply can't let that happen. Gabriel has been away on business for the past couple of days, so I consider which of his men to give the command to. I settle on Angelo. He was promoted to capo about a week ago, and he hasn't had a chance to put his leadership skills to the test yet. I doubt these thugs will provide much of a challenge, so it's the perfect opportunity to hone his skills. I am just about to call Angelo when I hear the elevator door ding. I consider getting up to check who it is, but moving around has started to become a bit of a pain in the ass due to my belly, and I'm not worried. I'm well protected at all times. Footsteps approach my office, and a second later, Gabriel appears in the doorway. I shoot out of my seat. Baby, I exclaim. I didn't think you'd be back until tomorrow. Gabriel comes over and kisses me. His hand rubs over my back, and I relax into his familiar scent. I finished up early and changed my flight, he says. I couldn't wait to see you. He rubs a hand over my belly. How are we doing? I grin up at him. Fantastic. I was just about to assign the interception of a weapons sale tomorrow to one of the capos. Gabriel laughs. I meant you and the baby. He runs his fingers down my arms. But go on, tell me about it. I tell him everything Pedro reported to me, and Gabriel nods thoughtfully. I'll deal with it, he says. I was thinking that Angela would be the best capo for the job. Gabriel cups my chin, brushing his thumb over my cheek. I think that's a good idea. I preen under his approval. I get a special thrill when I please Gabriel, and my stomach does a happy flip as he gazes down at me adoringly. I noticed you're here all alone, Gabriel says a moment later his smile taking on a devilish tilt. Working hard, I see. I'm trying to impress the CEO, I say with a coquettish smile. He rides me very, very hard. Gabriel's eyes light up, and I watch as arousal floods his irises. My heart rate notches up in my chest, and I'm suddenly very happy I decided to stay late. Does he now? Gabriel purrs. He starts to guide me backward toward the sofa in the corner of the room. He sounds like a real hot ass. He's not so bad. He always makes sure I'm well rewarded. I can imagine that a woman of your talent gets rewarded often. I smirk. Not often enough. Gabriel kisses me hard as my knees back against the sofa nipping at my bottom lip. His words come out breathless and thick with desire, whispered against my lips. Cheeky. If I fucked you half as often as I want to, neither of us would ever get any work done. Well, it's a good thing I just clocked off then. Gabriel kisses me again, and my heart does a tango. I love this man, Love every single thing about him. I love his dominating kiss. Love the way he holds my face in his massive hands. Love the taste of his skin. Sit, he commands. I sit, clenching my thighs in anticipation. His lips curve a little at my eagerness, and he steps back as he unbuttons his shirt. Take your clothes off. Not a hard thing to accomplish, considering everything I wear these days is stretchy. I strip out of my clothes and meet his eye. 
Heat is pooling between my thighs, and I know he'll find me wet and ready for him. Marriage has done nothing to dim our sex life so far, and I very much doubt we'll ever reach a point where we're not ready to rip each other's clothes off at the first opportunity. Maybe when we're a hundred. Gabriel's shirt falls to the ground, and I lick my lips as I admire the sculpted planes of his muscles. His arms flex, and he steps out of his pants and boxers, cock jutting out toward me. My mouth waters. Gabriel catches me smiling and smirks. Still so eager for it after all this time. Are you saying you're not? I question, eyes flicking back to meet his. Because I can go. I jokingly get up to leave, and Gabriel immediately pushes my shoulders back down. No. His voice is firm. You know that I'm always eager to fuck you, tiger. Don't ever question that. Gabriel guides me onto my back until I'm lying lengthwise on the sofa. I feel a little self-conscious, being so exposed in the harsh office light. My belly feels massive. Gabriel swiftly disposes of my apprehension. You're so fucking beautiful, he murmurs, devouring me with his eyes. Then he goes down on his knees and leans over, kissing me softly. It's a weird angle, but it's nice. It feels fresh, new, like two young lovers exploring each other's bodies for the first time. Gabriel's hand glides over my breasts and belly and continues down. He begins to circle over my clit, tongue probing between my lips. I sigh against him. I'm already so turned on that I know I could come with just a few flicks of his wrist. Pregnancy has made me hornier than ever. Gabriel kisses down over my breasts, sucking each of the nipples into his mouth in turn. His fingers move faster against me, and a wave of pleasure gallops through my body. I dig my fingers into the cushion on either side of me. My God, it feels good. Gabriel's teeth graze my nipple, and electricity shoots straight between my legs. Gabriel slips a finger inside of me. Yes, yes. Oh, God, Gabriel, I'm gonna... He swirls even faster, and I go careening over the edge. My whole body seizes up with the force of the orgasm, and I squeeze my eyes shut as it washes over me. I see stars, entire constellations, galaxies. I ride out my orgasm on Gabriel's fingers and am breathless when he removes them. He climbs on top of me. His cock is hard and purple and practically pulses with desire. I can tell he must want me so bad that it hurts because he doesn't say a word before guiding himself inside of me and starting to thrust. That's so good, I groan. I can already feel another orgasm brewing. My forehead prickles with sweat. My hands land on Gabriel's muscled chest, and I relish how hard and powerful he feels. I love being inside of you, tiger, he hisses into my ear. You were made for this cock. I was. I really, really was. I wrap my legs around his hips and pull him in for a rough kiss. He starts to thrust harder. His movements grow erratic and his kiss sloppy as he chases the most incredible of highs. I know that soon I will feel him explode inside of me. And just knowing that is enough to send me over the edge again. This time it catches me off guard and all I can do is swear repeatedly and squeeze my eyes shut. Gabriel grunts as I squeeze around him. He adds a curse or two to my litany, and then rams home twice more before going still, his breath ragged against my lips. I feel impulse, and a pleasurable shudder goes through me. There is no pleasure greater than this, the moment when the world stops, 
And for a few crucial seconds, we are like one person. I bask in it. Gabriel presses butterfly kisses down my forehead and cheeks. His breath is hot against my ear. I'll let the nanny know we're both working late tonight, he says. Because I need to do that at least two more times before I'm willing to let you leave this office. A shiver rolls down my spine like a marble. I grin. Yes, sir. Extended Epilogue Gabriel Out of the corner of my eye, I see a pink streak that I know is my daughter running off somewhere to cause trouble. I turn from the grill and watch as she runs headfirst into a brother who catches her with a giggle. Serena, Alexis calls from the patio lounger. You're not a goat. The little brown-haired hellion bleats in response. We took the kids to a petting zoo last week, and Serena has been obsessed with being a goat ever since. It reminds me of when we took Harry to the zoo when he was around the same age, and he became obsessed with penguins. At least he didn't aspire to become one. Silly goat, Harry says, patting her head. Why don't you go eat some grass? Serena bends over, but I swoop down to pick her up before she can start nibbling at the greenery. Harry smiles sheepishly and runs away. The barbecue is on, I tell Alexis, walking over to deposit our terrible two-year-old on a knee. People will start arriving any minute. She lifts the brim of a hat to look at me and smiles. Are you sure there's nothing I can do? Other than sit there and... Look beautiful, I ask, leaning over to peck her lips. Revert this little one back to human. Alexis lifts a giggling Serena in her arms and sways her back and forth. Do you want to go for a swim? Serena looks toward the pool, which reflects the sunlight like thousands of diamonds. She nods. Goats can't go in the pool, her mother says. But if you were a little girl, you'd be allowed in the pool. Little girl, Serena rushes to say. <laughs> That's what I thought. Alexis chuckles and pushes up from the lounger. She walks toward the shallow end where the slide is set up and sinks into the water. Serena loves the water and immediately starts splashing around and giggling with joy. She's more fish than goat, I remark, walking back to the barbecue. Alexis calls after me. Don't give her any ideas. Harry joins me by the barbecue and surveys the seemingly endless array of meats on offer. I can already tell the kid's going to be a massive foodie. Other six-year-olds want chicken nuggets and fries for dinner every night, but he's all about the fine meats and cheeses. He spends a lot of time in the kitchen with Victoria, and she's more than happy to talk him through everything she makes. Is that sirloin? Harry asks. I laugh and tousle his hair. <laughs> it's ribeye. Ah, he says sagely, as though he knows the difference, which I'm not certain he doesn't. Our first guests arrive, stepping out from the grand double doors onto the sprawling patio. Clara's jaw drops. Oh, my God, she screams. This is incredible! Alexis yells a greeting and rushes out of the pool with Serena, who quickly squirms down and darts away to chase after Harry. Clara and Alexis embrace each other, while Angelo saunters slowly down the steps toward me. He has seen the house since we first moved in a week ago, and is less surprised by its opulence. I do admit, it's a bit much... Almost as extravagant as the mansion, but with a little less land and a pool. But business has been good, and with our family growing, I cast a glance at Alexis's slight baby bump as she and Clara catch up. I grin. Angelo shakes my hand. Good to see you, boss. And you, I say. How's my godson? Angelo grins at the mention of his four-month-old Jack. Good, 
really good. His entire existence seems to consist of crying and sleeping, but it's worth it. I grab the tongs and place some chicken breasts on the grill. They sizzle enticingly. We cast a glance back at the girls, who are still gabbing away. Did you look into I ask. Angelo nods. In the past few years, he has become one of my most trusted capos, and after hearing a rumor that a shipment of purple heroin had dropped onto the streets, he was the obvious choice to look into it. It's not a secret from Alexis, of course, but she'd be pissed if she knew I was discussing work at our housewarming barbecue. Angelo leans in. It was nothing, he says. Just a rumor. There's definitely some circulating on the West Coast right now, but according to all of my contacts, nobody would dare sell it anywhere within our reach. Good. This news pleases me. Thanks to our hard work, the streets have been clear of purple heroin for years. The rumor unsettled me. Grab a beer and some tongs. There's a lot of meat to get through. The next to arrive are Silvano and Victoria. Though my personal chef is a little older than my right-hand man, they're well-suited as a couple, so I wasn't surprised when they first got together. She is soft and thoughtful, but he is cold and calculating. She's a good cook, and he loves to eat. This is a strange dynamic, I comment with a grin as they approach. Me cooking for you. Victoria laughs. I was just about to ask if you needed help. Don't be silly, I say. You and Silvano enjoy yourselves. Silvano wraps an arm around Victoria's waist and leads her away, both of them laughing at some private joke. One by one, all of the guests trickle in. My men's wives soon congregate around Alexis, as they invariably end up doing at these kinds of events. Their children all run off to play together. Angelo and I churn out platter after platter of barbecued meat at the grill, while laughter and joyous shouts of children fill the air. It's the perfect afternoon. My attention snags on a late arrival while I'm tucking into a hamburger a couple hours later. At first, I don't recognize her, but Alexis does, right away. What the hell is Deborah Harry doing here? She asks from beside me. I cock a brow, and Alexis swallows her mouthful of food. <clears throat> I said, what the hell is Debbie Harris doing here? Of course it's Debbie Harris. Who else would wear a key lime pantsuit to a pool party? The older blonde bustles down the steps toward us, a pinched expression on her lips as she surveys the party goers. The air rings with laughter, and she's the only sour face in sight. Even Mirko is laughing. Alexis puts down her hot dog and stands up. Debbie! Hey! I stand too. If Debbie has come back into our lives expressly to ruin our party, I might be inclined to follow through on some of the intimidation tactics Alexis begged me not to pursue years ago. You look well. Debbie says brusquely, and her glass Weijin lilt. I hear you have another brown on the way. Alexis's hand lands on her stomach, and she smiles softly. Yes. Debbie clears her throat. <clears throat> Listen, I won't keep ya. I wanted to tell you this in person, because otherwise you won't hear until Monday. Alexis lifts a brow. You've won the Finn Stryker Award for Journalistic Excellence, Debbie says, and I wonder if it stings. She had Alexis writing puff pieces for years. There will be a ceremony in a few weeks' time that will require your attendance. Alexis's jaw drops. Seriously? She bounces on her heels, as though deliberating her next move, and then envelops the stout woman in a hug. Debbie hugs her back stiffly. Their relationship has never made sense to me, and I can't tell whether Debbie is happy for Alexis or not. She must be if she's here, right? Okay, that's enough, Hen. 
Debbie extricates herself and brushes the wrinkles out of her pantsuit, but I catch the hint of a smile on her bubblegum pink lips. She looks around her. Anyway, I'll let you get back to your party. You could hang around if you wanted, Alexis suggests, almost nervously. It'd be nice to catch up. Debbie frowns, and for a second, I think she's going to decline outright. Then she jabs a finger in the direction of the table overflowing with meat. Did I see sausages? Alexis smiles and places a hand on Debbie's shoulder. There are four different kinds. Okay, well, I suppose I've not eaten today. I can stop for a bite. And with that, she struts off toward the sausages. Alexis turns to me and jumps into my arms, squealing with delight. I laugh and swing her around. Her glee is infectious. There was a time in my life when I had never felt joy like this. Unbridled, almost chaotic. It's the kind of emotion that sweeps everything else to the ground until it is all you can see and hear and feel. My days are full of this brand of elation now, and it's all because of her. I can't wait, Alexis says, dropping her feet back to the ground. I'm gonna get a nice dress, call Sandra to do my hair and makeup. Her blue eyes flash, and I can see the cogs working in her head as she runs through all the schematics. There was a time when you dreaded PR events like this, I muse. At least this time it's going to be real, she jokes, and I watch her face as the news sinks in. She isn't just a good journalist, she's a great journalist. Her newspaper, which is by all accounts a roaring success, has helped people, and now she's being rewarded for it. I'm proud of you, Alexis. I lean in close until the tip of my nose brushes against hers. Her cheeks are warm in my hands. For a moment, all the chatter dies away, and we're alone at the end of the world. She stares up at me with such warmth that I wonder what I ever did to deserve this woman. Alexis covers my hand with hers. I'm proud of us, she says softly. We did it. She doesn't need to specify...